Welcome to what is the final day of the FTX Crypto Cup. And what a final day we have. There are two players who are still in a running of winning this tournament. And you know what? Those two players are playing each other. Ragnar Landa, Ramos Babu and Magnus Carlsen. Right now, Tana, you're sitting in Prague's seat. What can we expect? We can expect just a big back and forth battle between the two of them. I mean, these two have clearly been the best performers of the tournament. And they play each other in this monumental winner takes all takes all match. And Swere, you cannot write a better script. Now, any given day, it's hard to bet against Magnus. He is the world champion, but we've seen him be shaky against Prague in the past in many of these events actually and once again if Prague does it well this one will really really count because the winner wins the tournament and what does the young Indian have to focus at if, if he wants to play the world champion well looking at the games in the tour in the past I have noticed that Magnus seems to blunder and lose pieces when he's got little time on the clock not something we see him do against other players so it's all going to be about Prague pulling him in complicated positions and really making sure that Magnus's time runs low one thing I can guarantee this is going to be drama this is going to be excitement this is going to be the Meltwater Champions Chess Tour we go the FTX Crypto Cup has started. This is the type of hustle move. Checkmates, checkmate, checkmate incoming, checkmate free. <laughs> their preparation, their new ideas. This must be a new idea. Their teamwork, their fans. I mean, uh, it's incredible. Verusha, this is why he's so good. He's full of tricks. Unbelievable how he finds that move. We've got to call that prank style. This is a dude of moves and it directs. Wow, he's going straight for the kill. He is out to win this tournament. And what a start! Incredible day, chess. The Eden Rock Hotel is hosting the biggest chess drama in the world today. It looks calm and beautiful on the outside, but inside, Magnus Carlsen and Pragnananda will face off in a dramatic battle to win the FDX Crypto Cup. Will the world number one? 
keep his crown or will we see the first signs of a new generation taking over with 17-year-old Pragnananda here to guide you through every single move in this epic battle as always in the studio Grandmaster David Howell, Grandmaster Simon Williams and International Master Ivan Kahowska. And David, first of all, what speaks in the favor of Magnus Carlsen? Just the fact that he's been there so many times in these really tense matches, his nerve always seems to hold and uh, he's won five world championships. Why can't he win today? Uh, he'll be confident in his own abilities. Well, Simon, what speaks in the favor of young Pragnananda? Um, he's playing brilliant chess, he's got to keep it up. He's getting great positions out of the opening. That is key in the first game against Magnus and uh, just keep his nerve like he has been doing so far. Yeah. Yamaka, what should we expect from this final big match in the tournament? Well, the players want different things. Now, Magnus just wants to tie the rapid portion whilst Pragnanda has to win. So this means that Magnus is going to be that immovable object whilst Pragnanda, he's going to be a whirlwind of activity. And that means excitement. Yeah. The prize fund, you guys, in uh, the tournament is uh, $210,000 plus $100,000 worth of bitcoins. It was $100,000 on day one, but the bitcoin it has uh, fallen currently on $87,000. And the winner will take the highest percentage of the bitcoin. This is the final out of seven days in the tournament. It is an eight player round robin with uh, all players facing off in matches consisting of four rapid games. The winner in each match gets three points. That's exactly what Prague needs today. And if they are tied, they will head straight to tie breaks. The winner after tie breaks gets two points. The loser one point. And if they go to tie breaks today, that will be enough for Magnus Carlsen. On day six yesterday, what an important day in the tournament. Magnus Carlsen was in a great mood, but uh, his great mood didn't always match his moves. This oh. move I have never seen before, so now I, you've caught my attention, Magnus. What have you got up your sleeve? Magnus, really looking happy with himself. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> uh, this Queen's Forty. Going right. away again with his king. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I mean, this is just shock a minute stuff. Uh, White's rook now forcing the black queen into the corner. Have you ever seen a worse queen? Have you ever seen a more misplaced king? It's over. Magnus Carlsen, he loses game one, playing a horrible game here. Ferruccio's position is anything but solid. I mean, just look at the white rook on the seventh row. It's going to be reinforced by its sibling standing there on d1. Uh, the queen can come in as well. I mean, the position is just creaking for Ferruccio. Classic Magnus. He's back to his old self, back to his uh, back to top form. Simply, he swaps the queens, heads into an end game where he can just grind it out with his extra pawn. Magnus Carlsen ties the match against Ali Reza Ferruja. Magnus with the white pieces here in the first blitz game. It's getting complicated. Yeah. It's getting really complicated. Oh. This is coming in. This this is messy. Checkmate will end the game. That knight drops. It's two rooks and a bishop against the queen. It's too many material, too many pieces. White's king will move. Next, the white queen will jump back and defend. And there we go. Magnus takes the first blitz game. The black knight is just a perfect defender. Look how it blocks the checks, stopping the white king from moving. And there we go. It's a draw. And Magnus takes today's match. And uh, yep. the players with seconds left on the clock. Oh, this is so difficult. Oh! <gasps> Prague just blundered into checkmate in one move. What? He was winning. What a move. Dating blunder for Prague Nananda. He was able to take it to the tie breaks, but he lost both blitz games. And he only took one point in his match yesterday. Duda winning that match, taking two points. It was uh, a match win for Liam Lee against Anish Giri. All three points for Liam and Levon in that All-American battle against Hans Niemann took all three points. Magnus Carlsen was also able to take it to blitz tie breaks against Ali Reza Frusha, and he took two very important points. Magnus Carlsen, he is now in sole lead with 15 points. Two points behind him is young Pragnananda Alireza Fruja. Three points behind, but he is not going to be able to win the tournament. It is all about Magnus Carlsen and Pragnananda. And what happened in the finish there yesterday, David, could actually turn out to be decisive. Prag 
blundering massively yeah. in uh, the Blitz. What happened there? I think that's the blunder of the century, uh, the biggest blunder of Prague's career, potentially. If he had won that game, Prague, as he deserved to do, just one move away from winning, uh, then he would go into today's match knowing that tie breaks would have been on the cards. Beating Magnus in a tiebreak would have still clinched him the whole tournament, but now he doesn't have that cushion, Prague. He needs to win in the rapid portion, and heartbreak for the youngster. You see it there. He was devastated. Uh, just recovering from that shock, it's not going to be easy. But uh, he's capable. He's capable today. Yeah, he's got his coach, Ramesh, there. Do you think they have just uh, tried to forget about all of that and start focusing on today? Yeah, everyone blunders in their career. It's inevitable. Magnus has blundered several times. It's just about how you bounce back. And Prague has a great support network around him, including his coach, uh, Ramesh. And for sure, they'll have been trying to get their mind off chess yesterday evening, just trying to keep calm. And uh, today, it's just about the moves on the board. He just needs to refocus. If he can start strong, then yesterday will be forgotten. Yeah. Final day, you guys, of the FTX Crypto Cup. And here are the final matches in the tournament. It's going to be a uh, match between Alireza Ferrugia and Levon Aronian. A strong finish to the tournament for Ferrugia. And uh, he will be happy with a win there. Liemle against Hans Niemann. N Niemann still fighting to get his first point in the tournament. Jan Christoph Duda on fire, winning his last few matches today against Anish Giri. But all eyes will be on this one. Magnus Carlsen against Prague Nananda. The winner will most likely be the winner of the tournament. Prague, he has to win it in the rapid portion. But uh, that can definitely happen because if we look at the head-to-head -head scores between Magnus and Prague this season on the tour, we will see that Magnus has four wins. Prague has been able to beat Magnus twice this season, David. And what has been the key? in those games that Prague has won. The key has been showing a complete lack of fear, a complete lack of respect to the world champion. When Prague won that historic game a few months ago, he actually had the black pieces. He went for Magnus as king and he managed to break through. And Magnus doesn't like that. That's his one Achilles heel. Sometimes he forgets about his king's safety and uh, Prague needs to try and go for that weakness. And uh, he's done it twice. He's won twice on the tour this season. Both were just going for the world champion, not taking a step back, not playing solid chess. And today, kind of having to need to win, maybe that's actually going to help him, Prague. He knows knows he has to be aggressive. Yeah. And it's also interesting if we take a look at the win count for these two players. They have played the same amount of tournaments on the tour this season. Magnus has won 32 games with the white pieces. Pragnananda 22 with the white pieces. They are the two players on top of this table. So David, what kind of strategies should we now expect when these players have the white pieces today? Yeah, first of all, those are incredible numbers, yeah. especially Magnus winning 32 games with white. Uh, Magnus knows that that's where he's strongest. With black, he has tended to suffer a bit. Um, but for Prague, he also needs to make use of the white pieces of the first move. Prague has actually become one of the be best opening specialists in the world, especially in Queen's Pawn opening. So for Prague, he needs to win with white and somehow just neutralize Magnus when he has the white pieces. Yeah. Not going to be easy there. Some people will be very lucky. They will witness this on site in the Eden Rock Hotel in Miami. It is open for spectators today and they will get value for their money. Tanya is on site where all the drama will take place. And Tanya, what do you expect from today? A big, big fight here today, uh, Kaya, and oh my god, you cannot write a better script than this. I cannot wait for the action to start. But you know what, here at the Eden Rock, the action's already on, because to set the tone, we've got a simul going on. So the chess fever, Sunday morning, it's absolutely perfect, setting red getting ready for the Prague Magnus match. Let's find out what these guys think about it. Hey! Magnus. Magnus, that's a clear winner. What about you? Prague. Oh, wow, I love it. So Prague's got one supporter here. Magnus. And Magnus, another one. What about you, Magnus or Prague? Prague. I can see a 50-50 here, Kaya. We know that we want a back and forth fight and that's what it's going to be. <laughs> Fantastic. It's all happening in Miami. It's going to be 12 o'clock when uh, the players start their games today. Clock's ticking down in a little less than three minutes. Game one in the Miami arena inside the Eden Rock Hotel on the beautiful Miami Beach. It's going to be Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces in that very first game. 
Fox taking down. What do you expect the players are doing right now, Ivanka? Oh, uh, they will be in their last minute preparations and uh, it could either be sitting at the table, getting ready, getting in the right mindset. It could also be just pacing, just trying to work out. That's a nervous energy. And uh, there we can see Liam Le sitting in his chair, getting ready to make those moves. I think for Pragnanda, probably just somehow I always envisioned him as being calm. Yeah. <laughs> Together with Ramesh, you know, just calmly walking, discussing some last minute strategy and maybe some words of encouragement. Yeah. For Magnus, maybe it's just about being in a good mood. Yep, he was that yesterday. Liam Lea, currently the only player inside the Miami arena. Let's hear from him. Arriving for day seven. Finally, Liam, and you've really been on a roll lately. Do you think it will continue all the way? Yeah, hopefully. It um, doesn't matter for the tournament standings, but uh, I'm still going to try my best. But it does matter from a financial standpoint because you get paid for winning your matches, and these are these are big money for chess players uh, who want to evolve their game. Yeah, definitely. I think this is one of the tournaments with the highest price funds, and um, it definitely gives an extra motivation to uh, play the best chess we can play. We look forward to seeing you continue your good chess, Liam. Thank you. Last match today, Levon. How has the experience been with this esports format? Oh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, you know, all this uh, lights and music, very enjoyable. Is it different? Does it change your mentality that you get to listen to music while playing and things like that? I think it makes it more enjoyable, makes it more fun. And is this something that the Super Tournament should be considering too? For sure. For sure. I think uh, it doesn't really hurt anybody, so why not? As for your match today, Levon, what are you expecting? Um, it's going to be tough and I hope to be on a level, you know, to match uh, my uh, opponent's creativity. Good luck, Levon. Thanks. Once again, Prague, you find yourself in a position in a major where everything is decided on the last day. How do you feel? Uh, there's nothing to feel. I think I just have to play, give my best and see. And do you feel extra nerves or is it just excitement? It's just, yeah, um, excitement. I think everything is there. Uh, yeah, I just want to give my best and not really think about the standings and uh, other things. As a young chess player, uh, I would think that you dream about facing the world champion in a decisive game in these kind of tournaments. Uh, is this one of those situations that you dream about when you start playing chess? Uh, yes, you do. But probably it's world championship scenario. But this is also one of the best tournaments. And um, yeah, I want to just give my best and not really worry about the results. So we can take the world championships later when Magnus decides to play those again. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'll be nice if he plays again. Good luck, Prague. Yeah, thanks. Pragnananda admitting he is definitely excited, but there are nerves as well. This must be the biggest match of his career so far, David. Yeah, he's still early in his career and, I mean, this would be a huge stepping stone. This would propel him further uh, into the elite of world chess. Um, also, huge prize fund that would help him so much in his career, having that finance, having that resources to kind of uh, just continue playing these big tournaments. The invitations will flow. It's a huge day for this youngster. But Magnus is going to try and play the role of spoiler today. Headset on for Pragnananda. We have little information about what he's listening to. He's waiting for Magnus Carlsen. He's arriving now. Let's hear from the world number one. Magnus, do you still feel nerves in these situations with the final day and the tournament online? Yeah. Uh, I mean, if I didn't, it would be uh, would be a bit strange. But uh, I'm still, uh, you know, excited to play. What do you think about this uh, match today against Prague? I think he's very strong and it's going to be a huge fight. Good luck. It's going to be a huge fight, Magnus, with the white pieces. Prague, he has to win this in the rapid portion to win the tournament. Magnus wants to win it or take it to tie breaks and the match has started. Here we go, David. Yeah, the tournament, tournament all hinges on this game now. The first game of this final day has begun and it's the Reti opening. Magnus brings his knight out on the first move with white and Pragnalanda reacts in classical fashion. Black occupies the center with a pawn. And uh, Magnus taking a quieter approach, just getting ready to fianchetto his bishop. Prag continuing his strategy of throwing those pawns forward. And this is still very standard stuff. 
Magnus, throughout the, the uh, event here, throughout the FTX Crypto Cup, he has started a bit slowly. This is something we were discussing uh, before the show, and having the white pieces should help with that. Uh, normally, it's easier to kind of start well, uh, get a good opening, get a good start to the day when you have white. But Prague, he's been very aggressive in general with both colors, right? What do you guys think of this opening choice uh, from Magnus? Yeah, I think a wise opening choice. I mean, I, when you're playing someone so young like Prague, you probably don't want to duel them with cutting edge theory um, because they're going to be very well prepared for that. And I feel like Prague might have better cutting edge theory than Magnus. So he's trying to just take him into what is now a reverse Grunfeld opening mm. uh, and just take him into a position where he can get a game and play. But Prague at the moment playing extremely quickly as well. Uh, and we see some standard moves on the board here uh, with quite a solid start to the game so far. Yeah, and as you mentioned, Simon, this position could arise from the Grunfeld defence with colours reversed. Here, white has an extra tempo um, compared to that opening because you start uh, with the first move. But uh, Prague, one thing I will say, against the Grunfeld, he's had a lot of success using this system. So again, with colours reversed, with the white pieces, he likes to make this exchange that's just happened in the centre. He's like, he likes to bring his bishop out. If we kind of rewind a couple of months back, uh, when Prague played this fantastic game against Jordan van Forest with all these sacrifices, all these spectacular tactics, and he won, that was the Grunfeld. Prague had white, and it was this exact position just with reverse colours. So um, he's just using that pattern recognition. He realises what type of position he likes, where he's had success, and he's trying to um, kind of replicate that, despite the fact he's got black here in this game. And that's quite clever. Such a key idea, that, I think. Um, I mean, uh, everyone at home should be doing that as well. You, you've got to recognise what kind of positions you enjoy playing. Uh, and when I'm saying positions, mainly like middle game positions, and you want to always try to steer... Uh, the game into um, things that you're favourable playing, whether that's a tactical battle or certain pawn structures, uh, as we're seeing Prague do here, because you're going to play better in positions you're comfortable with, right? Yeah. So. And uh, I'm just checking the database, and I can actually see that Pragnana has played this before with the black pieces. In fact, not that long ago in uh, the Norway chess, not the big tournament, but the open tournament. And there he played against a Bulgarian grandmaster, and it was a draw. So Magnus now has a choice. You know, what's he going to do with the knight? Capture knights, trade knights, or just move the knight back? Yeah, White's knight in the centre of the board has that big decision to make. I think the most popular move, or at least the move with the best reputation uh, up until recently, was to retreat this knight. But maybe Magnus had it in mind that Prague loves those types of positions. So instead, he's uh, swapped off a, a set of pieces, heading closer to an endgame. And uh, now White is going to try and open up the diagonal for his light squared bishop. White's light squared bishop in front of his king is the key piece here. It's staring against Black's center from afar. Black's pawn center there, if it can stay intact, will ensure Pragnan under good long-term chances. But if Magnus can break open the centre, uh, maybe start using his pawn majority on this left side of the board, then uh, White will be doing well. So it's kind of double-edged. Both sides have reasons to be happy. White's queen now indirectly attacking Black's dark squared bishop on this C-line. And uh, yeah, this game, I guess it will just be about understanding the next, uh, the next handful of moves, at least, where to put the pieces, how to continue developing, especially from the black side. Black's king needs to get to safety. Yeah. And uh, white already has a threat on the board to play pawn takes pawn, and that is why Pragnanda simply moves his queen, protects the bishop. And uh, they're still following that game that I referenced earlier. And uh, in that game, white actually developed the dark squared bishop out to g5 to pin the knight. Mm -hmm. Magnus there, he was just taking a sip of water, but then he kind of paused when he saw this last move from uh, Pragnananda. OK, he's laughing again now. <laughs> By this point, we're used to this from Magnus. Seems to be a daily occurrence. But uh, there's some calculation to be done, because this last move, to me, initially, it looked like it was impossible, uh, just because there are some tactics now to calculate. Magnus looking away, <laughs> laughing, not entirely focused, perhaps, yet. <laughs> but um, if we just jump into the position, um, just while Magnus kind of recomposes himself. Uh, you guys mentioned there's a threat potentially along the C file. If you trade off a set of pawns in the center now, uh, if you make this trade, you can, uh, at least if you're new to this position, which I pretty much am at this moment, uh, you can push this pawn forward. Asking this black bishop a question, it's defended by its queen, but it needs to move now, being attacked by a pawn. If the bishop moves out the way, white has a nasty check. And uh, suddenly the black king in a bit of trouble. And I'm just wondering what Pragnananda's idea would be here. The black rook in the corner will fall off once black meets that check to his king. 
And uh, if we go back a couple of moves... Um, you could step forward with the bishop. Yeah, maybe you could the rook. hit this rook in the corner. Just by the speed with which Prague has played, and also the fact that you mentioned he's played it before, Jovanka, means that clearly black isn't losing here, otherwise the evaluation bar would have shot up. But uh, still some calculation to be done for Magnus if he hasn't studied this. Uh, a check now, I guess, would be met by a queen block. And if white's queen captures the rook in the corner, at the very least, black could do the same. Capture white's rook in the corner of the board. Maybe you could also castle the black king and argue that the white queen is trapped. Next move, black's bishop will move out the way. And, uh, for example, if white, I don't know, pushes a pawn, this bishop might move out the way and this queen is a goner. So really complicated stuff already. It's really sharp stuff. Uh, the players definitely, uh, especially Prague here, looks well prepared in the opening. Magnus decided, uh, if we go back to the game position, not to enter any murky complications. That's why Prague is clearly ready for uh, anything messy uh, that appears on the board. So Magnus just develops his pieces. He'll develop this knight. Next, he'll develop this bishop, connect his rooks, and the game will go on. I'm expecting Prague now to castle with haste. And, uh, yeah, in the balance. <clears throat> and Magnus <laughs> laughing again. Uh, we did hear rumours yesterday. There is a podcast he's listening to, probably one of his favourite podcasts. It must be a funny one. And uh, it was interesting, right, hearing from Levon before the start of today, saying that it's more enjoyable because he can listen to music. And it's very... We're not used to this when seeing chess. Players smiling, laughing. But maybe this simply is the new life when it comes to online chess. Because obviously you can listen to whatever you want. Yeah, I, um, I mean, it's quite refreshing to see yeah. someone enjoying themselves. But at the same time, as I think this works on online chess because the, the two players do have a computer. Because it would be incredibly distracting if you were playing mm. over the board chess and, you know, someone had the headsets and it was like bopping away yeah. or like laughing themselves silly. You know, I, I would be like... Come on, <laughs> get serious. Yeah. But then again, I like this kind of move towards, you know, I don't see why chess has to be so introverted. I mean, it yeah. could be super extroverted as well, involving as many people as possible. And uh, we do see Magnus develop the dark squared bishop. And I just want to introduce our competition, our yes. quiz of the day. Because and it's a cool one. It is a very cool one, because today we are asking for you to caption this picture. Yeah. And uh, maybe we can put it up on the screen. We have to get that picture up on. There it is. Yes. And uh, there we see young Pragnananda, yesterday's unfortunate moment. And we're asking, caption this. You don't need to edit the picture. Just caption, send, put in your caption into the tweet. And uh, remember to use the hashtag ChessChamps. And uh, can't wait to read out your answer. The best caption will win one year's Chess24 subscription. Oh, I'm looking forward to this. Our creative viewers, what will you find as a creative caption to that uh, prank picture? Go ahead and join the competition for one year. Chess24 Premium. All right, we have some moves in uh, this dramatic game, David. Yeah, and Prague is just following conventional wisdom here. Normally, in this type of position, when there's no direct tactics anymore, there's no big attacks yet, uh, it's just a wise to improve your worth placed piece and that black light square bishop was doing nothing sad at home uh, therefore it's come out and Magnus reacts by putting his knight on the side of the board we normally say don't do this knights are terrible on the side of the board but it's actually an outpost this white knight can't ever get kicked away by a black pawn therefore it stands relatively well also putting some big pressure on black's dark square bishop so that dark square bishop will now most likely take a step back will retreat and it's, again, it's just about who can place their pieces better. I love what both sides have done with their pieces. Sent nicely centralised, on all on active squares. Next, both sides will try and bring their rooks into the game. And it does feel like this is the calm before the storm. Whose position do you prefer? Um, Simon, Yovanka. To me, I, I mean, I'd happily take both sides here. Mm. Yeah, I, I think both players are just playing good moves at the moment. Uh, you can't fault anything that's been done. Um, I kind of like what Magnus has done to, to get a position which is less theoretical and, and more about the plans. I think he's going to try to use ex you know, that experience he's got and try not to make it too tactical uh, at the moment. Um, you know, maybe later on we'll see that. But Prague, of course, um, has played very well. He's got a very strong centre. His pawns are doing a good job. He's got all his pieces developed. So it's probably an equal position. But if you look at, 
most of Magnus's games, that just doesn't bother him at all. Um, when he's got the white pieces, he often goes to equal positions. Even sometimes he will go for slightly worse positions because he knows the plans and he's more comfortable in those types of structures. I would kind of like to know what he's listening to. I think someone said uh, a Norwegian comedy show. I don't know if that's an oxymoron. We mentioned that before <laughs> or not. Just see if I get in trouble now. Nope, it's all gone quiet. OK, um, so I don't know. What, 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 what is good comedy shows? I'd, I'd like to know. But Ooh. obviously something, something is making him laugh a lot. I mean, yeah. but it amazes me because... You know, I've done a lot of streaming, uh, a lot of other stuff. And when, when I'm playing chess, I can't have any distractions. I mean, I can put some music on, but I can't listen to a podcast mm -hmm. and, and understand what they're saying and laugh about that podcast and play a good game of chess. It just, it just bewilders me that he's able to do that. How is he able to do two things like that? I think I find it, I find it like quite, you know, miraculous, really. I mean, yeah. could you... Could you do that, David? Could you listen to, like, I don't know, a comedy podcast and play and play great level chess at the same time? It's it's amazing, really. It's incredible. Anyone who knows me knows I can't multitask. So, uh, um, yeah, I couldn't do it. I guess it's maybe similar to, um, if you imagine, in especially in the US, they have chess in the parks and all these hustlers and Washington Square Park, and uh, they're just kind of chatting while they play, yeah. trying to distract the opponent and kind of giving that banter back and forth. And, yeah, I guess some players have grown up with that. Most people grow up where chess is kind of a silent game in a big tournament hall and you can't distract your opponent. But uh, clearly this is adding a new dimension, um, this eSports uh, arena. And Magnus seems to be thriving on it. Meanwhile, a trade of dark squared bishops and white rooks are starting to gravitate towards the centre. White rooks need to be improved. The black rooks need to be improved. Uh, Black's queen also feeling a bit uncomfortable. I'm expecting her to... Uh, run away at some point in the next few turns. OK, there we go. Pragnananda puts his queen back on a nice safe square. I still like Black's pawn centre, to be honest. This kind of triangle formation that Black has in the middle of the board with his pawns. Rock solid. How do you ever break those down? Prag does not look uh, too concerned either. He looks pretty content with how the opening has gone. Yeah. I mean, it does look like Prague's position is pretty solid, but I have to say I, I'm still loving White's position. I just think that his position, especially when you bear in mind the match situation, where he just needs to tie the rapid portion. I think this is also quite nice for him. You know, he has the choice. I like, I think this move is actually maybe, I was going to say I like it, but then I stopped and I was like, hang on a second, think a bit deep, deeply. Um, I mean, it's quite a committal move actually, because, uh, I mean, yes, it reinforces the centre, but also there's a lot of tension on the board. You know, white always has the possibility of capturing the pawn. Maybe black can also capture the pawn as well. And uh, Prague switching sides, and he's put his rook on the B line. Yeah, if you like these types of positions, Yvanka, you should play the Grunfeld defence. Uh, you get these types of positions uh, on a regular basis. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is still a Grunfeld in, t in nature with the pawn structure, with the pieces. White uh, Magnus here, he's borrowing all of the kind of ideas from that opening. And now stepping forward with the White Queen. White's Queen wants to actually go to the left side of the board, start harassing that lonely Black Bishop. Black's Bishop out there, it's actually, I praised him putting it there a few moves ago, but it is actually, it's a bit of a target for White's hmm. Queen and Knight. So uh, Prague has to guard against that potential threat. I would have. Yeah, sorry, Simon. No, I, I, I would have thought Magnus would be very comfortable, actually, just the way this has gone. I mean, I think it's kind of a big advantage for Magnus having the white pieces in this first game because he's been, as you mentioned, very fragile in the first game. He lost to Hans, he lost to yesterday, he got smashed by Ferruja. He's lost a lot of the first rounds. Duda and as well. Duda, and like having white means he can control the way the game goes. So he wanted this position from move one, he's got what he wants. And that's, that's uh, you know, if we compare it to his Kara Khan in the first game yesterday, he certainly didn't want that position. We all know the Kara Khan's a rubbish opening. <laughs> just I wanted to just look at you there. Uh, uh, I, I joke, it's not a rubbish opening. It's a fantastic opening. And if you want to learn it, then Ivanka's got some fantastic <laughs> books on it. But he's got a kind of position he, he wants. And, I, and I, that is very important uh, just to get safely into the match. And let's remember, Prague has to win in the four games. He can't go to 
the, the playoff if he wants to win the whole thing. I mean, what a story that would be, though. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a bit sick of Magnus winning everything. Let's, <laughs> you know, he wins everything. Let's just let Prague have a chance. Well, yeah. we know it'll be, be a great story. Yeah. Um, and we did yeah. hear from uh, Tanya. It was 50 50 with the spectators uh, she talked to. And we're going to go back to Tanya in uh, Miami. What is the mood and the vibe like now, Tanya, that the match has started? It's just such a great atmosphere here, Kaya. The players are loving it. Everyone who's here for the Simul, they're talking about all the action that's going on on this one big matchup. And I've got a Magnus supporter and a Prague supporter here with me, Roy and Grant joining us. Hey guys, how are you doing? We are doing amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Are you having fun with your chess weekend in Miami? Yeah, it's been great. It's been great. And I mean this matchup, right? Given our tournament, the way it's shaped up, we could not have asked for a better final. Definitely. I'm, I'm definitely rooting for Prag today. He has done an amazing job, like in the beginning. He fumbled a little bit last two games, but then I'm definitely sure today he's going to come back, bounce back. Big, big moment for Prag because if he wins this, he wins the match. What do you think it's going to take for him to strike down Magnus? I think it's just the time pressure if he maintains his like nerves and uh, I think he's gonna, he gonna do great. And he has done it before against Magnus, so I'm definitely looking for it. All right, and of course, it's hard to bet against Magnus. Now, Grant, what do you think is going to happen today? Right, so obviously I think, uh, you know, Prague kind of showed how strong he was in the first, that first time he played Magnus and then beat him in the blitz round. But uh, then we saw Magnus beat him again, right? And so I think that's kind of how Magnus is. Like once you beat him once, he never forgets it. And then he just presses on. And so I think he's going to come out probably with the Catalan and we'll see how Prague handles it. But um, yeah, it should be a great match. I'm looking forward to it. Why do you like Magnus's play so much? Um, because he really... He has like very strong strengths, I think, in certain openings. Like you've seen him dominate with the Catalan all, you know, all year, pretty much. I think this has been kind of a new trend of his. But also, he's not afraid to just completely come at you with something that you don't have prep for. Because like also, Magnus knows that people have prep against him in the strongest openings. So he likes to blindside a lot, and that's what he's good at. He's good at taking you in the water and uh, when you don't know how to swim. So. Kaya, lots of punditry on here, discussions on how the opening's going. It's going to be all about who puts the pressure first and gets that first blow, that first win in the match. Back to you guys in the studio. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Tanya. And, uh, well, some chess fans that definitely know what they're talking about have been following Magnus a lot. And is Magnus uh, getting this game into that water where he's comfortable? He's definitely going to be very comfortable. This is his style of game. This is his. Uh, this is kind of classic Magnus. Um, I've got to praise Grant there that we heard from because he said Magnus has been dominating with the Catalan, and um, this is kind of a Catalan opening, or at least a kind of a cousin variation to the Catalan. But it's got all those characteristics. It's all about white light squared bishop. Look how it controls this whole long diagonal. Very typical of that opening, and uh, white has some pressure. It looks very balanced, especially the pawn structure, which is almost symmetrical, but white's pieces are slightly more centralized with the rooks now, the white queen, better place than the black queen, slightly superior bishops. It's all about whether Prague can neutralize the initiative that Magnus wants to whip up. And okay, Prague takes a timeout to push a pawn. Simon, you're the master of pushing a Harry the H pawn. <laughs> uh, is that I, timid or is that? I found it a bit strange. I thought he could have rerouted the knight maybe to the queen side there while, while he has the opportunity to. I mean, I, I, I know if we look at the pieces on the side of the board, they, they might be key to this position. You've got White's knight on the edge of the board. Uh, knights on the side of the board are generally quite bad, but it's, it's, it's kind of a great piece pointing at Black's weak pawn. Um, and you've got Black's bishop on the edge of the board, which hasn't got a very good range, but it is also pointing at White's pawn. Uh, and I was thinking Black maybe missed an opportunity to swap his knight off for that knight, but it's still a very solid position. And I think with that move that Prague played, just pushing uh, the Harry pawn, he's just saying, I, I, you know, I'm going to be patient in this game. There's no rush. Uh, I'm going to keep my call. I think my position is absolutely fine. Um, I don't need to panic. Come on, Magnus. I, you can't grind me. I'm the Prague. <laughs> um, I think that's basically what he's saying, right? Yeah. I mean, he, he's just, you know, confidently playing decent moves there. Yeah, solid move there from Black just defending this pawn. I guess White had a threat maybe of entering the Black camp with his rook. 
A uh, very nasty threat now against the bishop. The bishop is almost trapped. It only has one safe square. It has to retreat, challenging off against white's very strong bishop. And uh, the reason that black has uh, Prague here put his rook on this square is because now he defends this pawn. As you mentioned, Simon, it's a target for white's knight. But for now, it all clings together. And uh, black's knight also doing a good job on this square, for now, of stopping white's rook entering the seventh rank. This square is covered by black's knight. And I don't think this would achieve an enormous amount for Magnus. So. Um, right now, it's just about how can white improve his pieces. As you mentioned, the knight looks good in a way right now. The white queen is very flexible, but she is tied down to defending the pawn in front of her. White's rooks, beautifully placed, doubled up on the d-file. But what do you do with them? And uh, you definitely don't really want to touch the white bishop. It's a great piece anyway. So yeah, here is just about instinct and kind of when to go for it. Does Magnus go for it now? Maybe by bringing his rook in? Would you consider like pushing your kingside pawns here? Yeah, I mean, like h3 and g4. I mean, because you pointed out all, all the white's pieces are, are quite nicely positioned. I mean, I do think what Matt White has to be a little bit better here because he's got that open file totally under his control with both of his rooks. You know, two rooks on an open file is, is an ideal scenario, while Black's rooks are not as good. Um, also, prefer his bishop slightly. But what does he do? What does he do next, right? As you pointed out, it's not so easy to find a plan. And we can see that Prague's waiting. So when your opponent is clearly waiting with a move like Harry Six, you know, you, you've got a bit more time. So I, I might consider doing something a little bit weird on the king side here if, if I was playing white, um, you know, potentially. It's a bit of a weird plan, but maybe. I like this move in general. At least you have a safe square for your king, just in case there's any back rank checks later on. You also stop the black knight from ever jumping into your half of the board. Yeah. It's kind of a useful move. It's maybe not the most direct, but very useful. And you throw the move back to your opponent. I like it. Yeah, I, I like it for those reasons as well, uh, David. And uh, yeah, such a exciting position. So yeah. many things brewing in the future. And uh, whilst uh, the players are thinking, well, can I read out some of my captions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, already? Yeah, yeah. Nice. I mean, there's been fantastic response, and you guys cool. <laughs> are really knocking it out of the ball when it comes to your captions. So we are asking everyone at home to kind of caption this picture of Prague. There he is. Oh, poor Prague. And uh, the best caption wins one year subscription of Chess 24 Premium membership. And uh, Ian Man says, Silence of the champs. Mm. Oh, very good. And uh, Hisham says, is Magnus laughing at my move? <laughs> <laughs> and Ashish Kumar Singh says, chess will speak for itself. Oh, <laughs> nice one. Very nice. Keep them coming. Remember to tweet your answers using the hashtag chess champs. Yeah, very nice. All right. Chess will speak for itself, and that is uh, what uh, Prague needs today. He needs to win it in the rapid portion. He has uh, more time on the clock than Magnus Carlsen, ticking down under eight minutes now. Magnus made a move with his rook. Anything changing at all? Um, at least there's a threat in the position. That white rook is attacking Black's bishop on the sixth rank, so that bishop I would have thought needs to move. The fact that Prague paused means that there's actually an alternative, one that I missed originally, but I'm not sure whether he wants to go for this or not. Black does have a bit of a sneaky night jump into the center, potentially. Uh, but the fact that Prague has spent one minute now when dropping back Black's bishop looks very solid, uh, it's a bit concerning for me. Either he's going to go for something very strong or he's <laughs> maybe overthinking things. And uh, what do we think here? Maybe if we jump in, it could be a critical moment. Uh, right now, this bishop is attacked. Simon, do you have any uh, suggestions here? Yeah, I mean, I, I think your bishop dropping back just looks very sensible, but you've got the knight jump, and you've also got the weird, a weird rook move, haven't you? Try, trying to uh -huh. get rid of one of White's, yeah. one of White's rooks, because White's rooks are really the only thing that might be giving White an advantage. This one, or even rook b1, I was thinking, could, oh, wow. could, okay. could be playable. Um, move. I just want to swap off... I'll just make sure I'm not blind. <laughs> <laughs> <Swap. laughs> I just want to swap off a rook, right? Yeah. Um, and so, I'm saying that very slowly now because I was just sort of like, did I? You know, but it look, yeah, looks all right. But, but maybe this is what he's thinking of, you know, because obviously you want to get rid of your opponent's best pieces. What are White's best pieces? His rooks. Mm -hmm. He's gone for the sensible bishop b7, is, yeah, but which must be okay as well. It did cost him a couple of minutes. I like this one, Simon, uh, just to explain to the viewers. Um, you're just pinning White on this first rank and you're kind of deflecting away this White rook. So it looks like Black's giving up a piece. But when the rook's deflected and distracted away, its other rook drops. And... 
this looks very balanced, very equal, this type of position. So maybe a small uh, opportunity there for Prague to completely uh, neutralize White's pressure. But instead, yeah, he did play the most obvious one and a very solid bishop retreat. And uh, if the bishops disappear from the board, maybe Prague will be breathe a sigh of relief. Still some pressure, though, some awkward pressure on this pawn. It's just about whether White's knight is well-placed or misplaced, I feel. Uh, also, now that the black bishop's gone away, White has no pressure on this guy, so maybe the white queen is free to kind of jump into the center or maybe even jump the other way. And White will be quite active over the next few moves. Yeah, and uh, just to kind of mention that there is a pressing threat in this position. Pragnananda is threatening to play bishop takes bishop, and after king takes bishop, the knight will jump forward to the e4 square, forking the queen and the rooks. So you need to do something about that. And uh, that is why Magnus, you know, he, he kind of centralizes his queen. I'm a little bit surprised by that particular maneuver because I actually thought the queen would jump two squares forward mm -hmm. to the e5 square because, you know, it looks much more aggressive. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. I was just looking in one of these two directions. Um, you have mentioned in the past, Yvanka, that this is kind of the Goldilocks square, where it's just kind of perfect. It's not too hot, not too cold. You can go in any direction uh, a bit later on. So very flexible square from Magnus, uh, choice of square for his queen, and the bishops have left the board. So now it's just about the heavy pieces, plus these sets of knights. White's knight on the edge of the board has this threat of capturing a pawn now, and Prague needs to defend against it. Black is still rock solid, but... I'm just worried he's too passive, Prague. He's got to be a bit careful here. Maybe it's time to sort of try to activate his queen here, possibly. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I agree with you that if you look at White's pieces, White still has control of the open file. White has pressure with his queen and his knight. So all the White's pieces are, are doing something. Uh, and I'm trying to work out why, the, again, the evaluation bar, it doesn't always tell the full side of the story. I mean, maybe this is the evaluation bar if Black finds a series of very accurate moves, because otherwise, you know, he, he's going to feel the pressure here. But if I was black, I'd be looking at ways to try and get some activity. So I'm wondering if I can sort of use my queen to check and then either offer a queen, offer it, maybe even offer a queen exchange on the, on the next move, possibly uh, here or into this. Uh, yeah, here maybe. Yeah. Got to be careful with this rook check, but I think it's, I think it's okay. I think it's okay. Okay, Ooh. maybe. Yeah, you're right. Again, I, mean, I, say, this, I say, I say. Maybe this would be a mistake here because uh, you're right, yeah, Simon. Uh, yeah. This rook check hits the black king, and after a rook trade, um, maybe you can run maybe, to the side of the board. Okay, but, it's... but it's a bit scary. If your rook gets deflected away, then uh, you would lose the black queen. I mean, so, there's tactics. I suppose this is the way that, you know, it, it, if you can swap the queens, get your rook into the game, you get active. Well, OK, he, he's gone for another queen move. A bit more passive, th this one. He's uh, playing very defensively, Prague. Um, I guess there is one active idea. Maybe he wants to go for this white knight. This white knight, again, is it a strength? Is it a weakness? It's unclear at the moment. And he's holding everything together. The more I look at it, the more I think it's quite OK. And, um, yeah, right now, I don't really see a way for Magnus to take advantage. Again, I'm always looking for tactics now that you've mentioned this rook check. For example, knight takes pawn. Is this possible? Because after the queen recaptures, can white uh, give a check now? This looks very scary. Uh, because again, if the black rook kind of moves away and captures suddenly after a bunch of trades, the black queen will be uh, kind of free of charge, just captured. This, uh, I mean, suddenly it's getting sharp. It looks, it looks good, that line. It, it, yeah, it... <laughs> Knight takes pawn. Knight takes pawn. Yeah, I mean... Uh... Maybe there are tactics on the board. For example, Black's Knight could jump into the centre of the board, Oof. breaking Ooh. the connection between the two white rooks, giving itself up. But uh, if it's captured, then this white rook would fall. It's getting really sharp now. Yep. I mean, there's all sorts of tricks, and both players under five minutes. So uh, if we go back to the current position, Knight takes pawn, Maybe possible, but a lot of calculation will be required. That's why Magnus has slowed down. It's quite funny. Look, I think a lot of people don't realise that chess positions, there's so much going on under the surface, right? I mean, it's, they're like, you call them icebergs, right? You've got the iceberg, and then underneath the, the ocean, you've got this massive bottom of the iceberg. And even in positions like this, which kind of seem fairly straightforward, uh, as in symmetrical pawn structure, doesn't seem like anyone's attacking. You've got these always these little tactics, and they are really what kind of drives the position. And um, you know, it, you've got to be so aware of these mini tactics. Always, uh, I didn't see that knight takes pawn, even though we've been looking at the rook check. Um, and then the other knight coming in. These are very deep tactics and are seemingly 
simple position. Yeah. Um, just shows you how complex chess can be. Yeah. Yeah. Magnus thinking for more than two minutes now. One game has finished in the arena. It's a draw between Levon and uh, Alireza Ferruja. And uh, Levon, let's hear from him after that first game. This ended up being a defensive battle to begin the day. Oh, yeah. I, I completely forgot about 94 and then uh, I had to watch out. Uh, those kind of games when you manage to save a draw, do they make, give a good feeling? Or are you a little bit frustrated that you ended up in the position to begin with? I didn't think it was so bad. I thought it was a tiny bit worse for me, but it should be a draw, generally. Good luck. Thank you. Wow. Big moment. The fans are inside the Miami arena and they have uh, some cool tickets today to watch this drama. The spectators in the arena sitting only a few meters away. And the drama, David, is it starting in this game now? Look at the bar. I think it is starting. I According to the computer, at least, Magnus has made a mistake. So we said that this was possible, the knight capture of a pawn, and it holds together with tricks. Uh, if the black queen takes the white knight, actually, Pragnananda will lose uh, due to the line we showed just a few moments ago. But, OK, there we see Stockfish. The computer says that black has one move to give a significant advantage, and it's a black knight retreat. Prag has played it. Of he's course. played it and he's turned it around. Of course he played it, David. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, so. <laughs> we're not surprised anymore. Prag nearly always plays the best move when one is much better than all the other alternatives. Yeah. Was Prag it a difficult move to find? Yeah. They say that the most difficult move in chess is always a backward knight move because you always want to be looking forwards. Knights are so tricky. The black knight we showed, it, can have, uh, it could have jumped forward, attacking the white queen in two different ways. Instead, it steps back, attacking the white rook, and Magnus has sacrificed a piece. If the white rook, which was under attack from the black knight, if it had moved away, then it would have been safe for black to win white's knight. So Magnus, he's try just trying to get the highest price possible for his piece there. So now he's two pawns up, Magnus, but his knight is about to drop. Doesn't seem to be laughing anymore. No. Uh, after that little exchange of uh, moves there. Yeah. Uh, so, so what is it about the position now? Because Magnus obviously made this uh, move. What is it about the position now that has him maybe not too optimistic about it? suddenly the stakes are much higher on the board. So we will most likely see a scenario where black has an extra knight, but white has three pawns in return. And that's a significant imbalance. Uh, white's pawns, if you look at them, they're not very far advanced. They're not very scary. Black's knight doesn't look great right now, but if it activates itself, black is essentially playing with a whole extra piece. So the stakes are h higher for Magnus. If he's not accurate, if he doesn't find any active counterplay, he's just going to be a piece down, he's going to be suffering, and he's going to lose the game. Uh, it's up to Prague now to see whether he can take this white knight off the board and go on to convert that uh, material advantage. And he is given a check, but he has to take that knight. And yes, it's disappeared off the board. And uh, Prague, well, he is in good chances to secure the win. Magnus's hopes in saving the draw probably lie in the fact that there aren't that many pawns on the board. If all the pawns disappear and the queens get traded off, then it probably will fizzle out into a draw. And, uh, of course, remember the Black King? It's not that safe. Yeah, and we see on the screen Magnus there. He hesitated before taking a pawn with the White Queen just for a few seconds. It was the only move on the board to stay in the game. And now he retreats and he's broken the pin. If you look at the Black Queen and the diagonal she sits on, White has a Rook, White has a Queen and White's King, all on the same diagonal of the Black Queen. Yeah, it's, <laughs> he's setting traps, Magnus Carlsen. He's setting a similar trap to the one we showed a bit earlier. The most obvious move in the position now for Prag would actually be a blunder. So he's hoping that Prag picks up his knight. Maybe we can show this on the board. Uh, we do have this material imbalance. Black's knight is now long-term going to be facing off against three white pawns. Everything else is level. Uh, if Black moves the knight, it looks like Black is winning with a fork, a double attack, but white can use this continuous kind of motif, this tactic. White can give a check, hitting the king, and after a bunch of exchanges here, the black queen is no longer protected. So Magnus has set this trap, trying to win the black queen. We won't see Prag blunder, of course. If he hadn't spotted this blunder, then he would have played this knight jump immediately, but his knight is required to block the eighth rank. Maybe the black queen should move. Uh, if the black queen moves, you do set up this threat. So where to go? That's the question. There's a lot of tension on this diagonal. Magnus is uh, setting traps. Prague now down to around two minutes, needs to solve those threats. And OK, he attacks this pawn with his queen. But uh, 
It is just attacking the pawn, though. I mean, it's not actually renewing the threat of uh, the knight attacking the rook because of the same trick. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, this queen is still on the same diagonal as the white queen. So, uh, OK, how does Magnus protect this pawn, though, if he brings this rook up the board? As Yovanka mentions, this knight, uh, this knight jump, he does play this move. This would be met by a nasty check. Same idea we showed earlier. Uh, so right now, Prague, he has to fight against the combined might of these three pieces, but they're not really threatening anything. It's so tense. I mean, the computer might favor black, but if white kind of keeps this bind, if white maybe starts maneuvering some pieces towards that black king, who knows? Who knows here? I'm surprised Magnus hasn't reacted, though, because I don't know if he missed this or he kind of got to this position by... Uh, he kind I of stumbled into it. I think he must have just, he, he wouldn't have gone for this position. I mean, I, I, why, why would the white pieces do you want to give away? Uh, you know, you're, you're basically allowing your opponent winning chances mm -hmm. uh, because the position is now so unbalanced. You're giving Prague decent winning chances. He's got an extra piece at the end of the day. And, uh, you know, it's very likely at some point white could lose another pawn because those pawns are weak. Okay, he's come all the way back now. So now he's trying to bring his knight into the game. I kind of like that move. It's quite a, quite a, you know, you need to get your pieces rolling. Uh, and I like going into the corner of Queens because it just looks kind of cool, right? Uh, you know, you don't get a chance to do that very often, but his knight will jump out. Um, and this is this is uh, quite dangerous, I feel, for Magnus now. I mean, he loses with the white pieces, and, you know, if he does in round one, yeah. that's going to be a, a real, real, like, uh, upstart to the day. Um, it's not that bad for him because, of course, he's got his pawns and he's got three pawns and he's got nice central control, but yeah. still... I was actually wondering about this move on the last turn, uh, Prague. He had this, uh, he had this position. He could have dropped his queen back immediately. Maybe it was even stronger uh, because this white pawn would be less defended than it is in the game. But either way, in the current position, massive threat on the board. Prague will win if he gets this knight fork, hitting the queen and rook. So Magnus needs to do something about it. Pressure on the world champion, lower on the clock as well. I, I, I have to say, I just saw a, a, a really good answer to your tweet there. Mm -hmm. And it so was, um, yeah, I think it was at the, I don't know if it's this one, but it was uh, the picture of Prague and it says, when you realise you've got to play England on board free for India. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, that is such a good, famously, we have the main man sitting next to us, we've yeah. got the gold medal, so... Uh, i that, I didn't play Prague there. <laughs> well, I mean, but that, that, was a, that was an awesome tweet, yeah. so uh, that must be a contender already. I mean. Definitely. Uh, uh, that one, but uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> playing the fearsome David Howe, you know, so like... Uh, uh. Who won seven out of eight games in the Olympia. That's just crazy. One draw, seven wins. Insane. Oh. Yeah, and meanwhile, the Queens are off the board in this game. So that is one step closer to end his end goal here, Prague. That Black Knight now can finally enter the fray, enter the action. And White's pawns still don't look great, especially those two pawns uh, on the left side. For white, they are isolated, they are potentially weak. You mentioned it, Simon, if one of those pawns drops off, black is going to win this game. So black just needs to coordinate. I think the key here as well is keeping black's A pawn intact. If black can keep the A pawn alive, it's a potential winner in the end game. It might march down the board. But if that black pawn falls, then, I don't know, black's two remaining pawns on the other flank, it won't probably be enough for victory. It's somewhere between a draw and a win here, but it's all about black. Yeah, but the thing is, though, black's rooks are really active and uh, black's knight is also well placed as well. And uh, I, I like what Magnus is doing. You know, he's simply saying, OK, let's just uh, mobilize my extra pawns in the middle of the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, surely now it's time for black to get his rooks mm. activated. And, um, you know, that the C pawn which is the one next to the white rook, uh, looks looks like a, a natural target for black to me. Um, you know, um, you want to find targets and attack them uh, when you're playing chess. And black has a... And it, here he goes, he's, he's piling on the pressure to that pawn. And I'm wondering, how, how on earth does white actually guard that pawn? I think he forgets so, it. So he is going on defensive, but Prague plays this knight move immediately. Yeah. And our words, that is a... I love that move, because that knight, if it sits in front of that pawn, you're really suffocating the rook. And I, I mean, you're not going to really get better chances than beating the world champion yeah. than a position like this. I mean, this is, you know, there's a lot of work to do, but Prague has a great chance here. And what a start to the, today's story it would be if he manages to win with black in round one. Yeah, the wow. Trend, the trend might continue. Magnus, just a slow starter. 
And he had a great position, the world champion, from the, uh, from the opening, early middle game, and then Prague just turned it around. Prague was just tactically sharp at that one kind of crucial moment when everything was happening, and this is the result. Black has just a beautiful endgame. I think if colours were reversed here, if Magnus had the black pieces, it would just be game over. He would win this one. So it's just about Prague's endgame technique now, which we've seen is very, very good. And, uh, okay, White, meanwhile, centralizes this as king. The move you mentioned, Simon, that knight is threatening to jump and what, attack both White What, if, what if you time. go a6 here? <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, if you move the pawn forwards one square, look how embarrassed that rook is. But I guess Black can't move either. But it just seems like, you know, we can maybe show it on the board. And look at the rook in front of that pawn. It has no squares it can ever move to. And I'm moving that pawn to take away a square. Uh, I mean, that, that's a very tempting move to play. I don't know, but you've got to think how you improve the position mm. after this move. And he's played oh, it. He's played it. Um, but how do you now improve? Because you can't also move the black rooks as well. Yeah. He's, uh, he's going to defend this pawn, I guess, with his rook, and then he'll move the knight out of the way at the right moment. Uh, yeah. He will threaten at some point to start jumping and maybe trying to trap this rook if white isn't careful. I think he is going to go for your plan, uh, Simon, of trapping the rook. Maybe this way. Go go backwards and then uh, just push the A pawn forward and just keep on embarrassing that rook. You can and do it again, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Strap this rook on the edge of the board. <laughs> it, looks, it looks horrendous for white, this position. Really bad for I white. I mean, yeah. not just bad, but really bad, I, I would say. I mean, you know, you, you're, you're probably going to win the C pawn as well at the right moment. Uh, and then you're really yeah. just a piece up, aren't you? And I mean, uh, yeah. look what Praga's doing, you know, he's like, yeah, you know, I'm not going to rush with that plan. I'm going to bring in my king. And so that's why Magnus quickly moves the rook over and says, no, that piece is not coming to the action. At the very least here, Prague can just retreat his knight, hitting this rook. And when the rook moves, he can bring his other knight into the game, hitting this rook, hitting this pawn. He's going to win this pawn. And uh, it's just about whether Magnus here can activate his rooks. The white rooks want to kind of enter the seventh rank and start going for black's two weaknesses, uh, the kind of pawns that have been abandoned on the king side. So maybe still some hope for Magnus if he can get his rooks active. But to me, it just seems like if this pawn drops and then maybe this one drops afterwards, it should eventually be winning. I love Prague's move, though. Why rush uh, with this plan? This plan is there forever. First, he defends the seventh rank. And uh, if you defend all your weaknesses, What's White going to do? Magnus loves fixing pawns. Uh, he has, he's won the Connect 4 game here, uh, for sure. But the rest of his position is just falling apart. At the right moment, Black, he does it now. Black will just step back, attacking this rook. The rook's going to move. The Black Knight's going to hit this rook, hit the pawn, and things are going to start falling. Oh. Magnus also ticking under the minute on the clock now in this dramatic first game in the match. Could Prague take the lead in this match that will decide the winner of the FTX Crypto Cup. Look at that picture, the 17-year-old head-to-head -head with the world number one in an intense fight, but he doesn't seem to be put up by, uh, by this or any nerves, nothing. Prague just playing his best chess as always. Yeah, and his killer instinct has been good in general, Prague. Normally when he gets the advantage, he converts it. Just, okay, barring that uh, disastrous game yesterday uh, in the tie breaks, but yeah, whenever Prague has the advantage, yep. he nearly never slips up. I think that's what sets him apart from the rest of this young generation. Okay, Magnus centralizes one rook. So, okay, let's let's say you're you're the captain of a chess team. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can pick one Indian player, Gukesh or Prague, <laughs> and you've got to decide in five seconds. Oh, Gukesh or Prague? <laughs> you only get one of them. Prague. Prague. Just because he's beaten me. In. Uh, Gukesh. Okay, right. I, I don't know. What do you get? What, you... what about Nihal <laughs> Sarin? What about Eric? I was going to say uh, yeah, yeah, Sarin. Yeah. You've got so many now. So... Uh, uh, brilliant, brilliant young players. We have a pawn being won here, though, and now it's, it's. There's. I think there's still quite a bit of work to do here. But as you yeah. said, David, Black's A pawn is so important, mm -hmm. um, and it might sort of revolve around whether Black can win White's pawn on the side of the board and Queen his pawn. Um, because those, you know, White has those pawns coming up the board. Um, it's not easy to win this one. Yeah, still a lot of work to be done. He's taken some of the risk out, uh, Prague, by swapping one set of rooks, but he's also maybe minimised his winning chances because there's less material on the board. So there's always that imbalance. It's always that kind of judgment call. Do you swap pieces, kind of reduce the chance that you come under attack, but also reduce the chance that you have enough kind of firepower later in the game? And... Uh, Oh, the lights Ooh. went off behind them, really dark in the studio, <laughs> and uh, lightning there almost. But uh, White is stepping forward on one flank. Those white pawns, scary, 
the four versus two advantage white has on the right half, but they will be dealt with uh, quite easily by the black king and the black pieces. Magnus, he's just trying to control that black knight. If that black knight somehow attacks that lonely white a pawn, I think it's going to be game over. It's uh, so close now. Big question here for Prague is, you know, is it a good idea for him to trade off rooks? Because, uh, OK, we see uh, Magnus give a check to the rook, but it is possible for the rook to come down to the third row and give a check and attack the pawn and force the rooks off the board. Yeah, it's Magnus's move, though. He might stop that idea. Um, he pushes his pawn forward. Yeah, it's a good question, Ivanka, the rook's coming off. I guess I would only dream of going for that as black if you can guarantee that you're ahead in the race. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just kings, pawns, and even if there's a knight on the board, it's it's so uh, close, all these races, these pawn races. I mean, rook, rook across two squares is very tempting, yeah. isn't it? I mean, uh, I, trying to it is swap very, them off. The swap rooks. them off, yeah, I mean, because... Yeah, okay, I, I like awesome. this move, you yeah. know, because look at the white rook. Doesn't have that many squares. And, uh, well, Magnus is uh, going on a huge operation just to trade pawns. Yeah, Prague just says, OK, I'm going to control some squares. Big threat now. Black just wants to play pawn takes pawn on this side of the board. If it happened on Black's terms, it would have been very strong. Now this pawn trade. I'm slightly surprised Prague went for that so quickly. He is low on, uh, on the clock. White has two pass pawns now in the centre of the board, the E and F pawns. But yeah, okay. Start marching. As then uh, Prague is playing very carefully, which fits in so well with this uh, technique that when you're playing with less time on the clock, just make a few moves, overprotect everything, and leave those critical moments for when you've gathered more time on the clock. There is a funny mistake that Magnus could play here if he puts his rook in front of the pawn. Um, we could see that same idea. I mean, it's just, uh, just uh, you know, um, very unlikely to happen. But um, it's kind of a move you would look at. But OK, the king comes in now and I guess Magnus has just got to use his pawns, use his rook to cause as many problems as he can. And he probably wants to bring the king now in where the white rook is and Prague on the offensive. And uh, Prague's going to pick up another pawn here, isn't he? Probably at some point, I think. Yeah, he's yeah. got to be careful. There's a threat to push white's f pawn forward. If white's pawn steps forward and attacks the black knight, the black knight is actually pinned. And the white king also going towards that black knight. So Prague here, most likely he will move his king. There was an interesting opportunity, actually, on the last move. Prague could have forced the rooks off uh, by bringing the black rook to the fifth rank. He could have done that, and he didn't choose to swap off. He's just not got enough time to work out whether trading off the rooks will win for him. And uh, Could now, he have still done that last? I mean, yeah, can, he, last move. can he do, go back and try that again? I mean, he's got to try to win this position. It's he can't. so hard to judge, though, with 15 seconds left. Yeah. It's such yeah. a big game, the biggest match of his career. Ten. He's gone under ten seconds. Move that king. And he has moved it to the G7 square, so Prague is so brave. He doesn't want the draw at all. He's not going to repeat anything. And uh, now I'm guessing the knight is forced back. The problem okay, is you might have to repeat the position in order to kind of put your pieces back on their best squares. Black's king is going away again. And uh, which way are you going to go? Either way, you've repeated that position. This is the second time we've seen this position. Also the second time we've seen this position. He's got to be really careful now, Prague, what he does. Otherwise, the position might repeat and we'll see a draw if the position repeats for that third time. Oh, He yeah. has to maybe offer a trade of rooks. He goes for it. Well played. Very good I mean, move. Th this is maybe a little bit of a difference between Prague and Anish. Don't want to be nasty to Anish, but we saw Anish when he was playing uh, against Magnus. He was getting great positions, but he often took the draw, mm -hmm. um, you know, because his time was getting low. But Prague is so brave, he, he's going for it. And I think you've got you to gotta go for it, uh, even if it's risky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, there was a small missed opportunity. I think Prague could have forced the rooks off the board. Now Magnus has got his rook out. White's rook in the middle, in the middle there looked good, but it needed to get out of the way of its own pawns. And now White's central pawns are going to start Stepping forward, suddenly it's not so easy at all for Prague. And uh, these two white pawns are a bit scary. How do you stop their advance? He's very short of time as well. Yeah. I mean, uh, you, you might have to drop back the knight or something, could, could be an idea, mm -hmm. uh, just to try to handle those pawns. Uh, and also, you know, there, there we go, the knight does uh, drop back uh, and just wait and see what white's going to do next. Mm -hmm. Because the white rook is, is, is quite passive and, OK, it comes to this square, but now it might get harassed a little bit, uh, but White's pawns just about give him enough compensation at the moment in the centre. Yeah, look at the clock times. Magnus was down low on the clock, just like Prague, but he's played so quickly. He's built up a minute and a half now, Magnus. He's gained move, uh, gained time with every move. 
And OK, if he wants now, Magnus, can, he can repeat the position by going back to the side. Oh, I think he will. Look he at the can bar. start playing for a win. Wow. I, I think he's going to play on for the win, you know, because the momentum has turned. You know, look at the knight. The knight and the rook have not coordinated well. Meanwhile, white, look at it. It's a massive Magnus. threat. Big threat. Pushing the palm of the check is nearly checkmate here. Um, and uh, actually, this is now yeah, getting very dangerous for Prague. I mean, especially with his time, higher. right? Oh, wow, yeah. he's given up his knight. He gave oh, wow. the knight back. He's going to secure the draw most likely now, Prague, but his winning chances have gone. He gave up the black knight for two white pawns. It's level pawns, level material. Uh, this game should be heading towards a draw. He bailed out at the right time, though. He lost control, Prague, and really mature decision with five seconds on his clock. He said, OK, I can't lose this game. Of course, a win would have been nice, but I can't lose. And uh, yeah, here we see a couple of checks. White's king steps back. It's still white with the advantage because white's king and white's rook are slightly more active than their counterparts. But what do you guys think? Yeah, I think it's just a draw. Um, this is the idea. And switch the rook across. And uh, if white tries to, if white grabs the pawn on h6, then the rook can step forward and actually start munching on the a pawn. And that will be a complete draw. Very, very easy. Yeah. And then again. Magnus is the master at squeezing out those small advantages, grinding out these endgames. He's smiling there, probably because of something he's listening to. The position itself is not too many chances for white. It looks like Magnus on his screen. He was about to push his pawn, his passed pawn forward in the middle of the board with white. The problem is black's h-pawn, uh, as Yavanka mentions, if it's allowed to live, it's going to start running. I expect Prague to start pushing his own passed pawn now. Just not enough material left to no. win this one with best play, unless there's a big blunder. And there we go. This yep. pawn is a bit of a distraction for white. And maybe now white can try to get his king to the other side of the pawn uh, to, to try and force, you know, try and get some checks available. But of course, this is a draw with correct play. Uh, but, you know, from going from the position Prague had, he, he's going to be feeling the pressure quite intensely now. And Magnus now going for this pawn. And uh, I would have thought this is really not going to leave many more chances. OK, this is a clever move because now the white king will come in and, and at least fought black, force black's king backwards at the right moment. Mm. Prague, though, equally clever, <laughs> sets clever. a nasty trap. If the white rook steps down two squares and captures that black pawn, black's rook would have stepped up. There would have been a check and a skewer across the board. Instead, white steps forward, the king is checked back, black's rook is going to go away again, and any time the white king steps forward, it gets checked away. That's the drawing mechanism there. And yeah. uh, it's so, so instructive how Prague doesn't go passive with his rook and get greedy capturing pawns and allowing the white king to reach the, the sixth row. And instead, every time the king goes to the fifth row, gets checked away. And uh, that's it. A draw. <gasps> a dramatic game that ends up in a draw. They are tied after the first game in this intense fight to win the FTX Crypto Cup. Prague with uh, the black pieces had some good winning chances in this game. It ends up with a draw. And in the next game, starting in 10 minutes, Prague will have the white pieces. Let's uh, see if we can get some reactions in Miami. That was quite the up and down game here, Prague. Yeah. Um... I think I had good chances somewhere, but yeah, um, he played quite well. He defended well. Thank you. Yeah. Short comment from uh, Prague. He wants to rush to his lounge and prepare for the next game where he will have the white pieces. In this one, the first one, he had some good winning chances. David, what happened in this first game? Yeah, Prague had. Enormous winning chances. He found this really nice trick earlier in the game to win material. Black had a knight against the white pawns, and it was just this one moment where maybe he let the win slip. And he could have forced a very advantageous endgame here. He could have forced the rooks off the board. We talked about this. Is this a good exchange? Is this a good trade? He went for this a couple of moves later when, it was, uh, when the opportunity had passed, but he could have forced the trade now. He could have brought his rook forward. The white rook has nowhere to go. The exchange is inevitable. If the rooks disappear from the board, it's just winning for black. Black still has these two potential winners, potential queens. The white king can try and step forward. The black king can block its advance. And at some point, black is just going to step back with his knight, go after this weak pawn. The black can also head, uh, the black knight can also head towards this weak pawn. 
and uh, Prague here for sure he would have won the game unfortunately later on he messed it up slightly but I just want to show one final moment where here White has a huge threat of a check a winning check with his pawns Prague in really mature fashion realized he'd missed his opportunity and just bailed out into a simple draw by giving up his knight for these two scary pawns he took a pawn here and then he grabbed uh, one pawn on the edge of the board we saw the game fizzle out to a draw from here up and down but in the end a fair result mm. And the drama between Magnus and Prague continues in eight minutes. Before that, we're going to loosen up before the tournament. So I had to challenge the players in a Miami quiz. We're now at Miami Beach. If you were to go down to the beach, have a swim, which ocean would you be in? Wow, Atlantic. There are two, two oceans, yes? Or... Yeah, it's Atlantic Ocean. Right? Uh, it's not Pacific, no? It's Atlantic. Assume the Atlantic and... Uh... Her being kind of meek here. Probably Magnus got this one right. Pacific? I think it's still Atlantic. How many Miami based major league <laughs> sports teams can you name? No, this is tough. I think I'd be the last one to finish in this quiz. No, no, no. no. <laughs> wait, wait, let me think. No, no, but okay, I'm not into all this football. Let's not dwell into that. Well, I don't really follow sports, so I, I don't think I can name one. I know the hit. Then uh... <laughs> the Heat, the Dolphins, the Marlins, Marlins, Heat. Yes, Miami Heat is very famous, of course. Do they have a hockey team? I don't really care about hockey. It's a stupid sport, anyways. Oh, there's Inter Miami. They're playing NYFC on 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 Saturday. I kind of want to go to that. If you were to uh, have cryptocurrencies, where would you store them? Yeah, I have totally no idea. I. I um... <laughs> FTX, of course. Where would I store them? Uh, don't you store them in the computer or like... I don't have a clue about crypto, but I would go to FTX, of course. <laughs> no, I have no idea about those things. Obviously, on my FTX account, I guess. Do you know the value of one Bitcoin in dollar right now? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Probably, I, I don't know, some, some thousands. 20? 20,000? 20, 40? 22,000. It was $30,000 at times, even in a mall, I guess, yeah, so... Right now, I, I have no idea. I think it's around 25,000, something like this. Right now, it's around 22, 23. Oh... <laughs> $25,000, something? I could say... 25,000? And in this series of the Champions Chess Tour, we've had several winners. Can you name them? Did Magnus win any? <laughs> I think I won the first couple. I know, I won one. Yeah, probably Magnus won a bunch and then Ding and Duda. It was me. Oh, Levon, 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 Levon. I think one Ding won one, one of the tournaments against Prognando. The one that I just played, Aronian won. And then now we're playing here. They're great chess players, not as good <laughs> in the quiz. Were you impressed, David? Uh, no comment. No comment. <laughs> oh, funny quiz with uh, the players. Not all of them knowing that the Atlantic Ocean is uh, the one uh, next to Miami Beach. But they're great at chess. Let's take a look at the results from uh, the first games in this final round in the FTX Crypto Cup. A bunch of um, wins in this first round. Jan Christoph Duda winning game one against Anish Giri to take the lead. Liam Le taking the lead against Hans Niemann. Levon Aronian and Ali Reza Fruja played a draw and so did Magnus Carlsen and Pragnananda. But Prague, he had big chances in this first game with the black pieces. And in uh, Miami, we have heard a bunch of people supporting Magnus Carlsen, but Tanya, are there any big uh, Prague fan clubs in Miami? 100% and that's because chess speaks for itself and Prague with his phenomenal performance has garnered so many fans but that goes a while back Kaya because we've seen his growth during the entire tour from the first time when he beat Magnus up until now playing against Magnus for that championship so many many fans here and i've got two very special guests with me uh ayushi and harshil and they are here as part of the media team now this match has blown up in india uh, on the socials everywhere it's a big moment for sports guys and you're here covering the event for chess space india tell us what does this mean for indian chess fans 
It's amazing. I mean, uh, watching Prague just beating Carlsen and having the Prime Minister tweet about it to now Prague playing against Magnus trying to win the championship for the FTX Crypto Cup. It's just what a what a pro, what progress over the time, you know. And in India, I think people are just talking like I think 8,000 people are watching it live on Chess Base India right now. And it's going to be late in the night, you know, when the game gets over. People are there throughout. They're active in the chat. They're trying to understand the positions and it's just blown up. So Prague being in this store, it's been amazing for Indian chess. And this is way past midnight, so everyone's up watching this big, big game. What do you think about it? And I see, Ayushi, you've been following all the action as well. Yeah, definitely. So, as daunting as a task it is to beat Magnus Carlsen, the first thing that we heard about was Vishy Anand beating him, P. Hari Krishnan beating him, and then to have Pragnananda do that in this particular event, I think it is beautiful. He's already drawn one game, and we have three more to go, so we're super excited. So are the fans. The the following on Chessbase India has been extremely eventful and everyone's been in the chat commenting and rooting for Pragna just the way we are. Wow, now it's also blown up on social media. We saw it the first time when it happened. We had the Prime Minister tweeting. We had Sachin Tendulkar talk about the big win. And if Prag is able to pull this one off, it just takes Indian chess to a whole new level. Absolutely. I think if Prague is able to pull this off, I'm sure that all those people who have tweeted will tweet about it again and Twitter is going to blow up there. It's not, Prague is not going to be underrated anymore. Trust me about that. <laughs> We're all waiting to see how this match pans out. Now, Ayushi, you've been following some of the media houses and what they're saying on Twitter. Can you tell us a little bit? Sure. I think one thing that we read on Republic World is that R. Pragnananda and Magnus Carlsen are set to play against each other and how people are just talking about how can Prag beat Magnus and literally Indians are going crazy over all the social media talking about what can Prag do better. Everyone's giving ideas on social media, on Twitter, people are tweeting on what can he do, should he play this move, should he play that move and we've never seen chess be so lively in India, it is amazing. I love it. And it's way past midnight. Everyone's up watching all the action. This is blowing up in India. Chess wins today, Kaya. Oh, absolutely. I love that, Tanya. And hey, to all our viewers in India, we feel you guys cheering so much for Pragnananda. He is definitely in contention to win the tournament with a great performance in the first game against Magnus. And in the second, he's going to have the white pieces. And we know it's with the white pieces that Prag wins a lot of his games. And we actually have some opening stats for Pragnananda. The most common opening with White this season on the tour has been the Queen's Gambit declined, but he's actually on an 88% score when he plays the Slav. So what should we expect in this game, David? Prague is going to open with his Queen's Pawn. Both of those openings, the Queen's Gambit and the Slav, arise from, one play, uh, from White playing 1d4, so it looks like that is his big, big strength. Magnus has to avoid the Slav if he wants uh, to get out of this next game of life. Yeah. This is uh, the arena. The other three matches have started their game twos. We are waiting for Magnus and Prague to arrive for the second game. Magnus now with the black pieces. He's going to hope for a Grunfeld. 83% score with uh, the black pieces. Yeah, and interestingly enough, Magnus played the Grunfeld in the last game, but with the white pieces with yeah. colors reversed. Pretty much an identical opening. and. He can play the Grunfeld, but Prague is known as a Grunfeld slayer. So uh, very, very difficult here. Magnus could play his highest scoring opening, but maybe not against this opponent. But Yovanka, Prague in Miami together with his coach Ramesh, will he be aware of these stats? Will he avoid, for example, playing the Grunfeld? Yeah, most definitely. Ramesh is one of the world's best coaches and he will be very aware of what is Magnus's strengths and what his weaknesses. And they will be steering the game towards Magnus's weaknesses. And also they will be thinking about the match situation and how they can put Magnus under pressure. And here he arrives, Pragnananda, for game two in this match. If he wins in the rapid portion, he will be the winner of the FTX Crypto Cup. He is only 17 years old, but he is battling with the world number one. And he is playing some exceptional chess, this young Indian super prodigy. And he looks so calm as always, as he's getting ready for the second game, waiting for Magnus Carlsen to arrive. And remember everyone, there's spectators meters away from the players. It looks like Prague is 
taking a look at them. And uh, Magnus should arrive shortly. The other matches are in their game twos. And this one should start shortly. Do you think it's uh, part of Magnus's strategy, David, to arrive late? Um, I'm not <laughs> sure. It's a big habit of his. Uh, he tends to do this throughout his entire career, Magnus. I don't think it's against any specific opponents. I don't think he tries to play mind games, Magnus. It's just uh, he likes to keep himself on his toes. He likes to keep people guessing. And I think they should focusing. just start his clock, yeah, shouldn't they? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Because he is holding up everyone. I mean, I know he's the king, but just start his clock. That will make sure he gets there on time. I mean, you would do in a normal, normal tournament, yeah, wouldn't you? Over I mean, the board it, tournament. In an over the board, you just start their clock. You can't wait for one person, so I would just start the clock. That would get him, get him there quickly, you know? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, everyone's waiting to play, so... Uh, it should have started uh, almost three minutes ago, but here, Magnus finally arrives for game two. Walking into the arena, Prague with the white pieces. David expecting the Queen's pawn in the first move. Yep, he's been tending to do this lately, Prague, throughout most of his career, up until he became a grandmaster. Even beyond, he was opening with his King's pawn every time. But he has switched, and he has switched successfully to this move. 1d4, Queen's pawn opening. What will we see Magnus do here? Uh, will we see him go for the Queen's gambit declined, where Prague has had a lot of games? Most likely we are heading in that direction. Black can bring his dark squared bishop out with a check. Magnus has played that as well this tournament, but no, it is the Queen's Gambit declined. And one of the main lines so far. I'm Magnus. kind of hoping for a slav, <laughs> just, just to kind of test the, <laughs> the statistics. But uh, no, instead the bishop has come out. This is actually quite a, it's a solid but dynamic opening. It's called the Rogozin defence. Yeah, Magnus has barely played the Slav actually since 2016, his World Championship match against Karyakin and the kind of ensuing months. Meanwhile, yeah, very topical position. And Prague's teammate in uh, the Olympiad in Chennai, uh, Gukesh, of course, on board one, had a lot of success against the Rogozin. Uh, he got some fantastic positions with White against this traditionally quite solid opening. White's queen stepping back now. This is one of the main moves. And question for Black, how does Black challenge in the centre? White is slightly behind in peace development. White has wasted actually a move with his queen. He came forward with a check. He dropped the queen back later on. Uh, so she's on a good square now, but she has spent a few moves getting there. Yeah. And uh, here, black, I mean, there's several moves. You can move the black rook next to the black king. You can trade off a set of pawns. You can retreat black star square bishop. Variety of moves for Magnus. And I think Prague just wants to get out of this opening. He wants to uh, maybe ask Magnus a few questions along the way, yeah. starting here. Yeah, he chooses a, a safe and solid and reliable variation, actually, with the white pieces. I mean, because there was the possibility early on to kind of really liven up the game. But here, I think this is just a sensible chess. And uh, yeah, white has moved the queen a few times. But then the argument is, well, take a look at the black knight that is sitting on the left. It's in front of its pawns, and this knight will have to relocate itself at some point or other. Yeah, there's a lot of venom, actually. There's a lot of tricks can, uh, can kind of concealed in this opening setup for White. White is also very flexible. So one idea that Gukesh used, um, his Indian colleague there, uh, was to castle the White King on the Queen side, on the other side of the board, at some point, if Black opens the centre in the wrong way. And, uh, yeah, you could... I was going to say, this is also a very trendy move. Black's knight sitting on the edge of the board now. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this was used by Ding in the Candidates Tournament. Uh, it was also uh, featured in the Olympiad. Um, this Black Knight now sitting on the edge, attacking White's pawn, trying to force Prague to make a decision. And uh, the key here is whether White can step forward and gain a bit of space with his pawn structure. Yeah. Magnus Spiling. Uh, sorry, this was an idea by Caruana, no. sorry, against Ding. No, you know, you had it, you had it right. F Ding against uh, Caruana. Yeah, Ding against Caruana. In the candidates. Oh. And uh, there, you're totally right. White stepped forward with a pawn. Mm -hmm. One square. Yeah, and that game was very, very interesting. And uh, if it's good enough for Caruana, it's good enough for Carlson. He follows all the top games, he follows the trends. I'm slightly surprised that Prague is thinking here for almost a minute now because uh, in terms of kind of topicality and how recent those kind of important games were in the candidates tournament he was following that tournament for sure he will have seen this surely he has an idea what do you think simon uh, good idea by magnus to try and surprise his young opponent 
Yeah, I mean, I think often whoever gets first surprise in uh, gets the first strike, and, and it looks like Magnus has got the first surprise in. I, I'm, I'm, I am surprised it's the first surprise, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, because as you mentioned, it, it is something that I, I, I would have thought Prague would be well aware of. He's just clarifying the centre now. This makes some sense, but you're also losing a lot of tension by making this exchange. This is this often heads the position more to equality because you you keep uh, you, you don't have that flexibility with the pawn that you had before. But he's, I think he's just going for simple development. And again, you can't really fault that. Maybe he'll bring his dark square bishop out next. And I'm I'm secretly hoping or hoping that he castles queenside. Mm -hmm. I really want to see the white king go queenside. I don't think it will now. It's too risky. But I, I wanted to see opposite side casting because when that occurs, you often get uh, some of the most interesting attacking positions. The one thing I would say, though, is that Black's knight, Magnus's knight that he's moved, this is his problem piece in this whole variation. He, he's moved it to force or to attempt Prague into exchanging pawns. Um, but that knight is now, it's a, it's a pretty bad square because, um, you know, it, it, you might even get it trapped in some lines. So this is the one, the one issue, really, that Magnus has in this position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so at some point he might well just kind of take a few tempi. It takes a long time, but just kind of trace its path back to maybe a more solid square. And okay, he doesn't want to take the slow, the, the slow approach here, Magnus Carlsen. He goes to challenge white in the center immediately. This feels very ambitious. It could be very good. Black is ahead in development after all. White's king is still stuck in the middle of the board. Um, why not open things up while your opponent's king is there as a sitting duck? Uh, I guess the most critical now would be to capture this pawn. If you leave it to run, for example, if the white king castles, often it's actually quite nice for black to gain a bit of space now. The white bishop's forced back to a more passive square, and later the black pawns will start trying to advance on this left side. So uh, I'm expecting Prague not to think for too long and then just capture this pawn. I would have thought that Magnus would be very happy the way this has gone. Um, one of the issues with this position for white is this dark square bishop. You can get similar similar positions in this opening but with a dark square bishop again you've got to look at your own pieces which are good and bad and that bishop is trapped it's trapped behind white's pawns they're blocking it in meaning it's a bit useless often you get the same position but with a bishop on the other side of the pawns which would be much more favorable because it will it can definitely put more pressure on black's position so my, my first instinct is yeah i think magnus has got a little surprising with his knight jump and i love the activity behind his last move and uh, I, i'm thinking he'll be very happy just indicating also by how long prague is taking on his move here i think magnus will be quite happy with this 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 position so far yeah i mean easy play for black at some point he might bring his bishop out at some point he might just kind of put his rook on a semi-open file easy moves for black less easy moves for white and uh prague deep in thought he's still doing okay objectively but he needs to play a bit more actively over the next few turns yeah i, I feel that this is brewing up really nicely this position uh so many possibilities and somehow both sides have got like the bad pieces and uh whilst this is a critical moment i uh well we are running a quiz of the day where we are asking our viewers to caption this particular picture and uh, the best caption will win one year subscription of chas 24 premium membership and uh, there we see the picture and rahul agarwal says <gasps> When you realise your Uber Eats have crossed 1,500 1, bucks already. <laughs> that is a oh my god moment. Yeah. I wonder what Hans Niemann's Uber Eats bill is on. I'm also now, curious. That was many days ago. I know. And uh, Jens says when you spend hours pre preparing for playing Magnus and he opens with 1A4. <laughs> <laughs> also, it's like. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Pierre says. I hope no one saw that. <laughs> <laughs> or heard that, kind of looks like. It does, yeah. I love those. So keep those captions comment coming. And uh, remember, you can tweet them using the hashtag ChessChams. And remember, the best caption wins one year Chess24 premium membership. Yeah. And after three minutes, Prague makes his move. He does make his move. It's the move we predicted here. You just didn't want to allow black to continue advancing on that left flank. Okay, he does capture that black pawn. Temporarily, Magnus is a pawn down. He's happy to just improve his worst place piece, re-centralize that knight. White's C pawn isn't running anywhere uh, anytime soon, so he will capture it on the next couple of moves. 
Prag, he just needs to castle. I'm sorry, Simon, I don't think it's, it's no, uh, safe I, I enough agree. to castle on the left side anymore. I totally agree. I mean, <laughs> there's too many open lines on the left-hand side, so yeah. I, I agree that White needs to get his king safe. I mean, just stick to the basics. You don't need to do anything outrageously uh, you know, crazy at this point of the game. Not yet. Uh, not yet. No, get castle, develop, you know, and then you can start planning yeah. uh, your next steps, you know. Um, and uh, he's got, you know, I, I, he's, he's moving, he's slowing down a bit, isn't he, Prague? It just mm. indicates he's not entirely happy with this. He normally plays the opening very confidently, very quickly. Um, so again, I, I think wise opening choice for Magnus here. Mm. And uh, with that knight retreat, there's probably a big threat by Magnus of opening up the centre, pushing that D pawn forward. And uh, wow. whoa, Simon! How did he make that move without using his hands? Oh. He's had his arms crossed the whole time. Yeah, right. that trick again. Yeah. <laughs> this is the trick that makes him so strong. I don't yeah. know. Telekinesis. Yeah, that's it. The Jedi mind trick. <laughs> and um, well, with this last move, now now the Black Knight has has some ideas of diving in. And uh, you know, Prag, uh, Prag, I wouldn't have thought he wants to castle now because he'll lose his very nice light square bishop um, and you don't want to lose that piece so he's moving his knight and this is quite a kind of good positionally because he wants to control the square in front of what we call the isolated pawn black's pawn in the middle of the board and i think it was spasky who who actually said it's not the isolated pawn which is the weakness it's the square in front of it oh. so i think it's this square in the middle that prague's trying to get his knight into but I'd, I'd be a little bit scared because I haven't castled yet, right? Yeah. I mean, come on, you've got a castle, Prag. Maybe the knight can jump in. Yeah. What about that for a move? Uh, I was thinking that it. too. He's played it. And uh, here he goes. Will we see a reaction from Prag? Maybe we can get him on the picture because it looks like this wasn't possible. It looks like white is going to gobble up this black bishop, but suddenly after the knight captures the white bishop, this is a fork, the king and queen, a royal fork, both attacked at the same point uh, at the same time. Really weird move. Now you've retreated your knight. The black knight has jumped forward. You can't take this bishop. Your queen is attacked. So one of the black knight is going to take one of the white bishops. If you capture this knight, then also you will regret leaving your king in the center this long. It's a check. You have to move the knight that just did move. You have to retreat it back to where it came from. And a block. Weird, weird stuff. Yeah, I mean, not castling. You know, it's uh, very strange, very strange. He could have just done that first. And now, as you mentioned, he's going to lose one of his bishops. So I don't know how bad that is, yeah. but we know that Magnus is a great believer in the bishop pair. He loves having the two bishops. And long term, um, if especially if he can get rid of his isolated pawn, mm -hmm. uh, that could be quite bad news for Prague in any ensuring ending. Mm -hmm. um, so which bishop would you give up here, I'd, though? I'd give up the light squared one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No questions. So, for example, just step back with yeah. the queen, uh, allow a capture here, and then at least the start square bishop has a nice home uh, on this kind of long diagonal. I might be giving up two <laughs> two bishops, actually, yeah. because the knight can jump forward and... Take this guy. Yeah, take this guy, and, uh, oh, he goes for my recommendation. Not sure now. <laughs> Uh, Magnus instantly <laughs> captures that bishop. He has the bishop pair. We do actually, we predicted well there, guys. Yeah. We predicted the continuation. Make, makes a nice change. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it's about uh, Magnus having the two bishops, white only having one. White's knights are okay, but. Uh, I mean, it's still. Term, a, it's maybe Magnus. Yeah, I mean, it's probably still okay for yeah. white, isn't it? Because white does have this lovely square we mentioned in the middle of the board. Mm -hmm. You know, you can put a piece there and it can never be attacked by a pawn. This is the strength of playing against the isolated pawn. It doesn't have any friends next to it. It's like, what do we call it? Dilly, Dilly no mates? I don't know why Dilly. Is Dilly even a name? <laughs> Did I just make that? Is Dilly actually <laughs> a name? Does anyone know a Dilly, Dilly around one. here? <laughs> Dilly? Does anyone know a Dilly? I don't know a Dilly. No, I don't. But do I love it, Simon. Dilly. I am going to run with it for the rest of my chess career. <laughs> Dilly the D-pawn. <laughs> David the I know, but I didn't oh. want to say Dilly. I didn't want to say David No Mates because that's not true. This is, <laughs> this is Dilly No Mates. Oh, Magnus because, heard your joke, yeah. Simon. Oh. <laughs> the Dilly, Dilly the D pawn. I don't know a Dilly. I'm just Dilly like, feels a bit silly right now. <laughs> oh, lovely, silly Dilly. Oh. <laughs> You're a silly Dilly. <laughs> in, the, in the middle of the board. Oh. And, uh, God, why Remember, did it? it's all oh. about the drama today, you guys. Yeah, it not is. the silly Dilly. Six. Six. Dramatic <laughs> well. Look at the clock times. Dramatic there. Uh, yeah. Five thinking. minutes down on the clock. He's yeah. nervous and Magnus immediately frowns after that last move. Normally when Magnus frowns, his opponent has slipped up. But uh, okay, looks sensible to me. Blocking Dilly. 
in the centre of the board. <laughs> Dilly. I mean, yeah, I think it's. I think that I came up with Dilly. I'm sure it's a dog's name. That's more of a dog's name than a human name. Sorry if there's loads of Dillies out there. I apologise to all Dillies, but I, I'm pretty sure that's a dog's name. It's like you know, like Shep. Billy. I've heard of Tilly as a name. Tilly, Tilly. And yeah, Billy, Tilly. of course. Billy, Billy is normal. And from yeah, now on, Dilly. whenever we have a bad deep one, it's, it's going to be Dilly. Dilly. If Dilly it's, no if it's a good deep one, then it's David. If it's a bad one, <laughs> that's that, I like that. Silly yeah. Dilly. Silly Dilly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, that's we've fair. really gone off a little bit on tangent here, <laughs> as per usual. And um, Magnus I, enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Magnus should be listening to our commentary. I, I don't think it would help his chest much either, to be honest. Uh, I mean, there is the question here. Maybe, maybe Black can throw the Queen. Mm -hmm. all the way into the position. But um, I still think it's pretty balanced here. But actually, uh, look at the bar. It's <laughs> <laughs> got to get it in. It, it, I just realised it actually yeah. has gone somewhat... In is, is, there a, is there a really strong idea here, then, somewhere? I'm trying to search. I don't see it, to be honest. Maybe this is the oh. start of Magnus's idea. So Magnus loves pushing his uh, rook's pawns, especially on the queen side. Uh, it's a noticeable kind of habit of his. But he kind of has enacted a two, three move plan with this last pawn push. He wants to activate Black's light squared bishop, which is still sitting at home, still uh, kind of asleep. He wants to activate it and start attacking the white queen. So, um, <laughs> still laughing there, Magnus. Um, just to show the top players in the world, they always have two to three move plans at a time. He's pushed his pawn forward. First of all, just opening up his rook. Maybe his rook wants to kind of swing across and start attacking, especially if white's king sits on the side of the board. But more importantly, I think his idea is to actually push his pawn and activate his bishop on this diagonal, where it actually has some big targets. Uh, if the bishop lands there, maybe trouble for white. You've got to be really careful where you put your pieces now. So, uh, yeah, interesting multi-purpose kind of flexible. I love that move. Yeah. Yeah. We, we often see that move in, in opening called the Budapest, where uh, if white castles that rook, um, can swing all the way over. And Pratt, has he forgotten how to castle in this game? Because, you know, it is important to castle. And now your, your idea of bringing the bishop out springs to mind, isn't it? Uh, but um, both ideas very tempting here. And Magnus looks really confused. He was frowning yeah. there. I mean, you can defend this bishop that's kind of semi-attacked by White's yeah. rook. And, and now the bishop coming out, it's, it's a killer. I mean, why are you not castling, Prague? I mean, you've you got to castle. Just stick to the basics. I mean, whether it's good or bad, you can't leave your king in the middle in, in a position like this, it's, it's not going to last. So I, 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 I really like this move that Magnus played and he has just gone for the light square bishop coming out, attacking the queen, gaining another tempo. And um, yeah. yeah. Uh... How on earth is Pragnan going to unravel? Can we, can we try and do some repair work for White here? <sighs> uh, <laughs> Maybe he sorry. also has to push his A pawn yeah. up the board. Yeah, and at least here he could block with his knight, but already Prague is on the defence and Magnus looks in charge. I mean, already the queen is coming out, potentially threatening nuts, some nasty checkmating ideas, threatening this pawn. It's hanging by a thread now for Prague. Computer really doesn't like his position. Clock is against him. And maybe it's just that inexperience compared to Magnus. In these must-win situations, just play your normal game. It feels like Prague is trying to be a bit too flashy uh, just by keeping his king in the centre. He's trying to be creative, trying to prioritise other things, but it, the position will become open at some point. Black's pieces are going to improve. And, OK, he solidifies the centre. And I guess he plans to meet this bishop move. Ugh. I was going to say with a queen retreat, it just looks odd, though. Your queen going back where she came from. This is going to be one, two, three, four. The fourth time this queen has moved. No, fifth time this queen has moved, sorry. And it will only be move 18. Wow. Oof. Yeah, it feels wrong. It just feels wrong. Look at the power of this bishop, especially cutting down on this diagonal. Trouble for Prague in this game, too. And remember, a lot is at stake. The winner in the FTX Crypto Cup. Uh, gets a big portion of uh, the hundred thousand dollars worth of bitcoins and there's also that very cool nft trophy up for grabs with uh, the picture of that player who wins the tournament and an exclusive fan edition of that nft trophy will be up for auction for 72 hours after this round uh, of matches finishes. So when we have decided a, a winner for 72 hours, you can bid on an exclusive version of that NFT trophy on uh, chesschamps.io. So be ready for that. Two moves on the board. Is it looking any better for Prague? 
Uh, unfortunately not. It's the two moves we predicted. Black's bishop lining up on this fantastic diagonal. It did hit the white queen, which retreated back to her starting square. Five moves now by that white queen, and she's back home. So, yeah, don't try this, uh, kids. Yeah, don't bring your queen out too early. She mm. might get kicked around. All right, Magnus, he is still with a lot of time on the clock, more than 10 minutes with uh, a big smile on his face, constantly laughing. He must be enjoying this position with the black pieces. It's looking good. Do you think he will win this game? I think he's the favourite. Still a long way to go. Um, you have great pieces as black, but the next step to kind of turn that into something more tangible, uh, into a material advantage or into a bigger attack, still takes work. What mm. do you guys think? Yeah, uh, pra Prague's ready to castle, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, finally. And yeah, if Prague can get castled, then that that does take a lot of danger out of position. So, is there any way? This this is why Magnus has slowed down now. I mean, it's like in a game of chess, you can play a lot of moves very quickly, uh, and you should play a lot of moves quite quickly, especially in this time control and their natural moves. But you only get like three critical moments, um, and this is certainly a critical moment because you could let the advantage go away, and I think it is an advantage at the moment if you let White gets what he wants. So I think he's got to come up with some disruptive moves now. You know, the first thought, try to see if you can bring the queen in, but maybe that doesn't achieve anything. Then you look at other areas. Is there any, any kind of threats that Magnus can create to try and put White off castling? Maybe pushing some pawns. Uh, this seems quite logical, but does it now, Prague? Come on, just castle. You've got to castle at some point. There's nothing else you can do, basically. But You've got to castle here. You can't leave your king there any longer, you know? Yeah, no, he certainly can't. Okay. But can he castle? I mean, are there going to be some trades? Because there's a lot of unpleasant pressure along the light squares. Yeah, okay. it's true. Uh, let's investigate this, Yavanka. Um, so the big question after Black has brought his rook uh, to a more central square is can white castle? And you're talking about trades. So first, I guess you could capture the bishop. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, white's knight is actually pinned along this diagonal, so the white knight cannot recapture. Uh, if you take back with a pawn, I think you might be in big trouble after a bishop capture here. Again, you've got to be careful of this pin, so you have to take back with a central pawn. Oh, I say big trouble. Maybe white's just about surviving. He does indeed castle here. Um, for example, an attack against the white knight could just be defended against. It's hanging by a thread yeah. for white, but maybe it is hanging together. That's the key. He had to castle, though, didn't yeah. he? I mean, he, he for better can't. or worse, his king is safe yeah. at least. Sometimes you just got to go for it, even if you're, you're not that comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, I mean, those exchanges are are very close to being extremely strong for black. But if he doesn't, you know, if he doesn't find something soon, I think white should be okay here. Like, uh, like for instance, now I mean, there's but there's so many captures on the board. For instance, you can actually go bishop takes knight. Mm -hmm. And then the whole idea is that, you know, if you go bishop takes bishop, rook takes rook. Yep. Bada bing, bada boom. That was my idea. Nice. Sopranos, was that? Or I don't that know. A, I am bing, not... a bit of uh, Scarface in Miami, I, you know? I don't know where that came from, Simon. Ooh, nice, I like it. Um, and here, Black would win material, either the knight or bishop, uh, knight or rook, sorry, on this diagonal. Nice um, he has gone for your move, Yovanka. Bishop takes bishop, and that forces oh. a recapture with a pawn. So bad bishop now for white. Yeah, that, that's that's a horrible move to have to play, right, to take with a pawn there because you've just killed your own bishop. Look at White's only bishop. It's just pointing at a brick wall now. And for the rest of the game, that bishop is going to be a bad piece. So uh -oh. this is just the kind of position I think Magnus will enjoy. I missed this capture. Nicely pointed out there, Yvanka. And I think, uh, you know, Black Black has just a nice edge now with the better pieces. As simple as that. Yeah. Uh oh, what will happen for Prague? We're going to take a trip to Miami, where uh, Tanya is following all the action. Do you guys, Tanya, think that Prague is in big trouble in this game? <laughs> Kaya, well, the first game might come to haunt Prague. That was his big moment, his big chance. And we know that against the world champ, when you get these opportunities, you really have to make the most off it. But the thing is, it's just so hard to beat Magnus, regardless of the position there is. You have to win a winning position as well against him. He does everything to make it hard. And the kind of opening he's played, it's been a dream start for him. We've got Grandmaster Alejandro Ramirez joining us to break down this position for us. Ale, this looks like trouble for Prague. Oh, it's absolutely trouble. And you can tell that he spent some time 
white black did, capturing this bishop on d3. And you can see this beautiful dark square bishop. That's why it's a different color than the rest of the pieces, because I just want to highlight how beautiful it is. It controls this diagonal. It means that this knight's going to be awkward for a while. The moment that you castle, this rook is going to land directly on the line of fire. And that means that there's going to be a lot of pressure in the center. Prack thought that he was outmaneuvering Carlsen in a strategical battle, but he must have completely missed this beautiful a5, b6, bishop a6. Slow, but very powerful. This one has been flawless play by Magnus in the opening, but game one, that was a big opportunity there. Magnus has been very shaky in the first rounds of this tournament, and Prague had to pounce on his opportunity. The more that Magnus plays, the better he gets, and I think he's now fired up, and you can see that's trouble for Prague and So we have it, Kaya. Trouble for Prague, and the thing is that when Magnus gets his opportunities, he doesn't let them slip. Yeah, that's true. We rarely see Magnus Carlsen slip up Prague in trouble. It's all about then that beautiful black bishop. Yeah, that beautiful black bishop. Now the beautiful black knight in the middle of the board as well. It's, if you compare and contrast the two bishops, I mean, Simon said white's bishop is terrible, but it only looks terrible because uh, it has this fantastic uh, rival, uh, the black's light square bishop. Opposite color bishops tends to mean drawish tendencies, uh, drawish qualities of the position, but not here. This is just, um, uh, it's just so beautiful. It's just about, again, can Magnus turn that into winning a pawn? Can he turn it into maybe long-term good knight versus bad bishop scenario? He needs to turn it into something, Magnus, because it isn't the type of advantage that will last forever. And, okay, first of all, he activates his queen. Nice and logical. Prague needs to survive. He needs to break out. Does he try and kick away this black knight from the centre of the board? He's just kind of tangled in knots, tangled in webs, and he does try to kick the knight back. I have to say, Magnus, as accurate as ever, I just love that queen move. I mean, it just completely ties down the white uh, rooks and uh, but big okay. question now what do you do with the knight I guess you have to kick, go back mm -hmm. because uh, and I would probably go back to no nope. okay commentators curse as always so yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean this this kind of move reminds me of something Bobby Fischer was quite famous for right giving up a beautiful piece for a bad piece but as David was maybe pointing out, trying to get something very tangible. So Black needs to transfer his positional advantage into a material advantage or something direct. So surely he's got an idea here. Um, I'm just trying to find out what the idea is. Okay. But uh, there, there's obviously pressure against the sea pawn. He's just going to apply more pressure. And maybe the queen can come out to the qu queen side. Yeah. yeah. Can't, I can't, maybe can yeah. even dive in all dive the way in. to the e3 square. That looks good, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, let's show this on the board because Prague is coming under some concrete threats now. First threat to his knight. It's attacked from the bishop. It, the knight can't move. Uh, the bishop is pinning it to the rook behind. And, of course, the black queen teaming up against the piece as well. So you have to defend it. If you defend it like this, as you guys mentioned, this looks like a very scary check. Hitting the king. The king has to run away to the corner. Something feels like it's going to drop now. At the very least, I guess, you can just kind of move your rook across and... Uh, I mean, maybe white can survive, but it's not pretty. Uh, another idea, as you, said, you also mentioned there, Simon, would be to swing the queen this way at some point. For example, if rook, the white rook defends its knight, can you jump to this side of the board, go after this pawn? I don't know. It still feels like it should be, able to, uh, should be holding together for white if he defends correctly. But the question, big question now is um, this knight, which is attacked, do you defend it with this rook by stepping up, blocking any checks, or do you defend it by stepping across? And uh, Prague, with around five minutes now, he needs to defend these threats. And he also needs to cross his fingers and hope that no pawns are dropping off. This is the big weakness, the backward sea pawn. Uh, we call it backward because it can never, ever step forward without being captured. And it feels like somehow Magnus wants to win this guy. It's just how is he going to do so? I don't see a breakthrough, to be honest, if White just defends his knight. I do like your idea of jumping in with a queen and just moving the rook across. I mean, this, this looks very natural because Black's improved every single one of his pieces. If you look at a Black piece, they're all applying pressure to something. So this would be the, you know, OK, I'm not sure what to do, just going to put my piece in. And here, White has to move the knight, so this would be very forcing. And uh, this would be a key position if... Uh, uh, but you can't actually win a pawn here, I've just realised, because of the back, 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 uh, back rank, right? Yeah. yeah. Not quite if, for example, you trade off everything. It looks like you can finally pick off this backward pawn, but if you do capture, of course, you get checkmated on the back rank. Uh, so we are actually heading in this direction. We will 
uh, see the White King park itself in the corner. There was no way you could ever step across and you know, kind of walk into this eternal pin. You had to hide out in the corner of the board. The White King also vulnerable on the back rank. And here, Magnus, can he do something else? I have a feeling, just knowing Magnus, he wants to kind of play a tricky move, like mm -hmm. inserting his queen as far into his opponent's camp as possible. Uh, so now, if, once the White Knight moves, at least he can uh, think about taking this pawn, this loose pawn on A2. He wants to win something, Magnus. Mm -hmm. That it, looks good. I mean, it looks horrendous for White, to be honest, I think. I mean, White's totally tied down, and uh, oh. he did... I mean, maybe he's going to put the Queen in there after the Knight jump. It's mm -hmm. sort of a, a similar idea, and uh, White's pieces are really just suffocating a bit here, and Black's pieces are still ready to jump in. I mean, your Queen move might even be more accurate, right? And we're going to get this variation yeah. now. Yeah. And uh, he's gone oh, for, he's going for the end game. End game. Careful of the back spanker. He does love his end game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Magnus is not going to walk into it. He's not going to yeah. surely uh, get checkmated on his back rank. No, he he sees that and uh, pushes forward with his G pawn. And uh, look how that pawn kind of controls the knight's circuits as well. Yep. White's knight can never jump forward anymore. The white knight, in order to get back in the game, will have to retreat at some point. But it has no safe squares and big threat to win a pawn. Magnus is going to up the pressure. This is one weakness. The isolated pawn on the A2 square, also a weakness. Do you, think, do you think Magnus is also perhaps going to push the A pawn as well, as far as up, up it can go, and then just move the bishop to... <clears throat> if he can. I'm yeah. not sure I would want to fix my pawn on a light square, to be honest, yeah. but, um, I mean, if you could fix this pawn here, then easy target and black will win the game. Yeah, Prague still a lot of defence to be done. He might have survived the worst, but uh, yeah, it's an uphill struggle. He defends the pawn with this rook, but the white rook is now passive. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the only move, actually, with the rook. I mean, you have to kind of grit your teeth and play ugly chess. Uh, hold on. Hold that door. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could try pushing the pawn forwards now. I mean, but you, you might only do that if it's very forcing. I mean, I, I want to try to still win a pawn somehow, so I could do that. But uh, the white knight also has no squares it can move to, because mm -hmm. if it does, then you're going to lose a pawn. So there's, there's many sort of different ways you can try to do this. I mean, would this pawn push allow the white knight to retreat, though? Mm -hmm. You can yeah. push it one square forward. Well, that's what I want to do, yeah, again. But then so, you take the pawn. And I just take the pawn. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the because of the tension between these rooks, maybe white survives. Yeah. Uh, the white knight is defending its rook down here. So. Yeah, right now, it's just about how Magnus can increase the advantage. If it were me, I would be wanting to kind of bring the rook in and go for a second weakness. Maybe Magnus, knowing him, he will preface this by improving the black king. Bunch of choice for the world champion. And, OK, clock time's now around level. So Prague still has chances to save this game. White needs to improve his king in the meantime. Yep. It's on the back foot, though. I mean, this would be a great save if Prague can now save this position. Um, it's, you know, it'd be a great, great result for him because let's just, you know, the tournament standings, if Prague loses this game, the only way he can win the whole competition is by winning the next two games. And that is going to be a really hard thing to achieve. So a uh, key game so far here, a draw would be a, a fantastic result for him. Yeah, and is it that time of day, Yvanka? Predictions? Is Black going to win this game? <laughs> oh, yeah. Percentages. Percentages. <laughs> yeah, you're very good. Stats, uh, stats expert. Our guru, our stats. <laughs> I'd be very interested to hear what stats you've got lined up here, Ivanka. <laughs> so, um, yeah, what date for, uh, for Magnus to win? What, what percentage? Um, um, <laughs> Stop it, guys. <laughs> um, Come on, no pressure. <laughs> you've been 100% correct so far. 100% yeah. so correct. You've got to be the biggest day of Pragnananda's career. I know. So, I, I know. So, Magnus to win. Come on, Magnus percentage. Magnus to win. Uh, oh, what, this, oh, this position. It looks so good. OK. Um, OK. I'm going to go 55 percent. 55? What's wrong? With, you're normally a you're normally a 90 percenter. 55 is. Did you expect that, Dave? No, I, I, I didn't was, expect it to be so low. Yeah. I thought it'd be up there in the 80s or something. At least. So, at least, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. 55. It's just, it's just I've been so confident with my other predictions, and then you know. Things have turned around and I've had to kind of you live start life doubting on yourself. the edge. Yeah, you exactly. Don't doubt yourself. Go for it. But do you <laughs> just have faith in Prague's defensive skills? Maybe that's the reason. No, well, no, I would just base it on no. the fact that, <laughs> that I do... No, I think this position is terrible. I mean, uh, I think that... There's... Probably at least 56. 
<laughs> Push it up a percentage. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll round up to 60. Okay, I'll go up 10%. Oh. 65%. There you go. So do you think Prague has, what, 30% uh, drawing? 35% drawing? Yeah. And 5% winning chance? Yeah, I, I okay. think he's got... Right. Zero. Percent okay, chance. So, there you go. <laughs> well, there's always a. There's always a, I know. There's always like a mouse slip. There's always something going to go wrong. But okay. I like to live life on the edge. You know, I'm going to go for it. So you're going six. Certainty, okay. confidence is okay. key. I, I mean, I think Magnus is big favourite to to win this one. Yeah. I mean, okay, now White's going for a little counter attack. I mean, if you can get that knight in the game. Uh, and that knight is trying to target it's, one of Black's pawns, it's not right? going to get in the game because uh, after this rook steps forward, the Black rook is also going to step forward as well and just keep its eye on. Or hang on, maybe the bishop can come down and attack. Mm. Ooh, so many possibilities. I think Prague just wants to curl up into a ball and defend everything. He wants to put his knight on a passive square. He wants to hope that there's no way through for Black. But uh, yeah, interesting standoff. White's going to have two passive pieces. Black is going to have two active pieces. But I don't see an immediate breakthrough. I don't think exchanging off Black's Bishop for the White Knight is going to win the game. Uh, Black's Bishop is just too good. So what next? Prague looks a bit more confident now than he did as well. Magnus is burning a lot of time trying to find this kind of next step forward. White's Knight is just going to park itself behind the White Rook. And what do you do next? As, as uh, Carlson. OK, here we go. The Black Rook. <laughs> I hang up two different pawns. Ivanka's idea now of the black bishop coming in is it a threat. There we go, the white knight. Poor, poor piece, but... Knight stable. It was Incoming, necessary, yeah. Maybe. Get the knight stable, then, but then you've got to win that, right? Yeah. So, uh, oh, he's going all crafty. Yeah, black that's bishop a, wants to come and attack this white rook. Little, Pick it off a light square. A little wriggler. And um, that's that's a nice idea, actually. I didn't, didn't, didn't see that one, keeping the threats alive. Very clever. Yeah. And uh, we can point out the threat now, Magnus uh, utilising his bishop on this square. Here he's just going to do a zigzag, as Simon mentioned. This is maybe the most natural move. The bishop, kind of with its kind of gaze on these diagonals, traps the white knight. But instead, he found a more direct route. He's going to zigzag uh, forward to attack this rook. And how do you save the pawn? White's rook is stuck defending the pawn in front of it. How do you save it? I I don't see it. Yeah, White's King is just so bad. It's gone up to 61%, that's for sure. No <laughs> doubt about it here. I mean, uh, well, you're going to lose a pawn. I mean, yeah. you, you're a pawn down, but also the bishop is, is really so much better than the knight in, in nearly every position. Um, and that, that's a long-term issue as well as being a pawn down, isn't it? I mean, mm. I, I, maybe... How can you fight? How can you even fight here? Do you just bring your king across and as soon as you get hit, maybe you could try and go active? Uh, black can win this pawn attacking the white knight. The white knight moves. Mm -hmm. The problem is, I guess, black just steps back. Black just says, OK, I've won a pawn. I pocketed that one. I will I will just start marching soon. He does play the king move. That's White's king was just terrible in the corner. Yeah. The problem is, white can continue attacking pawns, but everything's just defended for black. And this two versus one will eventually most likely win the game. Mm -hmm. Well, he has to go for this. I mean, there's just no other option. And um, maybe... The knight can go to a different square, but no, it, it goes to the e2 square. And I think we're, we're going to see the line that we have on the analysis board. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, at least here you've kind of, uh, OK, you're hitting the black rook. At least when it retreats, you've rendered it passive. Uh, the black rook is kind of stuck defending the pawn next to it for a while. Uh, for example, if you step forward, again, the black rook is forced to kind of passively defend these two pawns. So you've activated your pieces with white. Your pieces have not been better than this for the whole game, but you are a pawn down. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Prague, he's just trying to go for practical chances. Maybe he'll just put everything on dark squares, king on a dark square, put this pawn on dark square, this pawn on dark square, and he'll say, OK, at least it's going to be difficult for black to convert. One, one other thing that I saw was that maybe instead of moving the knight to attack the pawn, mm -hmm. uh, maybe the king can just step, step uh, forward okay. with the idea, oh, well, Magnus. Magnus, wow. What's... He doesn't even go back to defend this pawn. He steps his rook back one square. And the computer doesn't like that. Magnus, he's reacting. What is his idea if rook takes pawn right now? I guess it's bishop d1, is it? I mean, he, he wants the rook and pawn ending. Is that, is that right? Or... Does he really? I mean, maybe... well, for example, if white defends, maybe this is winning for black, but with rook end games, it's always less clear, right? Mm -hmm. I would rather have more pieces on the board. Oh, I agree. I agree. I mean, this, is, this seems strange to uh, swap the bishop for, for that knight because... It did seem that knight was not a fantastic piece. I um, think he wants the A pawn. I think if you go to grab that so, uh, 
Yeah, he's we'll going to put out. his rook well, down to the yeah. second. Nope, Simon, you were absolutely right. Yeah. He played so quickly as well. Yeah, I mean... Uh, he seemed I... to react, Magnus. Has he missed something? Have we missed something? Uh, I mean, first of all, what happens if you just defend the knight with your... Uh, if you defend it with the king, I guess there'll be a trade and maybe black doesn't take this pawn. Black goes to the second rank and too many targets here. Uh, Still looks very tricky, doesn't it, for, yeah, very for white tricky. here? I mean, it's, uh, I mean no normally Magnus' decisions are, are spot on uh, when it comes to exchanges. I've noticed this, that he's incredibly clever. Uh, I, I don't know if that's the case here or not, but uh, ge generally the, the rook and pawn ending is going to be very hard to defend uh, for Prague. He's got chances, of course, but yeah. I mean, do you even need... I mean, if the king goes across, you can bring your rook in as well if you, yeah. wanna, if you really want to keep that bishop, but... Um, Still, still tough for white, this. Still very tough. I'm surprised the evaluation bar says it's less than one now uh, in black's favour because it still looks like he'll win a pawn and Prague is going to be on the defensive for the rest of the game. Under one minute now, the young Indian. Oof. I mean, if it wasn't Magnus Carlsen, you would be qu quite confident that you kind of improved your position with white. You have some drawing chances now, but black against the best endgame player in history, not going to be easy. Prague will need all of his fighting... Uh, it's a fighting spirit here. Who do you think is the next best endgame player of all time? So you, you, you said Magnus, yeah, Magnus. best endgame player. And, and who would you who would you put up there with Magnus? We have the move that you predicted here. It's not nothing changed. Um, who have you? It's tricky. It's a, tr it's a tricky question. Is Magnus uh, by Can far the best? Well? I wouldn't say by far, but I mean in this era where everyone is so much better at defending than they used to be just 20, 30 years ago, and he's still the dominant endgame player. I would say Magnus. Yeah. 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 I think it also was a different time then, because I remember in the old books you kind of read all about the Germans, how they used to got mm -hmm. to a certain stage and they'd be like, no, let's stop the game. And uh, then they would crack out, crack open the books and bring their friends around and everyone would work together to find these amazing, incredible endgame resources. Now, you can't oh, do that. What's happening, David? Very strange move there. I mean, yeah. moving the king away from the centre, I mean, that's not a Capablanca move, is it? No, Weird stuff. But he's allowing a check. I mean, I guess he's going to go for Dilly the D pawn, <laughs> silly Dilly, and try to try to round that one up. That's that's the idea, and trying to trying to get into a a, te a drawn position that Prague is pretty confident because this is one. If you swap off the A pawn and the D pawn, then this is a, this is one of the first rook ending positions you should know. But you, you don't have to do that. So. Yeah, look at Magnus. Yeah. He we see his screen there. He was very happy to push his rook's pawn forward. Alice the A-pawn, and he, I mean, he'll do this in any position, opening, middle game, end game. And now White can't keep his A-pawn alive, his equivalent. Prague was banking on the fact that he could win one of Black's two remaining pawns on the left, on the left half of the board, but that left half, maybe Black can just sit and, I mean, there's no threat for White. The Black King can start improving now, and the Black Pawns can move. It just feels odd to go for this willingly when the White King was so well placed in the centre. But I mean, is this one so winning? You know, because after all, white does have a threat of actually sliding the rook over one square to the left, attacking the pawn, and then one pawn will drop. We That's... never said winning, just uh, uh, <laughs> maybe okay. it was easier to okay. defend. Um, I mean, also, black can at some point put his rook on a square that defends both of the two black pawns. So if the black king can centralize, it's not 100% clear. Uh, to me, whether you can win one of those two black pawns. Time getting very short for both players. I mean, uh, worth just keeping an eye on the clock there. They're both getting quite close to having only a minute left, uh, and it looks like that will be the situation. So it's really going to go on in-game instinct uh, mm -hmm. shortly. And I think Prague, Prague, you can sort of sense him when he does this sort of bouncing. Yeah. You know, when he starts bouncing about, you can sense he. I think he feels a bit more confident, yeah. and he gets that. He uses that innate energy, doesn't he, to sort of uh, transform it onto the board. And uh, I expect a lot of these technical positions, what I mean technical positions, if another pair of pawns get exchanged off, that Prague will have drilled so often with his coach Ramesh. I mean, it's the first kind of endings you really train. So he's, he's probably still holding with about... 45%, <laughs> I reckon. <laughs> so your prediction was spot on, Yvanka, as know. always. I don't no? know. And he, he steps back with the rook, and uh, the whole idea is simply to force the rook to capture the pawn, and then he will slide to the middle of the board and attack the pawn. So the D pawn will fall off. Poor Dilly. Poor Dilly. Poor Dilly. Aww. He's always but a good... 
she probably she was always a, a goner. She was, yeah, yeah she, she was. was a good life. She didn't. <laughs> she had a decent time, didn't but, she? Yeah. No. Like forty-four moves. She got a lot yeah, of attention. She did. Yeah. 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 There's, there's like I just kind of want to get back to the board because I'm super excited about one moment. Like here, the black rook can actually slide away from being in front of its own pawn, and how is this position? Because to me, it's super unclear. Yeah, I mean, when, this is like a very standard rook ending. Um, you get this often where you have an extra pass pawn. And the, the basic rule when you've got the extra pass pawn is ideal square for your rook behind the pass pawn. Mm -hmm. Second best square for the rook next to the pass pawn. Worst square for your rook in front of the pass pawn. And here you've got the second best situation, as you pointed out, mm -hmm. Yvanka. It's not the best, but it's, it's pretty good having it next to the pawn and the winning technique is to try and bring the king over, right? You try to yeah. zoom the black king over to help uh, the A pawn and, and push it down the board. And I would not be happy defending this position at all, let alone against the best end game player of all time. Um, I mean, David, do you, do you think this is a technical draw or how would you go about, do you have to create counterplay on the king side maybe for white? I mean, yeah. it's it, it's really hard to, to know what the actual if this is a draw or not. Well, I mean, right. what, I mean, David, you know better than me, I would have thought so. I mean, but you're no. right, Simon. I mean, I've spent dozens of hours, maybe more, just studying these end games where black has, or one side has this extra A pawn. And even after all that, I still don't know uh, exactly, yeah. or still not 100% sure on exactly what is winning. As you guys said, if you have to rook to the side of the pawn, usually you have fantastic chances. I like what Magnus has done, by the way. Um, just this white king maybe was heading towards pawns on this side to create some distraction, counterplay, and he's just said, no, I'm going to kind of force, I'm going to create this uh, kind of force field, this barrier uh, for the white king that it can't break through. And now black is pretty much ready to start going across. You kick the rook away, and when the rook has finally moved, then the black king will start uh, heading towards this pawn to help. So, OK, Prag, meanwhile, defending well as well. Uh, equally well. He's just trying to create this opposition to block off Black's King yeah. from advancing. And um, I mean, normally when you're defending these positions, as far as I'm aware, you should be trying to push your king side pawns in anticipation for Black's King coming to the other side of the board. And then you normally counterattack Black's pawns on that area of the board, which is highlighted. That's the traditional way of trying to trying to defend this because you can't keep the Black King from advancing forever, it will come in. So you need to get that counterplay. And it's often just a race situation. Yeah. I mean, I think it's clear this game is kind of critical. And look at Magnus. Uh, let's go back to the players because he just reacted there. He frowned, he leant back. He's at 20 seconds and uh, he's not happy uh, at all with what's happened. He knows he had a big advantage, but it could have been bigger than this. Huh. And yeah, I think with best play, maybe it is a draw, just because White's King is so active. And he made that with 11 seconds left on the board. Yeah, he blocks up that right side of the board, but White can open it up later. White can also give a check, kicking the Black King back to a worse square. I mean, what a save this will be. I mean, if Prague saves this, it will be tremendous. I mean, like, he's, you know, the young kid is showing great endgame skills and it keeps him in the match. Mm -hmm. You know, he's got White in the next game. He wins that, he can still win the whole tournament. Yeah. So it's a massive game, and, this one. A massive moment, actually, there, Simon, because the king chased away the rook. And uh, now we have two versus three. And to my eyes, this looks like it should be just a draw. But it's maybe not an easy draw because of White's weak pawns. Yeah, and Magnus wants to actually make it a race. Uh, if white gets time to just kind of move the king closer to uh, its pawns and if the white rook gets a chance to defend things, it should just be a draw. Uh, it's just black doesn't have a pass pawn, so Magnus is going to try and create one. I mean, that transition where, I mean, Prague managed to get rid of that black runner, that black passed pawn, uh, OK, in return for one of his own pawns on the other flank, I think that's just maybe the way he, saved the he will save the game. I think it's just... That's why Magnus was kind of shaking his head. Just really clever from Prague. Mm. Fantastic save if he's if he's able to still yeah. hold this one. And that's massive now. for the match as well. If Prague would have lost this game, he would have been in a must-win situation in the two last games. Because remember, if he's going to win the tournament, he has to win in the rapid portion, Prague. He needs to take all three points, a draw here. And it is very much still alive for him. Yeah, and this one should be a draw. It's what you guys mentioned earlier. Um, in terms of when you're attacking, when you have the extra pawns, you want your rook behind to support the pawns. You want your rook maybe from the side. But white's rook is the one that's going behind. Black's H pawn is the only potential winner now. So go behind that pawn, stop it from advancing, and 
not that much can really go wrong. Uh, yeah. You can give a few checks to the Black King if you really want, but at some point you bring your... Yeah, there we go. Prag keeps checking. At some point you will bring that White Rook to the H file, and I don't see any way Magnus is really going to make progress. Yeah, there we go. It goes behind the Rook. Yeah. Really annoying checks incoming. Still some work to be done. Yeah, it's very instructive how Prag just uh, knows these endings. He's not even pausing for thought. He just in the memory bank and uh, giving a check. And I'm just checking the table bases. And yeah, Prag has got the technique. Yeah, it doesn't look too difficult now, to be honest. I mean, you can just continue giving another check with the white rook. You could possibly consider pushing white's pawn forward. I was forward. wondering that. <laughs> it's always nice in these situations to force the draw. And what that means is if you can swap off with this move, yeah. one more pair of pawns, it is even easier to draw. And um, there's a little trick there. <laughs> Got to be a bit careful. <laughs> don't Just take don't... that H-pawn. No, this is the right pawn, and he's done it. I mean, br brilliant play by Prague. I mean, I think he's now got the draw in the bag. And what a save. What a save from such a tough position. Magnus shaking his head. Amazing save. I, I, how many players save positions like that against the world champion? Yeah. Oh, it is a draw. Game two. Prague with phenomenal endgame play. He saves the draw. Look at that. He has the world number one sitting by the computer just mm -hmm. looking at the position. He was supposed to win this game, Magnus Carlsen. It was an endgame. He had the advantage. He looks frustrated. Let's hear if he can get a reaction from Prague. Surprised that you escaped that uh, game there, Prague? Um, no, I'm not surprised, but... Um, yeah, I just kept defending and somehow I managed to escape. Very good job. Yeah, thanks. Incredible. And Magnus still looking. What, what do you make out of this, David? Seeing uh, Magnus frustrated, I guess? Yeah, very frustrated, Magnus. He knows that he had the win in his grasp. There, another shake of the head. He's just trying to pinpoint where he could have won. And actually, we see on his screen, he's flashing back all the way back to the middle game when the queens were still on before he went into the ending, before he traded off all those pieces. And maybe he's just figured out where he could have improved, where he could have uh, gained more advantage than he did. Yeah. But uh, what can you do when your opponent defends so well? Will he give an interview? Let's go to Miami. Magnus, were you a little bit annoyed and trying to look at the position again? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, no, I think he defended well. Uh, I just felt like there should be should have been a way to win. Like when you get such a position from the the opening, you should generally win. Uh, but he, um, I think he did well. Um, I don't think I missed anything like very obvious. But well, so pretty much Prague earning his draw. Yeah, I mean. Well done to him, absolutely. Um, as I said, as long as there wasn't anything obvious, then he didn't make it easy for me. Thank you. Young Prague has the world number one frustrated with two games to go in their decisive match in the FDX Crypto Cup. What a game. It looked like Magnus would win. What happened, David? Yeah, uh, it looked like Magnus would win, but he just ran into some really, really stubborn defense from Pragnananda. And maybe Magnus, if he goes back to analyze the Rook End game, will pinpoint this one moment early in the Rook End game where he had more chances. And here he played the most natural move in the position. Uh, the Black Rook dropped down the board, gave a check to the White King. And when the White King moved, Magnus started pushing his own pawns. But as we saw, eventually this White Pawn was traded for the Black Pawn in the center. And he, Magnus just didn't have enough material left to win. If instead, however, he had gone for a less obvious move, put his rook on the edge of the board, attacking this pawn, maybe he would have had more winning chances. The problem here for white is that you have to go passive. You have to drop your white rook back. And now the black king can just come and activate itself. And uh, here you have a nice formation with your rook protecting both of your pawns. And as long as you can activate your king, you should eventually win. This pawn, this pass pawn, is far more powerful than anything Magnus was able to achieve in the game. But fair play to Prague. He didn't allow any obvious chances. He defended so, so strongly when his, backs were, when his back was against the wall, and he deserved the draw in the end. Yeah. And in six minutes, game three will start Prague on fire with the white pieces. We're going to take a quick commercial break. When we're back, we're going to build up to that third game.
plane to Berlin. Which I sort of expected, but I didn't really know what to do against. Because in reality, very few people do. When we are playing a, an even game against someone of similar strength to us, usually we need to give something in order to obtain the initiative. Just how shrewd and cunning Ali Reza can be, even with uh, very little time. I want to show you a game just to prove that I play these lines that I played against former world number two and a bit of a superstar, Gata Kamsky. So, this is a miss. Russell James is behind the fork. I got ten forks right here, baby. <laughs> a toilet? We're not animals. We go outside <laughs> like humans. Hancock. No king. The people shall have the right to vote. Even the stupid ones. Yes. Ah. Edison, can I be honest with you? It stinks. Nobody's gone to the moon, ever. Why not? It's far, it's too far, it's far. Let me die, put up the music, this. Fuck, I'm not here. I'm not here. I'm Like I was saying, it's FTX. It's a safe and easy way to get into crypto. Yeah, I don't think so. And I'm never wrong about this stuff. Never. You're not the kind of guy who orders double cheese, are you? No, but is that single cheese or is hot? Anymore. Anymore, yeah. <laughs> I figured, I figured. I need a little. Here, Anish, I thought that you were just faking it and you turned out to be an absolutely wonderful pizza chef. No, I was faking it, but now I'm making it. So it's uh, fine. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, I, I have no words. It's just uh, majestic. Squeeze it tight. Okay. Anish Giri and the players have been enjoying Miami. Uh, unfortunately, today, Anish Giri is struggling. He's lost two games against Jan Christoph Duda, who's been on fire the last couple of uh, matches. Uh, and uh, David will now give you the Lisaveta learning point. Sometimes in order to break through, you have to sacrifice, you have to remove your opponent's best defender. And Duda did that successfully in his win against Anish Giri. Anish Giri here did make a blunder, but it's already a difficult position for White. White's king misplaced, White's pieces not really being able to coordinate, and these fantastic pieces for Black just controlling the entire board. So Giri lifted his rook up, and this was the sacrifice, getting rid of White's best defender, removing the light squared bishop, forcing the White King out into the open and with a couple of very precise checks here, taking a pawn, diagonal checks with Queens, always so important. Uh, Duda, sorry, secured the win. The White Queen had to block here. Black's Queen simply grabbed a pawn and when the White King ran away, the other White Bishop fell. Black has a decisive material advantage here, two bishops against a rook and Duda went on to convert that very smoothly. Another great win for young Christoph Duda. Let's take a look at the results. Uh, all matches have now played 
two games in this final day in the FTX Crypto Cup. Levon Aronian and Ali Reza Ruzha, two draws. They are tied with uh, two games to play. Duda, as mentioned, in the lead with uh, only a draw in game three. He will win the match. Going to be must win for Anish Giri. Liam Lem and Hans Niemann winning one game each. A comeback now by Hans Niemann. Chances for him now to get his first points in the tournament. And of course, the big one, Magnus Carlsen and Pragnananda. They are tied. Two draws. Magnificent end game play by Prag in that second game. And he will have the white pieces in the game. Coming up very shortly. First, uh, let's go back to Miami, to Tanya. What's going on, Tanya? Gaia, we've got Levon Aronian joining us. He's heading for his third game against Ali Reza. Lev, really quickly, your thoughts on how the day has been so far? So far defending, so now it's time to get some attack in. <laughs> and it's so nice to see you in a great mood. You were inside having a nice chat with everybody. You're having a good time here as well. Absolutely. You know, enjoying the tournament while it lasts. By the way, your fashion choices, your shirts have their own fan following here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm surprised. Uh, well, since I'm not playing well, I guess uh, some... People have to cheer me up somehow. You're a legend, Lev. And before we let you go in, just finally your thoughts on the Prague uh, Magnus match. Oh, it's quite interesting. I think uh, in the first game, uh, Prague had winning chances in the second Magnus. So it's a, it's a tense match. Very interesting. Thank you so much and all the best for your third game. Thank you. Lev on our onion there. I have to say, Levon Aronian is really matching the Miami vibe with his cool flowery shirt. The action going on inside the Eden Rock Hotel on Miami Beach. All the other matches have started game threes. So we're waiting for the big one. Game three, Magnus Carlsen against Pragmananda. Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces in this one. And he's coming from a game where Prague saved a draw. We could see Magnus Carlsen very frustrated in uh, the interview afterwards. And how, Simon, can Prague take advantage of this? They only had 10 minutes break. How can Prague take advantage of Magnus now being a little frustrated? This is his chance. He's got the white pieces in this game. It could be his last white that he's gonna get. And uh, he's got to push. He's got to push with the white pieces. He's got to put Magnus under some pressure. Magnus is oh has he got the black pieces yeah, oh sorry. Right, sorry it's me i launched that prague had the white pieces yeah i i just remember but okay but he's got it well my fault <laughs> my fault as well i think <laughs> after watching that last game could have should have probably known that yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been, been pushing in both of the games yeah. but it, it's been a long tournament <laughs> so, it, has. it has um but yeah i mean with the next two games i mean he's got to get a win so he's got to get one and a half out of the next two so i guess in this one we're black you know, if I was his coach, it draws an okay result, you know, and the next one then push. All right. They should be arriving uh, very shortly, Prague and Magnus uh, in the last uh, game. Yeah, here we are, Prague arriving as the first player. He had to wait for several minutes for Magnus in uh, that last game. And again, he is arriving first. He's looking very focused. Uh, he's only 17, as we all know, Yvanka. Have you been impressed with Prague's mental capacity so far today a lot of pressure on a young man yeah i mean there's a lot of pressure on him and uh, let's not also also forget that he's actually coming back from two losses and uh, the last one yesterday was particularly devastating and heartbreaking and here he is he's playing as if nothing has happened yeah. before and he's just simply enjoying the game and enjoying the opportunities that have been presented to him mm. and uh, what remarkable defense in the second game because he was put under so much pressure from the world champion and it looks like we might be seeing a repeat no we're not of yeah. uh, game one and there you go it's going to be a Queen's Gambit declined. It's game three. Magnus, let there be no doubt with the white pieces. Yeah, Magnus really, really wants to win this one because he's playing his favorite opening, the Catalan against Prague right now. It's really helped Magnus win the title, the World Championship match in uh, 2021 against Jan Nepomniachtchi. He's been playing it religiously ever since in these really kind of critical battles against the top guys in the world. And that shows how much respect Carlsen has for Prague choosing his best opening. Prague, meanwhile, grabbing a pawn here. And I'm expecting Magnus's light squared bishop to develop. The Catalan opening is just characterized by white's light squared bishop on the long diagonal. And even if black is a pawn up, 
Short term, long term, white always has compensation due to control in the centre of the board. And good opening choice here by Magnus. I guess Prague would have predicted this. This is his main opening, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it, it's, it's showing that Magnus has given um, his young opponent a lot of respect. You know, he's not messing about 1A4, 1A3 today. He really, really wants to win this match and uh, win the whole title. Um, and, yeah, I mean, he, he, like you said, he's prepared this opening intensely for the World Championship match against Nepo. It's probably one of the biggest preparation openings that Magnus has ever worked on. So you, you must expect him to... You know, if he shows his preparation to get something from the opening, but Prague's Prague's also incredibly well prepared. So yeah. interesting opening battle ahead, and this bishop move it, it is a main move. I, I'm again, I'm not too aware of the Catalan uh, ins and outs, but Magnus thinking a little bit now. Yeah, and it's known as a very ambitious move. This last bishop move, uh, we've talked about it in past days, uh, Simon. This light square bishop for white uh, for black, sorry, is the problem piece. That bishop needs to get out of its pawn chain and. I'm surprised Magnus doesn't go for the most con uh, kind of critical continuation. He brings his queen out to a very decent square, but uh, White could have hunted down the bishop pair if he had, if he uh, was so inclined. Okay, instead White just wants to regain his pawn, Magnus, and he's looking off. Am I wrong there? He's looking off to the left side. He was a moment ago. That normally tends to indicate that players are just trying to recall what they've studied before. And, uh, OK, Magnus taking a pawn back. It's level material. White still has a fantastic light square bishop, and it's up to Prague to combat against mm. that. I was hoping Magnus would have jumped into the centre with his knight. Normally, in those types of positions, we see just chaos, fighting chess, uh, both sides attacking each other. But this one is slightly quieter. Now it's Prague who sacrificed a pawn in order to get his bishop to a better square. I, I just feel Magnus's last few moves show that he wants to play it a bit safer in this game. Yeah, no okay. more chaos. And uh, you're right, David. I mean, I see so many draws in the database here, and it seems to be also a grandmaster favourite. Ding Loren has played this particular variation twice with the white pieces. Uh, he did lose to Alexander Grishuk, but he did hold the draw against Livon Aronian. And it's just like the who's who of chess. <laughs> Playing for both white and black. We have Gary Kasparov, we have Viktor Korchnoi, we have uh, Peter Leko. And uh, Bu Zhangji, I mean, it's so many players, so popular at the elite level. So this is all being worked out before. Yeah, and uh, look at Prague now. He's just closing his eyes, just uh, not meditating. He's more trying to recall what he studied before. This does have very solid, very good reputation for black. Um, this kind of defense against the Catalan opening. So maybe he's just trying to remember what the most accurate uh, kind of follow up is black needs to regain his pawn, the white pawn that's just moved on the c5 square. And if he regains it and keeps the rest of his position healthy, he won't be in too much trouble. The pawn mm. structure will just be symmetrical. All right. So, uh, over the course of this uh, 2022 season, we've gotten to know Ty Pru Zimmerman. He's doing all the stats for the Meltwater Champions Chess Tour. He's one of those great guys that knows every single formula in Microsoft for the Excel or Google Sheets. And he has done stats now for uh, the chances Prague now has to win to the FTX Crypto Cup. And he says that just based on ratings and my game prediction formulas, my rough odds for different results for the last two games is 19% chance for Prague to win this game, 24% chance for Prague to win the last game, game four, which translates to roughly a 21% chance for Prague to win the Rapid which means he will win the tournament. So 21%. I don't know if that's high or low, but it is a chance. Yeah, but Kaya, what about our real expert? I mean, that's okay, true. I that's mean, true. <laughs> this guy might have some degree in <laughs> stats, but he's nowhere near the level of Ivanka. Now over to our the real star, Never Ivanka. Never a woman's gut feeling when it comes to the stats and percentages as well. Yeah. So what is, what is, you know, Real expert, what can we expect <laughs> from the next two games? Higher than 21% or, or you're, lower? You're making me blush. Uh, Just, I think it's higher. Yeah. yeah. Always good, higher good. than 21%. I mean, yeah. it's so low. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. In the last game, both Simon and myself thought Magnus was going to go, uh, go and win. Just 80, 90%. You were like, oh, 50, uh, 55. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Again. then it was a draw. Oh, no. <laughs> How did you do it? Yeah, like, your banker foresees the future. Yeah. It, 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 it's, uh, yeah, yeah. It's definitely the stats expert on the team. So we need to hear from you, Erica. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> what percent do you give Prague to win yeah. in the rapid portion? I, I, I feel like you can trust my stats, like you can trust that octopus that was predicting the World Cup. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we should have done that, by the way. Add some animal. Yeah, yeah, actually, that would be a good thing. Oh, that's true. Yeah, you know, we have a lot of good viewers at home. Yeah. I'm sure that they could also come up with some good predictions. Yeah, with if you have an animal at home. Make a bowl of food with uh, Prague's name on one, Magnus game on one, and name on one, and uh, whatever bowl the animal eats from. Well, yeah. That will be the winner of the exactly. FTX we Prague can Prague. kind of compile as well their stats. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and there you go, Kaya. We'll know. We'll know. <laughs> exactly. Beforehand. It will be fate. Yeah. And um, I like it. Meanwhile, I'm trying to think um, if we talk about classical ratings. Um, I know we have tour ratings here, but Magnus, he's around, he's over 2850. Pragnananda, he's closing in on 2700. I think Magnus there would be expected to win around 65% of the time. So Prag, his chances would be 35%. But if we kind of assume this, let's say for argument's sake, this game is a draw, Prag in the final game has the white pieces. If according to classical ratings, at least he would have 35% in a one-off shootout, if it's just the final game and he has white, yeah, it's decent chances, right? Uh -huh. it's, he's definitely not out of it, as long as he doesn't lose this game, Prague. So this is a key game. And uh, some critical moments ahead. White's queen that was under fire has taken a step back, but the whole way back, uh, I guess maybe the only safe square for now where she won't get harassed by some pieces. This is very similar to what Prague did in the last game, just dancing around with the queen quite a lot uh, early doors. And he did regret it, Prague. He lost a lot of time. Magnus committed this mistake. Uh, yesterday against Duda and uh, lived to regret that. Oh, sorry, two days ago against Duda and lived to regret that. Yeah, I, yeah I, I, I'm not so sure. I guess it's worth pointing out as well that this is the first chance in the whole of the competition that Magnus has to win the event outright. Mm -hmm. You know, if he wins this game, um, Prague can only draw the match and he, he comes first. So if he wins this game, he takes first prize. So this is this is an opportunity. And he'd be well aware of that as well with the white pieces. So it is a very big game. Any other result, the, the tournament continues. So, yeah. Absolutely. Big. And uh, Jan Christoph Duda and Anish Giri, well, they can now sit down and enjoy <laughs> the drama in this match because their match is now finished. Duda winning the first two games and a draw here in game three means Duda takes all three points. And let's hear from the winner in this match. A clean conversion on your first try this time, Duda. How would you summarize your Miami adventure? Yes, I, uh, I think I was in pretty bad shape. So actually, it's pretty nice that um, I managed you know, to win almost against anyone um, in, in such a state of mind. Uh, of course, I'm, um, I think I could have uh, gotten more points for sure. But on the other hand, I mean, when you win three last matches there, um, it's, it's, always, it's always nicer, of course. Do you like this format? Yes, I do. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's now going to be the next major being played in San Francisco. Uh, is this something that you are really hoping to qualify for and to play in and uh, to try to almost defend your first major title that came earlier this year? In San Francisco? Yes. Um, yes, of course, it would be nice to qualify there. Um, yeah, you know, I'm happy you know, to play chess. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, if it's if I play in America or, I mean, on Antarctica. I mean, it's really, really the same for me. So, uh, of course, it's very, very cool that um, these tournaments, uh, these tournaments are organized in nice places. But um, yeah, still a long way to, to qualify there. Thank you. Yes. You know, it's uh, crazy because before, before game two, I was uh, locked out of my room, yeah? And maybe I would have repeated that line that you played. Maybe. I had it open. Maybe. Not sure, but maybe. Because there was a line should be for King of One. Yeah. And uh, what you did also. Then I have to castle. But actually, I got a decent position, I thought. Yes, because I thought I could castle, actually. Yeah, yeah. Queen, yeah queen, yes, and yes, yes. I also, yes. I saw this, and that's why I thought that made make sense. Maybe that's my file, yeah, but yeah, I guess yeah. it wasn't. But. Um, after g5, I should be just maybe queen f3, g4, queen e4. Yeah, I was yeah. too ambitious, and then I realized I just cannot get my rook in. I was yeah. trying, you know, okay, I shouldn't go h5 because you get rook h5, but I should go like g3. But I was thinking like king g1, rook h2, rook g2, king h2. Like I was trying to yeah. how to get the rook, you know, but I cannot. And you go h5, rook h6, rook f6. I thought this. Yeah. Didn't like my position. 
Yeah, it was very difficult to find a mod for you, actually. Yeah, I mean, that I mean also, process, yeah, so. and after the Rook G8, Rook G5, just Rook A5, it's just overall, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it was uh, unfortunate. Oh, I was pretty annoyed that you didn't play Queen H7, Queen D1. I, mean, was, like, I saw this, of course, yeah. yeah. I thought you played Queen H7, and I was like, Queen D1? I couldn't believe it, you know? I thought yeah. that I couldn't believe it, I just made it, yeah. It was very pretty, it's true. Yes. No, I saw this. Yeah, first game I had some miracle draw. Did you see some? Life. Of the chess players. We're going to interrupt uh, Duda and Anish Giri there. I did not understand a lot of that uh, notation talk, but uh, both of them seem to be in a good mood. Duda winning the match. It's uh, been a tough tournament for Anish uh, Giri. He uh, ends up on uh, seven points in the tournament. Uh, losing today's match against Duda, who's uh, been on fire, winning the three last matches. But he did have a slow start, so he's not in contention to win the tournament. Oh. We do have a move on the board. Uh, Magnus thinking for a long time there. Yeah, and maybe a mistake. Long think, wrong think is the cliche. Magnus had a long think, and maybe this last move... I mean, it makes sense. You're attacking the Black Queen with your bishop. But what happens if the bishop is just attacked? What happens if a Black Pawn just kicks you away? What happens if the queen moves? The black queen has a bunch of squares she can choose from. She can even come out to the side and give a check. It's a bit mysterious to me, to be honest. I'm not sure what Magnus's idea is there behind this last bishop move. I don't think it's as bad as the evaluation bar says, uh, but Prague will be able to regain his pawn, most likely, and he'll have a healthy position. Yeah, I, I agree with you there, David. I think the evaluation bar is uh, quite ambitious on black's behalf. But, uh, yeah, I think you just move the queen. I don't think you need to initiate a set of trades. Although this is a, a, when you kind of cons consult the chess principles, it does say, you know, you should perhaps trade off bishops because white's bishop has uh, taken two moves to get to the g5 square, whereas black will only have used one mm -hmm. move. Yeah, for example, if the bishops do get traded off, if black wins this pawn back, he's just in great shape. Uh, for example, if we see white's king castle, black's knight come out and take, black has two fantastic pieces in the centre, no real weaknesses, black will castle. It's probably around level. Um, the reason I think this isn't what the computer wants uh, black to do is because the computer gives black an advantage, so maybe there's something even better than this. And uh, that would make me think that either it's the pawn stepping forward, kicking this bishop, or the move that Prague has just played. He does give a check with the queen, hitting the king. Magnus's idea, most likely, is to just develop the white knight, putting the knight on a good square, blocking the check. And when a pawn is captured back, white will just castle. And some threats against this black bishop in the middle of the board. I'm not sure whether black wants to allow that capture, allow that trade, and if he doesn't, then he will still need one more move to castle. It is heating up, actually. And we do see the bar back in white's favour. And uh, interesting position, looks pretty balanced on the face of things, but there will be tactics just like we saw in the previous two games where things suddenly turned and there were all these kind of hidden ideas under the surface. Yeah, what do you guys think? Still in the balance, still Prague with 21% chance today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's just not enough. I mean, Yvanka knows, so, you know, you know the odds, Yvanka. I'm with you on this one. And um, I mean, this, this position just seems very rich. Uh, I think at the moment, all the pieces on the board. Magnus going for an exchange of queens here, which uh, um, makes some sense. I mean, but I, I, I thought developing a piece made more sense, to be honest. Uh, I guess he's just happy to, to get the queens off the board and, and, and play that position. Um, it looks like it often is, might come down to Black's bishop in the middle of the board. If you see that bishop, it is quite strong at the moment this light square bishop right in the middle of the board. But if white can either capture it with a knight at some point or kick it away, then I think white will have a very comfortable advantage. That's, you know, just briefly looking at a situation what I think uh, could be important. Is black's bishop in the middle strong or weak? Black is also a couple of moves from castling as well, right? So mm -hmm. it's, sure. yeah, I, I kind of prefer Magnus's position, no, no matter what the computer says. Yeah. Uh, it, so I don't know why the computer is... Um, well, I'm saying that Prague's doing doing fine here, but who knows? Yeah. I mean, he's probably doing fine, but yeah. not much more than fine, right? Yeah. I mean, if black sure. is accurate, the queens come off, it's just level yeah. and very balanced. It's hard to imagine black ever having the advantage right now. Just so symmetrical, the pawn structure. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I, um, yeah sorry, you've Yeah, sorry, I was just going to say, and black doesn't really have any bad pieces. So I do think my radar is saying, 
bang on, 50%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, quite, quite. I mean, I'm, I, I am worried about this bishop in the middle. I mean, let's say you do exchange queens, right? I mean, I don't know if we get a chance to look at this, but, yeah. I mean, potentially, if you do exchange queens, which is not, you know, the knight comes out and, I mean, look at this bishop. You don't want to allow that one to be exchanged. And if it does drop back, mm -hmm. may, maybe white can move his knight mm -hmm. um, and go for some tactical ideas, mm -hmm. potentially. Uh, I mean, it might be all right for black, this, but yeah. you, you, it looks a little bit scary. The knight this. coming in, maybe. Yeah, you could even throw that in last move if you want to be wow. really flash. But <laughs> really I don't. Flashy Simon. <laughs> I know, but. Threatening a nasty checkmate. Oh, no, I've, right. le I've left my rook on pre. Oh, no. <laughs> so, oh, I you can take your rook. Yeah. And yeah. then, whoops, checkmate. Yep. Um, so there will be tactics in the endgame, um, even if the queens come off, and Prague decides, okay, he's not going to capture it on white's terms if we go back to the current position. Um, yeah, he's afraid of this bishop actually coming under fire, isn't he, Simon? Okay, so he dropped yeah. it back first. And uh, I guess if black gets time, you want to kind of kick away white's bishop from your half of the board. You want to somehow develop this piece, but you can't until the queens come off because white's queen is tying you down to this square. And um, yeah, I mean, if the queens disappear and, for example, now if white makes a slow move, um, let's say pushes a pawn, then if a queen trade happens, a bishop trade happens, I think we'll see a draw. I just think uh, Prague here, black is too solid. OK. Very interesting. It's tense. This is game three in uh, their match. Uh, Magnus moves his uh, H-pawn. Any surprises here? Nope. The Black Knight will just happily retreat back to a safe square. Mm. Still very balanced. Yeah. We did see Prague with great endgame skills have Magnus Carlsen frustrated after game two. Let's go to Miami. Tanya, who do you think now will win the FDX Crypto Cup? It's so hard to say with the way the two are playing back and forth. The first game, Prague misses. The second game, Magnus had his chance. What we do know is that this is a big fight, and that's exactly how we like it. But I think the more the match continues, the advantage shifts towards Magnus because he just needs to actually draw the tiebreaks, go into a playoff to win it. So Prague needs to score in the next two games. Now, while it's pretty intense and the action's hard inside, uh, Miami's having a lot of fun outside the playing hall. So let's catch up with some of our spectators here. And Sasha, Sasha, you're having fun here? Yep, I'm having a ton of fun. Thanks. Are you, are you watching the match? Because I see you playing a lot of blitz around here. Um, I'm doing both. <laughs> I'm trying to. And oh, is it inspiring to see these guys play inside? Uh, for sure. I've been watching them every start since I've started playing chess. Now you told me you're a big Magnus fan. Uh, yeah, I am. But yeah, I am. <laughs> all <right. laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, all the best for your game. Now we we've also got Jan Shristov Duda and Jan Ludwig Hammer with us, guys. Check this out. <laughs> I'll ask you first. Do you get that a lot? Uh, apparently so, yes. Since Ever since arriving, yes, everyone saw. Hi, Jan Shishtov, nice to see you. Like, are you family, friends? I'm like, okay, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just here to have some fun. And I am. It's a lot of fun. Uh, great games, you know, here outside in the mix area. Great games playing as well. So hopefully Prague, you know, goes to the fourth game, has some chances, and see some more exciting games coming up as well. So cheering for Prague. You're cheering for Prague. What, what do you like about Prague's style of play? Uh, just, you know, controlled aggression. Very calm, very nice, you know, just, I like everything about him. Well done. It's actually pretty amazing that he's all of 17 and the kind of control he has over his nerves. Now, Shristov, you have come all the way from Belgium for this event. Yeah, correct, yeah. Um, I, had a play, I played a lot of chess as a kid and I took like a break for 15 years. I'm back into chess since a few months enjoying it and have some time off now. So I thought, why not make a holiday to Miami, combine it with the chess. It's like a crazy trip, but it's, it's super nice to be here and I'm enjoying it a lot. Wow, it's amazing to have you guys here. Enjoy the rest of the evening. There you see Miami having fun on the weekend with lots of chess. Absolutely, and that really is a Jon Ludwig Hammer <laughs> lookalike. And I could also see the young Christoph uh, Duda. Wow, interesting. Jon Ludwig Hammer, he is the main commentator on Norwegian television right now for TV2. They are definitely following this action, hoping Magnus Carlsen will win it, whilst the whole of India is rooting for Pragnananda. The bar is slightly over to Magnus' side, but only 16 moves so far in this game. A little bit of a slower game, it feels like. Yeah, definitely a slower game. I think the nerves are starting to kick in for both these players. Magnus, of course, would love to win this game, would love to kind of clinch the tournament immediately. But 
it's not maybe the type of position where he can get too excited yet. Um, spending a lot of time, Magnus, as well. He took a safer choice in the opening. Thus, we see all the trades that are about to happen. One set of knights have just left the board. Queens are about to leave the board. Light squared bishops are about to leave the board. The computer thinks white's doing pretty well, but and it's the type that could just disappear in one move. Yeah. Uh, I agree there, David. Uh, it's so, so small advantage for Magnus. And, uh, well, we do have a caption com competition yeah. for today where we are asking you at home to caption this picture. The best caption wins a one-year subscri subscription of Chess24 Premium Membership. And, uh, well, Masiek Nwodowdomski says, oh, no! Giri will tweet about it, won't he? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Yeet Capital says, when you accidentally open with a bond cloud against Magnus. Ooh, accidentally. Yeah, I have actually done that. Ooh. I was actually wanting to put my bishop on that square. And before <laughs> I knew it, I put the king and I was like, no way. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so keep those funny suggestions coming. Remember to use the hashtag chess champs and uh, the funniest ones, we'll read them out on the show. Yep. Good job, you guys. It's a lot of fun to read your captions and uh, Pragnananda. This is not the reaction he hopes to have today. This was actually after a big blunder yesterday to lose his match. He's going to hope to have that hand in the air celebrating his win in the FTX Crypto Cup. A draw here in this game will give him OK chances. He will have to win the last game with the white pieces. Yeah, the good thing for Prague is that now, yesterday, and that blunder, that horror kind of self-mate, it's all forgotten. Those, the two games today, the two games we've had so far, I think they were just a great way to banish all those demons. He survived them. The score is 1-1. He couldn't have hoped for more. He will have white in the last game. He just needs to survive now. And he's thinking, down to around six and a half minutes. There's a few questions to answer. How do you kind of trade off on your terms as black. You don't want to allow white to gain too much time while you make these exchanges. White's rook coming to the center of the board. I quite like that one for Magnus, hinting that there might be some checkmating ideas if white's rook can get to the top of the board at some point. Uh, so just some stuff to cover uh, for Prague. Some small tricks here and there maybe, but what would you guys suggest here? What would you be looking at first in the position if you were, uh, if you were Prague right now? I think it is about exchanging pieces at the moment, right? As you mentioned, the, the, you're, you, I think you're trying to equalise as black. I think that's clear because white has castled and Prague clearly doesn't like castling today. He likes leaving his king in the middle. Um, so he goes for this first exchange. This is very logical. And uh, the pawn structure is symmetrical, so there's no pawn weaknesses on either side. So if Prague can just uh, exchange off a number of pieces, then he will get a quality and it will probably be a draw, meaning he's got a chance to win with white in the last round. But he's quite a long way from exchanging off all the pieces yeah. and he is behind in development and you can see white's undeveloped knight jumping quite dangerously into play at some point and it just seems a little bit dangerous for, for black this position to me. And, uh, I have to admit, I don't really understand these Catalan positions as much as I'd like to, because I'm never really sure how you go about these exchanges. So it's certainly trickier for Black to play, though. White can just play natural moves. How does Prague go about exchanging off these dangerous pieces? And I think that's what he needs to be doing, or even kicking them away. You know, if you kick the bishop away, it can come back and force the queen to exchange. And ah, okay. it's, uh, I, I guess, maybe. Yeah, um, you're right. Uh, something like Which this. you use, but... So it just seems a little bit tricky for Prague at the moment to get that equality. Um, and I think equality, a draw, would be very happy with it yeah, at the moment. Definitely. I mean, is it possible for Prague to start, somehow initiate trades now? Or, you know, maybe try to waste some time and, you know, ask, put the bishop on e7? Yeah, so, for example, now? Uh, no, uh, uh, it was just... Immediately. Immediately, yeah, with the idea that once bishop takes bishop happens, then you can actually now swap off swap queens. queens. Yeah, and, I mean, if you can get this where it's just completely symmetrical, Black's King's actually better than the White King in the centre of the board, um, then it's just an easy draw. You just bring your rooks to the centre, swap off all the rooks, and you can shake hands. Um, or the virtual version of that, the eSports <laughs> version, uh, at least. And Yvanka, yeah, bring the bishop to this square. Uh, makes some sense. I'm trying to think what else White could try here. Uh, could you try swapping the Queens now and then bringing the White Knight out? But again, I guess Black is ready to castle at some point. And, um, Doesn't look like too many problems Yeah. Here. Uh, uh, that, that's 
was my thought. But there's still always that, that annoying night move that Simon alludes to, you know, jumps in that you've got highlighted on the board. So Black isn't out of the woods yet. It's like that iceberg again that Simon talked about. Yeah. Like It looks all quiet on the surface, but underneath there's a lot of problems waiting in store for you. Yeah. I was wondering if you could do it the other way around, for example, OK, he gives a check first. I was thinking swap the queens and then maybe move the bishop, but he gives a check. He's really begging for this queen exchange. He's saying to Magnus, please, please, please swap off the queens. And uh, if it happens right now, if Magnus answers the check by capturing, then at least now, I guess, black is very happy uh, and very safe to trade off the bishops. Shouldn't be too much to worry about. It's just no weaknesses, simply. So this should be fine. It's just about whether you can exchange if Magnus, for example, runs out of this check by moving his king or just by blocking. Uh, maybe you move the king, I'm not sure. Uh, or maybe you just block with a pawn. They both look fine. And again, when do you trade and when do you not? It's a big question, right? Yeah, I mean, the knight's on pre now as well. Um, so, uh, and if you do trade, it's like, you know, white does have a nice development advantage. I mean, if you don't trade, you might have to move a pawn. You know, it's, it's, it's just a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah, he so, does. So, actually. yeah. So can he get equalised here? This is the big question. Can he exchange off that last bishop and or get his king safe? If he can, draw. Yeah. But he's not there yet. I mean, Black really has to be super careful because I just wanted to highlight a checkmate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And uh, okay, it won't happen. But it's just I'm just throwing it for showing it for thrills and spills. So just say Black develops the bishop, you know, out to c5, and uh, the white knight jumps forward and then the rook just comes in and uh, defends the square and it looks like, yay, everything is good. Now, it's, it might, still might be okay, but just wanted to show the knight could jump to the c7 and you couldn't take it because the rook comes to d8. And uh, that would be unfortunate. That's actually how Beth Harmon won, of, won one of her games. Oh, really? The Queen's Gambit. <laughs> the Queen's Gambit. Really? No wonder yeah. she became world champion <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with that kind of defence going on. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> There's some danger still for the Black King yeah. if he's not accurate. Yeah. So, fame is this one's the opera mate, isn't That's it? That's right. Because yeah. it was famously played by Morphe mm -hmm. against two geezers at the opera. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know their names. The Count of Brunswick was one of them. That's the one, the Count of Brunswick Opera game. So, yes. Uh, the bar yeah. is uh, jumping up for Magnus Carlsen. Yeah, I mean, this is an understandable move by Prague, but it looks so slow. He stopped the white knight from jumping forward to that square that uh, kind of it used in that variation Yvanka mentioned. But the knight's got another way as well, hasn't yeah. it, now? Because the roots in. Every, every pawn move makes a, makes a hole in your position and uh, this last pawn move, the first thing my eyes are drawn to is the square next to it because uh, that that wasn't, Could that was defended square. but it's not. So maybe I can try to get my knight uh, around into that square. That's the first thing. Maybe there's other options as well, but you know, it's, uh, it's, it's still a couple of moves away from being okay for Prague. Yeah, definitely. The Black King's still stuck in the middle. Normally that's okay in an end game, but there are enough pieces right now to make that Black King feel uncomfortable. Hmm. All right, it's uh, a lot of uh, drama inside the, the arena today, but uh, there's also some funny moments. And of course, uh, Hans Niemann is the man behind uh, the funny moment, currently playing his match and uh, game three against Liam Le, but he really had to go to the toilet. So he was allowed to run out of the arena to do what he needed to do. And he's back now. <laughs> Run, forest, run. Yeah. <laughs> Had to be Hans Niemann. That would be a caption <laughs> yeah. for a competition, you know. <laughs> and you've got to go, you've got to go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I did hear once, yeah, OK, maybe I shouldn't mention that story. <laughs> Tell us, Simon. Thanks. Yeah, it's well, just between I, us. Yeah, no one else Nobody is else. listening, are they? Oh, that's good to know. <laughs> no, I mean, very quickly, I know there was a grandmaster who I won't mention the name of, and he, he was trying to get his grand... Well, he wasn't a grandmaster at the time. He's playing a very important game on a stage in a competition, and he needed to get a result, a draw in this game, to get a grandmaster norm, but he really needed to go to the toilet. He was short on time on the stage, so he just got up and turned around and went against the wall. No! <laughs> yeah, Ooh. yeah, that, so that was bad. <laughs> and uh, to everyone's surprise, um, he got his draw, I think, but then, but then he got kicked out of the tournament. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> Sensible. So it is like, yeah, if you need to go, you need to go. But yeah. sometimes you should probably go in the toilet. <laughs> 
the moral, moral, moral of my story. <laughs> I don't know. Just, just remember hearing that I'm story. Learning from you every day, Simon. So, yeah, yeah, it's not as good, is yeah. it? But I, think, <laughs> but I have to say, it's actually um, a very real over-the-board dilemma. Like, especially when you don't have much time, and you know, you're just like, do you risk it? Do you? Anyway, let's like leave this subject behind. Yeah. Let's not yeah. run with it, Yovi. You don't have to go there. <laughs> <laughs> and, Two uh, moves on the board. Yeah, meanwhile, talking of you don't have to go there, White wants to come into the black camp now. He's jumped in with his knight first, and now Magnus, he's going to challenge Black's rook, which wants to trade itself off for White's rook, but he's going to use the white bishop to go and attack it. Uh, just looking on his screen, there we go, we see a trade. And now, how does Black relieve the pressure? White's rook is ready to enter the seventh rank. Look at those two white pieces, they're kind of fixed in, uh, in the heart of Black's position, and it's as you mentioned, Simon, those black pawn moves that he made earlier, Prag, he's just allowed white in. He's allowed Magnus to sneak in. And Prag down to two and a half minutes, Magnus over four minutes. The clock could become a factor. OK, he's trying to use tactics here, Prag, to keep his position stable. So now the white rook cannot really enter safely. If the white rook goes in, it will either get captured or the pieces defending it will be eliminated. Maybe a bishop for knight trade, if Prag can time it correctly, will relieve some pressure. But, yeah, it still feels like it's all about Magnus. It's all about White, and he does love these positions. Catalan expert, but also when there's no risk, when he can kind of manoeuvre around, set two or three move traps here and there, uh, either positional traps or kind of traps to win. Uh, yeah, it's... It just feels so close for, to being something real for White, but maybe Prague has still got it under control, just about. He's played it close, though. Close to the edge here, Prague. Yeah, he's kept that pressure for out, hasn't he, Magnus, uh, as you mentioned, and he's just finding move after move to make things a bit difficult for uh, Prague to uh, to equalise, uh, and Prague hasn't got there yet. I mean, again, it's not the end of the world, because Prague has this equal pawn formation, and when you've got an equal pawn formation, symmetrical, as uh, pretty much, it's, it's all about the pieces, but then we have to look at the pieces, look at Black's Rook, it's still sleeping in the corner. Uh, if you have a castle, you allow White's Rook to come nearly to the top, which is a great square, what we call the seventh rank. And White's minor pieces are, are really annoying, and they've got potential to move now, maybe. I mean, it's just little things that are making this position very difficult for Prague. But we saw, we saw him in the last game. You know, I mean, I think his position in the last game was worse than this. Way worse than this, yeah. <laughs> It was, and he survived. So he's got to do the same again in this one, and then he gets the White pieces. Remember, if Magnus wins this game, he's won... The Miami, Miami, Miami. What's Miami? Miami, I think Miami. it is. And, uh, Miami, and he comes in. He does come in, yeah. and uh, this this move I think is so crafty. I mean, the Black King cannot step forward now, and Magnus's whole idea is that if Black castles, then the Knight will actually step back and start attacking some pawns, and then he will get a favourable version of uh, a rook if if Black decides to trade a rook and bishop versus rook and knight. Yeah, let's just show that, Yovanka, because actually Pragnananda will be having nightmares, who will be having <laughs> flashbacks if this happens. So uh, if the Black King finally does castle, castling will move 25, pretty late, uh, attacking the knight now. Uh, as Yovanka mentioned, the knight will drop back, attacking this pawn, you can trade it off. But uh, a situation like this, rook and bishop uh, against rook and knight, Prag yesterday twice lost against Duda when he had a rook and knight, which he would have now, against the opponent's rook and bishop. So, um, yeah, Prague would not like that assortment of pieces. He will not like that exchange. He doesn't castle. Maybe he just won't in this game. Instead, he pushes a pawn. At least there's an escape route for his king if he needs. But what is he doing here? I mean, I guess his idea after the bishop steps back is not to capture, because then there would be a knight fork check and winning a pawn. Instead, I guess his idea is to actually move his king out the way and just take this knight, although... Some calculation is needed here after a capture and the rook entering the position. Maybe black's just about surviving. If white's rook takes this pawn, then the black knight will move and double attack, hitting this rook, hitting this bishop. It's becoming so complicated. He's holding it together with tactics, Prague, with deep calculation. This is a six-move variation, a five-six-move variation, but he's worked it out. Quickly as well. So quickly. This yeah. is how good he is, Prague, the youngster. And this... I mean, I had to take a while just talking myself through that, but he worked it out in a few seconds. Yeah, and, and again, it's the iceberg thing, isn't it? I mean, this is what great positional players are great at tactics. I mean, this is something uh, we've seen time and time again, and now Magnus is trying to still 
keep hold of some of the holes he has by swapping bishops. But yeah, I, I mean, behind every good positional player is a great tactical player. Yeah. I think it's it's you know you can't just be a good positional player about tactics because to get good positions, to get those positional things you like, you need to use tactics. Mm -hmm. um, and w what do we think of this last move, Bishop? I mean, why not just trade it off and then? I know it's better late than never, but uh, you could castle, or maybe could you just bring the rook this way, try to sneak it in? Like if white enters the seventh rank, maybe you can challenge. If you can swap these rooks off, you'll make the draw. Still some work to be done. Okay, he castles immediately, so he's actually going for something similar to what we just showed. Uh, this is the current position. He finally castles on move 26. <laughs> Better late than never. Well, what move was it last game? Because he, he, he's not, <laughs> he's, he's castling like pretty late, you know. Mm -hmm. Did, didn't someone say to you that you never castle, David? Yeah, Magnus so, said that to me. Wow. <laughs> and uh, we talked about Hammer earlier with this lookalike. I once castled a move 37 against Hammer. That was my nice. castle queenside. And did you win? Yeah. I, the problem is it, casting nice. wasn't even a good move, but I just had to do it because it was so flashy. <laughs> yep. yeah. And he nearly jumped off his chair. He forgot it was possible. <laughs> Meanwhile, um, Magnus, okay, it's Rook and Bishop versus Rook and Knight. Prague lost two games with that yesterday, mm. but now he's attacking this weak pawn. Yeah. I guess the reason Rook and Bishop work better than Rook and Knight is because Rook and Bishop together, they basically do the same job as a queen. And they move in the same way a queen would. Rook and Knight just don't combine as well for some reason. Okay, big threat. Guard this pawn. And when there's pawns on both sides of the board as well, uh, that's, you know, if you think about bishops and endings, when you have pawns on the left and right, queen side and king side, the bishop is generally better because it can basically aim at both sides in one move, right? You can control both sides of the board, but the knight, it can't do that because it takes a long time to get from one side to the other. Therefore, the knight is very good when there's pawns only on one side of the board. That's when it's generally better than the bishop. So it's just worth remembering if you get to an ending about these small things. And there was a very famous ending Bobby Fischer had, bishop versus knight, um, and I can't remember his opponent, but um, we see a pawn sack here, first yeah. of all. Yeah, we see a really uh, surprising pawn sacrifice. White's rook wins a pawn, but Prag dives in now with his rook. So he's hitting the queenside pawns over here, but maybe these can be defended. And uh, this pawn in the middle is at least defended by White's rook. I'm wondering what happens if, for example, the bishop drops back to defend these pawns. If the bishop drops back, the knight will just spring forward. And then the white rook gives a check. Yeah. Uh, the black king can move. It's another check, however. I mean, but... Prag is seeing everything so quickly. But I don't know. I'm scared for him. He's a pawn down. This pawn is attacked. Maybe he can hold it together, but he's really living life on the edge here. Mm. Yeah. Prag. Okay, he yeah. instead brings his king in. Uh, maybe this is the best way of hitting the rook, which has to retreat. I guess his idea at some point is to start launching these pawns forward to make the white bishop feel uncomfortable. I mean, if he holds this, what a defence. Just <laughs> active defending, yeah. not materialistic at all. And uh -huh. he's going for your plan, David. And uh, it's suddenly becoming a slightly awkward for White as well, because you don't really want to be letting go of that contact with the, uh, those pawns on the left. Yeah, these pawns might drop off. Prague, he's opened up the game. It's a three-result game now. Magnus may be having to be careful. Both players... Around the one-minute mark, I'm expecting to Prague to continue pushing some pawns, maybe the black A pawn. Yeah, I mean, again, he's a pawn down just like he was in the last game, but if he defended that, he can defend this, and the computer approves of his sacrifice. It's so mature. I mean, that wouldn't have come across my mind, I've got to admit. Um, maybe if you give me half an hour, but Prague spotted it in a few seconds, and now he's kicking away White's rook. He really wants to try and trap this white bishop with his pawns. White rook's got to be careful where it goes to. But it is a pawn. It is a pawn. And uh, if, if White can just uh, maintain that pawn and unravel his pieces somewhat, then, you know, it, it is a pawn up in the ending. Uh, just a little update. I mean, I, I think we're all kind of rooting for hands to get something out of this tournament, right? Yeah. And it's one and a half all in that match. Like, I think, like yesterday, one game to go. He just, he's just got to avoid losing that last game, hands, and you're going to get some money for your Uber Eats. Can he do it? So just, uh, you know, I think we've got some secret Hans fans yeah. around, you know. Hans so, fans. Hans fans. <laughs> nice. Reminds me of all those rhymes and chants we had yesterday. Yeah. But uh, meanwhile, Magnus is consolidating. That white king has come back and it's kicking the black rook out of his camp. The black rook has to retreat. There was nowhere else safe to go. If it stepped across one square to the left, the white king would have followed it, chased it out. Uh, this is starting to look really bad, isn't it, for black? I mean, it, you know, now 
now that well, that, yeah. that rook has been yeah it's a pawn down that rook has been forced back it's he's starting to get his pieces um working well together uh magnus at the moment which is bad news for Prague. Yeah, I think he just lost a bit of time, Prague. He pushed a pawn, hit the white rook, but he had to lose some time with the black king. If he just continued pushing his pawns on the left side earlier, I didn't really see how Magnus was going to kind of unravel. But now, Ooh. okay, giving a second pawn wow. away, Prague. Yeah, but this is just desperation. You know, the clock is playing a factor, and also his position is just falling apart. Mm -hmm. There is maybe a small trap. Uh, I'm not sure whether it works or not, but if White's rook goes now and grabs the pawn in front of it, then Black will push his b-pawn, trap that White bishop. So Magnus had to keep his rook, the White rook, on the fourth rank. Uh, there we go. It keeps everything defended. Prague wins one pawn back, but still a pawn down. And now the White bishop activates. That White bishop dominates the Black knight. It's going to be uphill struggle for the young Indian. Could we be seeing the decisive game of the... E TX Crypto Cup. And I, I like the way Magnus is playing. Just look at it. Instead of supporting that bishop, he retreats it and just starts over protecting some squares. And look at that bishop as well. It's going to be targeting the G5 pawn. And there's so much danger for Prague. I I so much danger. Yeah, I fully expect White to push a pawn forwards. I mean, a great way to play against knights if you ever get in a situation like this, especially when you've got the bishop versus the knight, is to limit the squares that your opponent's knight can move into. There's only one forward square that knight can move into, and you can cover that square of your pawns. So cover the squares, your opponent's knight, with your pawns. This is just a very typical strategy to improve the position. There might well be better moves. I mean, even bishop takes pawn is a little tactic that could work. But um, a simple move would just be to cover that knight. Uh, and this is just a very safe pawn up now yeah. with... And it's a good pawn as well. It's, it's a, yeah. yeah, shades yeah. of the last game, shades of the previous game where Magnus was a pawn up. There, Prague defended it. But this one is even harder because it's not just a pure rook and pawn end game. It's also this bishop versus knight conundrum. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, imagine Prague losing three games, twice yesterday against Duda, one game today, rook and bishop versus rook and knight. Yep. Something to work on. Definitely something to work on. Hasn't Magnus read the script of today? Yeah. I don't think he's read it. I mean, come on, Magnus. You're supposed to leave it until the last game and let, and let the young kid win, well, Magnus. So well, Maybe is there some chances now? Because uh, Magnus has offered a rook trade and that does change the nature of the game. I mean, I was, wasn't expecting that. I was expecting the rooks to stay on the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was expecting them to stay on the board as well. When you have Rook and Bishop, they work so well together. White's Rook was on a nice square. I liked Simon's move, just kind mm. of lock in that knight. Black's knight wasn't really going anywhere. Spectacular. Now, he's still a pawn up, and it is a pass pawn. White's E pawn could be the, uh, the eventual winner of this game. But some chances of Black creating a fortress on the light squares. Black needs a miracle here. He needs to somehow trade off all of White's pawns, apart from maybe the White A pawn. Uh, the white A pawn, if you look at it on the left corner, it promotes on a light square. Therefore, even if black loses the rest of his army, if white only has that pawn and his bishop, black's king could just hide away and it would be a draw. So there is some kind of long-term dream for Prague to save this one, but 20 seconds, pawn down, difficult endgame, worst minor piece. Yeah, facing the world champion. Yeah, and he has a weak pawn, and I did wonder about this particular move. Just get rid of it. Trade off some pawns. Yeah. And uh, like you say, pin all hope on a light square blockade. I mean, if you could get rid of the the pawns on the on the queen side, draw. Yeah. Uh, but you know, so the, the the one hope I think Prague has is there's not many pawns left, and he's got to try to try somehow to exchange off a couple more pawns. I think, but Magnus has a very clear plan here using his king not just to help his pass pawn go through but to move over to the queen side and try to win another pawn and technically this has to be said is a winning ending for white um five seconds for prague yeah uh, he has to make a move and uh, i thought maybe he could just wait with pawns and okay he waits with a knight he's so calm he's barely yeah. moving look prague he's just kind of got his mouse just side on from him and he went down to three seconds there and wow. just calmly made his move. And I, I feel there might be a Zugzwang coming up mm. here, Bishop B4 for example, there we go, yeah. and Black is in Zugzwang, meaning whatever Black plays here he's going to allow the White King to come forwards. Zugzwang is you have to give something away basically and now 
well, you don't have to do it now, but the, the White King can start coming towards those pawns. Um, you could eat all restrict the knight. He's restricted nice. the knight first. And uh, this is just very bad, isn't it, now? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, this is the strategy you want to adopt, especially if you're facing a knight. The white bishop controls the dark squares, the white pawns control the light squares. Black's knight has nowhere good to go. Dances into the center, but, um, yeah, as Simon said, Zugzwang is going to be the theme of the rest of the game. Um, eventually, we will see a situation where Black's knight and king both stuck. And, OK, he's keeping it together with some knight forks, some dancing knights, uh, knight checks. If the White King starts running towards those black pawns, there will be a nasty double attack with the Black Knight. But it's not going to hold forever. And, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, should be winning now. He's doing the best he can. I mean, you know, don't give up hope yet. I mean, if you're a Prag fan, he, you know, there's not much material, but you are playing the best endgame player in the world and you've got a losing endgame. Oh. It's just tough. He's defended one. Maybe he can defend this one too. Yeah. OK, White's pawn steps forward. I'm slightly surprised by that one, just because it felt nice to keep that one in reserve, not commit that pawn. White's pawn is potentially a weakness now if the White King runs away over where it wants to go. Better They've look at him. Again. He's got yeah. that bishop move. Yeah. The King can't move, so the knight is forced to just concede ground. But this is why I wanted mm. to keep White's pawn back where it started, mm. because now, at least, it's a target for black. Agreed. Now, if the White King runs, the White Pawn in the centre drops, so... This, is give, this, is, this move seems to give him Prague some chances. Yeah. Magnus Shout. And, uh, oh, yeah. Definitely, yeah, I think this, this, he's maybe back in with a shout. Yeah. Um, I mean, if he defends this, it's just like, oh, my words, yeah. incredible. And the other thing that might work in Prague's favour is if you look at the, the Pawn right on the left-hand side of White's, it's queening if you get it up on the light square, and there's some endings because you've got a dark square bishop which uh, um, will also give Black some hope, just a very small technical thing there. But what's happening here now? Is it, can he, can he keep this blockade? Still not going to be easy. White's king does have a path towards those black pawns. Uh, so White's bishop's attacked. I'm expecting it to move, maybe to the square where it's defended by this pawn. There we go. The white bishop and white pawn are kind of just going to keep each other uh, cosy there, comfortable, and White's king is going to try and do the dirty work. It's still not mm, easy. The oh. king is ready to come, isn't it? Uh, Black's king, <sighs> Black's knight, they're just stuck. Yeah. Maybe it's time for Black to push some pawns, and uh, he goes for it. And I'm thinking, if you can push the A pawn two squares and give, mm -hmm. you know, give white a doubled A pawn... He's trying. Yeah. Then maybe there's hope in that endgame that you guys have referenced. OK, he's taken one of white's two remaining pawns, but... Magnus stepping back now. He's going to try and create an eternal Zugzwang. Uh, OK, the Black King can move, though. Can you take that pawn with white? I mean, can you...? Yeah, I mean, the idea is to trap this Black Knight in the stable. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 think, I think you're threatening to go bishop takes pawn. Yeah. I think the King and pawn ending is just winning, isn't it? We have so, to show this. This yeah. is the winning idea. If Black just waits now with his King, bishop takes pawn. If the Knight and bishop get traded, white will win. This pawn will eventually become a Queen. But if you remove this pawn, one more move and black would draw. If he could just bring his knight down and take this pawn, it's a draw. But white can drop his bishop back, lock this knight in its stable. Uh, the bishop controls these squares, the knight is trapped, and simply white's king is going to come back and take it. Game over. It's a very simple plan and he can play it. Oh, no, he hasn't he played hasn't it. He hasn't played it. Didn't go for that. OK, well, he, he's, he's also trying to... He's found another way, I think, oh. to win, and this is to to move his king towards his past pawn and shepherd, shepherd it through. Yeah, so maybe you play it now. Do you take this pawn now with the bishop? Yeah. Uh, maybe that's the winning idea. OK, the king drops back. It's just Zugzwang, unfortunately. You're right, Simon. If the knight moves, this pawn falls. If the king moves, then the white king's going to step forward and start supporting its pawn. Prague is fighting for his life, but Magnus is winning this position or should be winning this position. And remember, if Magnus wins this game, he's secured at least tie breaks. He will be the winner of the FDX Crypto Cup with a win in this game. Yeah. Hope hanging in a very thin, thin thread for the Indian fans. <laughs> he needs some knight forks, he needs some tricks. He needs to get rid of White's two remaining pawns at the cost of his knight. There is huh. one trick, though. I'm not sure that White can go and grab that pawn, because if it does, the knight will jump into the E2 square. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah. Still, it's still, you know, still you can still go wrong here. <laughs> still a lot of fight left in the position. I mean, how many times does Magnus go wrong in endings like this? So it's so rare. Um, and the time situation, well, OK, Prague has done brilliantly 
with only five seconds left. And uh, Magnus getting a little bit short and he's not making any progress yet. Is he going to go back to that other plan now? Poss possibly. But it seemed the simplest way to win, maybe. Yeah, it looks like uh, he's going back to square one and he's going to try the line, the variation that we did show um, a few moments ago. Yep. Is this winning? That is the key. I just don't see a move for black. White is just going to take this pawn and goes. he goes for it. This is, this is just a simple way to win, I think. And uh, yeah, you can see his body language there. He, he, nice. he, he's, this, this knight stable um, is just such a good technique when you've got the bishop versus the knight, well worth remembering. And uh, I don't see any escape now for Prague. Yeah, two threats. White will either move the bishop back and trap that black knight, or the second threat is to just defend his pawn. And two pawns, you can't stop them both. It's a hopeless position for Prague. Oh, he came so close. Uh, yeah. One slip in this game and Magnus just... <sighs> Magnus was doing so Magnus hard. things, wasn't he? You know, he's uh, probing his advantage yeah. as always. And grinding it out, yeah. That's why he's an yeah. in-game wizard, grindmaster, as you say, David. Mm -hmm. And let's remember, if you want to grind like the master himself, he has released apparently one of the best chessboard courses of all time <laughs> with David Howe. And you can purchase that course over at Chessboard, and he's won. There we go. Wow, it's over and a reaction by Magnus Carlsen. He is the winner of the FDX Crypto Cup with this win. The match isn't over. They will play another game, a game four. But Prague cannot win the FDX Crypto Cup. The end game maestro, when he needs it the most, he wins it. Let's hear from the winner of the tournament. Cup 2022. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Is it a bit of an anticlimax to have to finish a match when you've now won the tournament with this, with this game? Yeah, um, I mean, this game was very nervy, I think, for both of us. Today, I mean, I haven't been able to find a rhythm at all, uh, but hopefully I can relax a bit in the, in the last game. You're still up going into the fourth game and you haven't found the rhythm. That means that we can expect some magic now, right? <laughs> I don't know. I think also Prague has kind of run out of steam towards the, uh, towards the end. Uh, I think he's played a bit worse today than he has some other days, but, you know, good for me. Good luck in the final game and congratulations. Thank you. Magnus Carlsen runs off. Uh, he's uh, still going to play another rapid game against Pragnananda, but winning this game, he wins. The tournament seemed very happy, Magnus Carlsen, but he has to keep focus. First of all, though, we have to take a look at the decisive game, the winning game for Magnus Carlsen, David. What happened here? I just want to highlight two moments quickly here, Kaya and Magnus. He has clinched the tournament, he has won it, and he did it in classic Magnus style in an endgame. But... Prague did have his chances, and uh, if we show this position, this is where Prague lost the thread. He actually did very well, defended a difficult opening, difficult middle game, and he's so close to a draw here, but he chose the wrong plan. He was fixated on trying to kick away this white rook, but he could have gone for maybe a better plan, just moving his rook across one square, hoping to try and trap this bishop on the, on the side of the board. It's all about this bishop. If the white king moves across to try and go for the black rook, like it did in the game, then Prague can actually give a check. And no matter where the king goes, he can go across and win a key pawn. Here, winning his pawn back should have guaranteed the draw for Prague. We would have seen a really tense final fourth game there. But instead, after pushing this pawn forward, White's Rook was able to step across and the White King rode to the rescue. The Black Rook now had to retreat and Magnus went on to win. It was just this final motif, though, of White uh, clinching the win, taking this pawn that I want to show one more time because it's so important to remember. White taking this pawn, if the Black King had recaptured, the Knight stable, trapping the Knight and a win for White. Fantastic win by Magnus Carlsen. Uh, we're going to try to get some reactions in Miami. Magnus Carlsen is the winner. He still might play tie breaks, though, against Pragnananda. But uh, he is the winner of the tournament. Nevertheless, Magnus Carlsen, the winner of our FTX Crypto Cup Challenge. However, we're going to see who that is right now. Carlson, Caruana, Aronian, Manujarov, Tomaszewski, Dubov, Nepomniashi, Sigirov, um, Elami, Marmerdam, um, Pan Forest 1, Pan Forest 2. 
Okay, one second. Uh, Iturizaga, Vallejo, Shiro, uh, Salgado Lopez, uh, Santos Latasha, um, MBL, Firuja, Fresine, uh, Lagarde, Musar, uh, Roma Eduard. Incredible, Anish Giri naming 23 Grandmaster, and uh, that makes him the winner of the FDX Crypto Cup challenge. But the winner of the FDX Crypto Cup will be Magnus Carlsen winning game three against Prague. Gives Prague only a hope of a tiebreak, and that will not give him enough points to win the tournament. But still, we have some more action to come in that match. Duda, he is the winner of the match against Anish Giri, winning two games. We have three draws between Aronian and Alireza Vruja. Game four could decide that match, or we will have tiebreaks. And uh, Liam Lea and Hans Niemann, they are also tied. One game each and a draw. We'll see what happens in game four. Anish Giri, he is finished for the day. He lost his match today, but I hear rumors he is still in a good mood. Said Anish that you were locked out of your room before game two? Yeah, no, I mean, I am not going to say, you know, that this is, uh, I think, ridiculous, you know, and it shouldn't be happening, but, <laughs> but of course, uh, I am honestly not sure if I would have repeated that particular line because there were a few other things I thought he might do, and I don't know if I was in the mood to repeat a lot of lines anyway, but, that file was open, so I could have, I could have. And uh, uh, anyway, of course, uh, I got a fine position, and uh, it's. And anyway, I lost uh, more than one game today, so it was not um, the reason for my loss. And yesterday, I wasn't locked out of my room, and I anyway lost, so that's not the reason. But still, it's kind of funny when things don't go your way, like many little details, like slip away like that. How would you summarize this uh, major in the Champions Chess Tour? Uh, I'm, um, I think, on its already third event in this format, where I'm doing badly, like relatively to. I guess my expectation and relatively to the the other regulars, you know, where I'm doing kind of better than what I would normally expect. So I will have to see, um, maybe I will, uh, if, if I get a chance to qualify to the next one, I will have to see, you know, try, try to analyze my games and the difference between the quality and the speed of my play, you know, in the other format and here, because it's getting decent sample size by now and uh, yeah, I'm just struggling in these events. Uh, of course, my opponents are really strong, but I'm facing the same people in the... Yeah, but maybe the regulars, maybe this, the field is more diverse. I don't know, I have to see, I have to see. But uh, yeah, it was tough. Uh, I was really happy with beating Levon, though. Of course, I was happy to beat Hans, but he seems to be out of shape. But Levon is uh, in shape, so I was happy with that. I managed to beat Levon. But um, yeah, the last two matches very, very, uh, just really not going well. You're talking about Hans. How much have you players noticed the interviews that Hans have given and his uh, frustrations in these tournaments? Yeah, I think the frustrations are mainly mine because uh, I'm not able to crush uh, the tournament. I'm also not able to crush the interviews. So I'm like, you know, <laughs> I don't have a field where I can dominate anymore. So that's difficult. Uh, but it's been very entertaining. And uh, the interesting thing about Hans is that he's definitely acting. Sometimes you can see he's about to crack into, into laughter as he speaks himself. But at the same time, if you look at his games, there is really emotion. Like, he is really emotionally affected as well because he's uh, taking some ra rash decisions sometimes, he tilts. So, uh, it's quite interesting, you know, the combination between acting and uh, uh, genuine emotion. And that's, I think, what many streamers also go through. It's quite fascinating, you know, that there is like a borderline somewhere. There's your personality, and then there is the exaggeration, but somewhere there is, uh, it waves in together. Uh, we just got to see on air that you did dominate in one field. You won the pizza baking com competition here this week. Was there any competition? Uh, you've been fighting with the best chefs in the world. And the, and I haven't yet to see a better pizza than what you created. That is true. That is true. Generally, I'm doing very well in, in events where there is no competition at all, like the pizza baking contest. Then I can show my full superiority to my non-existent opponents. Yes. But I was actually proud. I actually ate that pizza as well. And I'm still alive, as you can see. It was uh, pretty good. Um, I, you know, I shouldn't tell it to my wife or she'll get me to, to work and cook as well and that would be bad for our entire family. We're looking to hopefully see you qualify to San Francisco and see you dominate on the board as well. I'll try, thanks. Going into final game now, Hans, how are you feeling about your play today? I'm just happy I didn't lose this game, yeah, because I, I really had to go to the bathroom so badly. And I was sitting there like, how long should I wait? And I was like, no, 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 I can, I can make it through the game. And then, I, and then I was like, no, 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 if I, if I have to play with, in serious pain, it's just going to go badly. So uh, it worked out, but uh, I'm just happy to like not, uh, 
make it to four games is just a miracle already. Uh, but uh, I feel good and uh, okay. Uh, like this, I feel like I, despite the score being even, I've been in control every single, like the first game I should have won. It was so ridiculous. Like, uh, so, okay, I feel like I'm asserting dominance and I don't feel like my um, morale is completely crushed. So uh, that's at least uh, progress. Good luck. We look forward to the last game. <laughs> we uh, really do. Hans Nima, we must call him the winner of the interviews in Miami. We're going to go to Tanya in uh, Miami, the um, Eden Rock Hotel. And um, Tanya, we have a winner of the FDX Crypto Cup. It's Magnus Carlsen. <laughs> We do have a winner and a big congratulations to Magnus. Of course, the crowd here is loving it. And it's party time here as our audience, our spectators, also gets to have a meet and greet with their favorite players. You can see behind me is Jan Shristoff Duda. He's meeting up with all the fans and having a chill time here. But of course, everyone is very happy for Magnus. A little bit disappointed because now it just means that, you know, Prague doesn't have that chance. And I've got some of Prague's fans here with me who've come all the way to see him fight let's take a look at what they have to say hey guys hey so that didn't go according to the way you would have wanted but still Prague can beat Magnus if he wins the next round and takes it to playoffs yep absolutely uh, I mean obviously happy for Magnus great player a legend uh, but impact of Prague winning here would mean a lot to Indian chess and that's why I was supporting Prague but I hope he can win on demand now and play playoffs well, it's going to be a fun round. He knows what he needs to do. Guys, how do you feel about Magnus winning? Um, so I'm very happy that Magnus won. Well, if... If... Prague. Prague <laughs> wins the next round, um, they're going to get a playoff. And I'm going to be very interested to see it. Well, all of us are. We do love a Blitz payoff. Hey, what do you think about this FTX Crypto Cup? We've got a winner already, the guy you were rooting for. Yeah, oh yeah, it's great. Magnus, who sealed the W. And uh, yeah, now I think he's just going to kind of relax at the last round. I, th I do still think he'll fight, though, you know, so. Uh, but it's definitely, you know, congratulations to him. And that's what I expected, so yeah. But props to Prognananda. I thought he, he's, he's a great overall player, a very strong young young prospect. And uh, look more look forward to seeing him again, so. Absolutely. Thank you so much. There we have it. Magnus with the W, but still everything to fight for for Prague. He's got one more game. Action coming up. Absolutely, Tanya. I definitely agree with that young chess fan who was hoping for a win for Prague in game four to take it to some exciting blitz, tie breaks. Magnus Carlsen, the winner of the FTX Crypto Cup with a smile on his face. He's going to arrive the arena for the final rapid game of the tournament. Prague will have the white pieces and Prague wants to finish in style. If Prague wins that game, chatting here with uh, reporters Vadim Magnus, but if Prague wins the final rapid game, he's going to take it to blitz tiebreak. Magnus, with a draw or a win, will win the match and he is definitely winning the FDX Crypto Cup. Should we expect Magnus in this game to play with some sort of humor, some relief, some, I don't know. Uh, you would think so, but if this game goes wrong, he has a couple more games to navigate, yeah. a bit more work to do. Um, so yeah, I think Magnus, he'll try and be professional and just lock this, lock this result in, yeah. lock in the win on the day. What is it about for Prague? Obviously disappointed, Simon. Yeah, I'd be disappointed, but I mean, he shouldn't be that disappointed. I mean, he's had a great tournament. He's still young, and I think Ramesh, you know, mentioned this as coach that it doesn't matter so much. You know, he's got he's got the whole world in front of him now, as he's proven. So uh, he, he he should just be proud how he's done at yeah. the moment. I think. And a sensible Queen's pawn opening from Prague. Yes, Prague will want to win. After all, he might get leapfrogged into second place if he doesn't win. Uh, if Faruja takes his match, so Prague still has a lot to play for. Uh, even if Magnus has won the tournament. And Magnus goes back to an opening he was playing earlier this week, and he's just asking to play the French defence, where he's at least saying, OK, I'm very flexible here. Pragnananda does not take up the challenge and push the White King's pawn forward. Instead, we see a check. Very solid stuff. Are we'll we going to see, see bishop, bishop take bishop? Oh, we are. And, uh, Yay. wow, Simon! Simon. <laughs> what do you think about this move? Brilliant. 
<laughs> Best move ever. F for forward, pushing the F pawn. And the reason yeah. you're so happy, Simon, uh, for the viewers is it's almost a Dutch defence now. Yeah, pretty pretty much. I mean, without dark square bishops, uh, I'm never really sure if that who who that favours so much. I mean, uh, I I would have thought now there's a couple of different variations in the Dutch you can play as black and. Magnus has been a bit of a fan of the Stonewall Dutch in the past, but you don't want to do that after exchanging those bishops. He'd probably try to go for a more uh, classical Dutch setup, which is my favourite uh, opening. And you can also see maybe Black trying to Fianchetto now his light square bishop. This would be a very standard idea to play. A couple of, yeah. So look, okay, he's going for the classical Dutch. Mm -hmm. Happy to see this. He's been watching your game, Simon. Oh, God, I hope not, because uh, <laughs> that's not going to help him that much in life. Um, and, the, I mean, the idea here is is to push the pawn in front of Black's king at some moment and uh, take the centre like that. Um, maybe even now? Maybe even now. Why not? Yeah, why not push it now? This is the main idea. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll see. So I'm happy to see this, because you, you very rarely see this set up uh, at the top levels nowadays. So, yeah. Yeah, looks like a good version. Black, I mean, he's traded off one set of pawn, uh, one set of pieces. Sorry, the Black King can castle. Um, Prague really needs to start castling early. I think that's maybe one of his mistakes this final against Magnus. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Black can get his king to safety. Okay, yeah. he does occupy the center first. Typical idea. Yep, very typical idea. Those those two black pawns are one of the reasons you play this this opening. Um, they can look after each other, control a lot of squares, and if Black can castle and at least develop the queenside knight, then it should be a comfortable position for black. Black has chances to attack on the king side later on, but obviously white's very solid as well. So white white is, mm -hmm. is by no means worse, I would say. I was just going to yeah. say, you know, do you think that Prague, you know, also being in a must-win situation if he wants to keep this match alive, do you think he was going to castle his king to the left? Mm -hmm. He's keeping his options open. Yeah, yeah exactly. And... Uh, well, Magnus is really intent on determining the pawn center and he's asking Prague, are you going to step your pawn forward? Are you going to make some trades? What are you going to do? Yeah. Interesting move, that one. Uh, I mean, uh, that would be my first thought. And uh, I think, yeah, I think he's trying to close it down as well, possibly Magnus with the knight maybe developing behind that pawn. Uh, and just trying to define the pawn structure. And here we go, Prague has now to find the pawn, pawn structure already, um, which... I'm a bit sad to see that move. I really wanted to see Prague castle to the left. I think that's his idea, Yvanka. Might mm -hmm. still do that, yeah. I think it's more likely to castle this way than the other way right now. Uh, Magnus pushes even further, gaining all the space possible, and I guess he wants to use this square for the Black Knight. A nice outpost in the middle of the board. Um, he has indeed brought his knight forward. And it's all about whether white at some point can undermine the head of the black pawn chain. If you let this pawn kind of sit in your camp for too long, you'll just get smothered. You'll just run out of space. Yeah. And uh, definitely you need to start doing that. Uh, you can also do it by uh, picking up the H pawn and uh, pushing G the G pawn two squares forward. Mm -hmm. This one, you need a lot of preparation work though. Uh, very, very weakening for White. So, yeah, I'm expecting Prague now to make his decision, which side to castle. And uh, once he's decided, then we'll know what pawn pushes he's going for. If he castles this way, for sure he's going to go for either this one, or, as Yamanka mentioned, at some point just breaking out, uh, throwing pawns towards the Black King, which is nearly definitely going to go this way, or you would think so. I really hope we see that, that move on the board, because also Black's going to sacrifice a pawn with a typical break if that happens later on. Uh, and it will just be king on king action um, in in that position so uh, type. king on king yeah. yeah yeah the white king is going to sit on the opposite side to the black king and um, due to this imbalance black will throw pawns forward on this side as simon mentions black will black will kind of sacrifice a pawn most likely here white might do the same on the other flank and it will just be a race it'll be fireworks for us and the two players will end on a high but it's, okay it's up to prague if you want a slower kind of game you could still castle this side it's just a bit more scary that you might walk into an attack later on. Um, if you castle on this side of the board, you could see, not right now, but later, for example, the knight come out, the queen come out, and some ideas against the white king. Mm. Yeah, seems like a pretty d decent position for Magnus, I, I guess, here, but it's always a bit risky playing the Dutch, I'll be honest. You know, <laughs> you, you, are, you are committing your pawns to go forwards at a very early stage, so uh, should come a bit of a health warning, and uh, 
He does, he, you know, Prag just doesn't like castling. This is one thing I've learned. He's like, would I, okay, and that's a that's very interesting exchange because he has swapped off that maybe bad bishop for a knight. I mean, I wouldn't have thought about that. That bishop had great potential in the long run. Mm -hmm. Maybe not in the short run, but in the long run. Uh, so, I don't know, what do you think of that exchange? Yeah. It's, it's quite a strange one, really. Mixed feelings. I mean, I guess his, his kind of rationale is that it's a block center. Knights are better in general, more flexible when the center is blocked. But you're right, Simon, that white light squared bishop, it controlled some key squares. And yeah. also it cost two tempi. Often if you have to move a piece around quite a lot, white's bishop moved four times there uh, before swapping itself off. Uh, yeah, it just feels like you're losing time and that, that one or two moves that you're spending, losing, wasting, I mean, they could come back to haunt you. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I thought that he did it primarily for a defensive way, he was afraid of a knight coming to the e5 square and uh, attacking some pawns. But it's still, scary now, but I know, it and it's still the problem persists. And uh, well, it's up to, this is a problem that Pragnananda has to solve. And whilst he's thinking hard about how to solve this problem, well, I just wanted to share with you some more of our answers to our caption competition, where we are asking everyone at home to caption this picture of Prague yesterday, just as he realised he'd blundered a checkmate. And the best caption wins one year subscription to Chess24 Premium. And Tonya Hansen says, that moment when Pragnananda realised he didn't have any more room for the trophies in his bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Daniel to Dream says, did I just see Simon riding a hippo? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Wow. And then Liz, Eliz, Elizabeth Rose says, Yvanka's face when Simon disses the carrot card. Ah. Yeah, it, it really is. It's like, oh, how <laughs> dare you do that, Simon? <laughs> how uh, very dare you? <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dare do that, seriously. You know, getting, getting too much trouble here. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I mean, if Prag really was worried about his uh, trophy cabinet, he could probably afford a new house by now with all these winnings he's getting, you know, so uh, he doesn't have to worry about that. <laughs> he have a whole house for his trophies. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And uh, if you two want to enter our caption competition, there's still time. Then uh, tweet your caption using the hashtag ChessChamps. Yes. Wow, Prag, he really hates castling. I know. I I've learnt <laughs> two things from this game so far. Number, well, from Prag's play, he doesn't like castling. And number two, the Dutch is probably the best opening in the world. <laughs> and you always get better positions as Prag. You already Prague. knew that, though, Simon. I already knew that. Yeah, I did. That's not anything new, but. He, I, I guess he's just playing like wait and see, but he's not really going to castle kingside now. Mm -hmm. And castling queenside also looks pretty scary. So is he going to leave that king there? I mean, there's already a knight jump which would stop castling. And I, I guess the reason this is not so bad for Prague and the knight does come in is that you're, you're only attacking with your knight at the moment, but yeah, Black would want to open up more, more, uh, more files to to really get through Can, to the king. I was just wondering whether he could kind of lock that knight out and out of the game and uh, pick up an f pawn. But okay, he's gone for moving the knight and insisting on a knight trade. I mean, it's not a terrible strategy this because if you can get rid of those knights, maybe uh, Prague's idea of swapping his bishop for that knight off earlier is just a piece of genius. Because you know, if you can see the knights which are facing each other, if they can just literally be removed from the board you'll be left with one knight versus black's bishop. And black's bishop, I have to say, is pretty bad because it's trapped in by those pawns now, which are fixed. And white's knight has a nice route into the middle of the board. So I don't know, maybe, maybe this was just a very clever, a clever thing that Prague did positionally. I mean, it, clearly a very positional idea. I mean, I don't know, interesting. I think maybe critical here would be for Magnus to not allow this uh, exchange of knights and to just take a step back. Uh, he's lost time with the Black Knight, but at least he's, uh, as you mentioned there, Simon, he's taken away the castling rights from the White King. And it's hard to imagine White opening up any lines towards the Black King right now, just because Black's King is super safe. The White King is actually on the same flank. And Black does have this idea later on of pushing a pawn, opening this side up of the board up. And the Queen side looks like Black's to play on. <sighs> yeah, OK, he goes for it immediately. What a move. Magnus is feeling really brave wow. right now. Wow. Uh, he doesn't even care about this knight trade. He just pushes a pawn. Allowing a capture of the knights. I guess his idea is that there's a pin along this diagonal. He wants to profit from that. And if there's a trade of knights, 
Okay, first of all, White Knight cannot take this pawn. You drop a rook in the corner, and actually this will end in checkmate very shortly. And uh, if instead you take with a pawn, does... It's a pawn sacrifice from Magnus. Does he just want to push this pawn, try and really open up lines? If you can imagine... Okay, this is helpful from White, but if you can imagine this bishop coming out, suddenly this bishop is on a great diagonal, this pawn is fixed in the White camp forever. I like it creativity, uh, creatively, but uh, it feels a bit premature somehow from Magnus. I don't see the refutation immediately, though. I don't see how White can really punish this brave pawn move. OK, well, the bar has gone over to Prague's side, the Team Prague. They must be a little disappointed. He's not going to win the tournament, but they must also be proud of his achievements in uh, the FTX Crypto Cup. And Tanya in Miami right now is standing with his coach, uh, Ramesh. What's happening, Tanya? 100% Kaya, I think uh, the way Prague has played has been phenomenal and we've got the man who's known as the father of modern Indian chess. He's the one who's behind all the talents and the big prodigies that we see coming out, this new wave of young chess players from India. Ramesh, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for the kind introduction. That was a bit exaggerated, I believe. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. All right, Ramesh, I have to ask you, we've got the fourth game going on now and uh, the third game didn't go according to Prague's uh, for Prague. Now, coming into this final round with the championship not at stake, what is the feeling? Does it take the pressure off a bit? No, I think uh, we were not really playing for the championship per se. Uh, it's a fantastic opportunity to play against uh, Magnus and the two coming in the final round under the crucial circumstances. Uh, so it's a fantastic uh, situation for a youngster to uh, prove his mettle. That's how I see. And uh, so far, like, uh, he has shown uh, many positives in his games. He has defended uh, many very difficult situations uh, with less time on the clock against the best players in the world. So that's a uh, positive. But, uh, it's also a little bit worrying like in some games he gets into trouble uh, right out of the right into the opening when the theory when he's out of theory uh, so that is probably one area we need to work on in the future now magnus mentioned that prague has not played as well as he has in the previous match especially in the starting phase of the game like you're mentioning right now does that have something to do with fatigue energy I think like uh, in some games he has played uh, extremely well. Uh, I would say probably like out on the six to seven out of ten games uh, in the opening phases uh, we had a fantastic preparation and uh, some portions uh, might have looked dubious but we had uh, thoroughly checked uh, with the computers and uh, it was really playable. Uh, it's just that uh, when he forgets theory under pressure sometimes he doesn't find the best move over the board and then gets into trouble and then uh, it looks like uh, throughout the game he has been outplayed, but that's not the case. Uh, but uh, probably like uh, only in very few games, uh, he has shown some uh, uh, signs of nervousness uh, right out of the opening, I would say. But uh, I don't think it is to do with uh, fatigue, but it is uh, quite tiring to prepare for uh, four games every day with either color. Uh, just preparing for one game would have been ideal, but uh, preparing for both colors, uh, we also have to take into consideration like uh, situations like this where we are trailing what should be our approach so we should have some backup plan as well so it takes a lot of time and energy and uh, just uh, it is seven matches so had it been nine it would have been much tiring <laughs> right now ramesh we all remember the time when uh, magnus had the first defeat against prague earlier in the tour and now prague is here playing outstanding chess fighting for the championship as well against magnus what do you think has contributed to this growth that we've seen in prague's performance over the last year I think it is uh, Prague's adaptability to play at this level. Uh, first of all, like uh, when he got a chance to play in the Tata Steel Masters, uh, uh, we were uh, really apprehensive, like uh, in a standard time control, playing against the best players uh, when he has not had much experience uh, playing at this level. So uh, he adapted quite well, I believe. And uh, he, in the Tata Steel Masters, he had some tough games in the middle of the tournament, but towards the end, he recovered very well and uh, managed to defeat a couple of uh, very strong players. And uh, since then, he has grown from uh, strength to strength, I would say. And uh, with each tournament, he is able to play these guys. And uh, many times, he is able to beat these guys in the rapid tournament. And uh, so he's also uh, believing in himself, in his capabilities more. And also, we have been working a lot in the opening preparation, trying to come up with new ideas, because uh, most of the ideas are getting exhausted very quickly, <laughs> four games in a day. So that's uh, also a big challenge. But uh, that also forces us to work even more than before. That's also good for his game, I believe.
Ramesh, I want to ask you one thing. Now, of course, uh, like you said, the players are playing four games in a row. Requires a lot of opening ideas. And you also need rest. Now, while Prague gets his rest, do you manage to get any sleep or are you burning the night oil here? No, no. Uh, uh, we realize like I'm not uh, getting any younger uh, with the passage of time. So, I also need to recharge my battery so I can uh, do my job efficiently. So, we both are very particular about having a good night's sleep irrespective of uh, how the games go. We are very particular about it and uh, we have managed to successfully do it under very difficult uh, circumstances also. None of us will uh, complain lack of sleep <laughs> during the tournaments. Right. And uh, finally, Ramesh, the fourth game is on. I'm going to ask you, what do you think about the position? Has the opening gone the way that you were expecting? Uh, Magnus has played something out of the blue. D4A6, E4B, B4 check was completely unexpected. Uh, but okay, he has played A3, F3. So <laughs> it's, uh, we should be expect the unexpected, I believe. But uh, I think uh, the opening went well, uh, probably at when Magnus played C5, that's when uh, I think uh, Prague's reaction of D5 probably is not the best. And uh, after that, I have not uh, seen the position, so I don't know really how it is currently. But I think probably D5 was not the best reaction. Maybe Long Castle or Rook D1 uh, keep the tension. And then uh, now I just think about it, even Rook D1, Short Castle, and then try to play on the Dark Squares uh, would have been a better option. Because uh, early D5 allowed him Knight D2, Knight E5 with a tempo, threatening C4 and Knight D3 check. It's very difficult to handle over the board with less time. So I just uh, hope for the best. <laughs> Hope for the best indeed. And we've got our fourth big game running, the man behind Prague's uh, success. And of course, no matter what happens, he's a champion already. Thank you so much, Ramesh, for joining us. Thank you. Absolutely, Tanya. The super team, Pragnananda and uh, Ramesh, they have come up with uh, so many good ideas in this tournament. And Prague came so close to winning the whole thing. We had a few moves in this game, David, and the bar is over to Prague side. Yeah, we've had a few moves, and uh, irrespective of where the bar sits, it's just chaotic on the board. Magnus really doesn't care about pawns in this game. Uh, Simon there, uh, just while Ramesh was uh, being interviewed, he mentioned Magnus really enjoying himself, just throwing pawns, kind of going for the White King. Um, this last couple of moves, maybe we can just jump in to kind of recap what has happened. And uh, here... I mean, I'm not even going to count the pawns, but uh, we predicted this position. Black trying to open up a diagonal for his bishop, maybe trying to open up a file for his rook. Uh, Prague allowed this to happen. He brought his rook across, and after a trade of pawns, Magnus decided, OK, I'm not going to go from this angle yet. Instead, I'm going to go directly for the white king. He pushes forward, and, and after this happened, he brought his bishop out. Again, I'm slightly surprised he chose this square. Yes, he's attacking the rook, but I thought that it was part of white's plan anyway to push the pawn forward, just to create some... Uh, breathing space for his king and now Magnus is thinking and uh, okay finally I'll do a pawn count white has seven pawns black has only five so white's two pawns up can he cling on that's the question right now it's about this pawn maybe black takes a step back and the compensation lies in the fact that this pawn is so strong white's king is very very poorly placed and open files for the black rook maybe a target later who would you pick here guys and why very surprised about uh, Magnus's bishop move as well there because, um, you know, uh, the only thing I can think he was, think, you know, trying to do here was some kind of sacrifice, was like bringing the rook in, but mm -hmm. it doesn't look like any sacrifice is working, I, I feel. Um, because, you 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 know, you, in a position like this, which is incredibly sharp, where you're material down, <clears throat> tempo, losing time, giving your opponent more time is the key thing. And this pawn move, uh, as you said, is probably something that White wants to play because now the king can come forwards. It has another square. So I'm a little bit surprised by that. But saying all of that, I, I'm a great fan of giving up on my pawns and getting the initiative. You know, I, I love getting the initiative. And uh, Black has the initiative. White's king is misplaced. So practically speaking, I think this is probably easier for Black to play. Black can just try to get his rooks in the game, keep some pressure up. I mean, but so hard to judge. I mean, if we didn't have the computer assessment here, you know, how, how could you know, know who's better in this position? Now, you're a bit of a pawn grabber, aren't you, Ivanka? I am. So are you, are you going to take the white pieces? What percentage do you believe white is for winning this one? For winning this one? Yes. Oh, for winning this one, uh, this, this one is a bit murky, actually. I'm not that clear on it. I would say 35%. 
for winning. 35 for, yeah, like, for white. Yeah, for okay. white, because I just I feel that this is so messy. Because, yeah, the king is pretty safe for now on the F2 square. But if that white knight is dislodged, well, then it's not safe anymore. Like you guys mentioned, if a rook gets on the, the E line and can come down to the E2 square, that is going to be curtains. And uh, black's pawn on D3 is so strong. And uh, there you go. He puts a rook on the open line. And how is black, go sorry, how is white going to even challenge that? I mean, you have to step with the D rook. Um, yes, big threat pressure. on the board. Mm. Yeah, because you can swap rooks then, and it will probably become very clear, uh, David, uh, after the next couple of moves, do you think, here? Yeah. Because white will either defend or will not, yeah. basically. I mean, yeah. uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the white knight steps back now. I'd be very happy to get that white knight back in the game. It looks offside. Uh, White's king does have a nice square to hide on. Uh, White's king can head towards the right. Magnus is not happy right. at all. I think he feels he's missed something. Maybe he feels he should have used the other black rook instead. Um, just because that black rook in the corner looks nice on an open file, but maybe it was more useful to keep two rooks close together uh, towards the white king. Maybe he's annoyed with the bishop move because he's allowed white, white's king to step up and he could have had the same position here with the white king not being able to allow the white rooks to connect. So you see the white rooks now connecting. Mm -hmm. He didn't need to allow this, so little things like this would annoy, annoy you, wouldn't you? And, and the problem is when you sacrifice pawns, and I get this quite a lot, or, or pieces, you have to play so accurately because a lot of people assume it's much easier to attack than defend. That's not always the case because if you don't keep the energy up, you're just two pawns down and you lose. So it's really easy to, to you know, let any initiative just, just blow away. Um, and that could also be something that is a danger here. I mean, I guess if the knight comes back, maybe we come in with a check, but then the king just comes out, yeah? And you, yeah. you think it's quite safe there, right? So, I mean... Yeah. I don't really see anything that Black can try, to be honest. No. Uh, let's jump in, because there is this massive threat that we mentioned. <clears throat> the Black Rook wants to come down with a check. Yes, yeah. This has been prevented by White's Knight stepping back, covering this key square. And as both of you mentioned, Black's Queen can now jump in with a check. Maybe this is what Magnus was relying upon. But now the White King just hides, and it's hiding behind four pawns. Looks super yeah. safe, and White remembers those, is those two pawns up. And it, Magnus just instead pushes his H-pawn. So. Yeah. yeah. I think that there's a lot to be said as well for this move, you know, just securing the light squared bishop, because whilst that pawn on D3 exists, then black will have compensation for those two pawns, because there's really not that much that white can do either. You know, white is just really on, just in reaction mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it could also be the, uh, the rook thing you mentioned, David, because mm -hmm. if you had that rook next to the black king, that could do the swinger, couldn't it? Mm. You know, in these kind of positions, and that might be why he was cursing himself yeah. that he's put the wrong rook uh, in the in, in the middle of the board. So he could have used the other rook, as you mentioned. And uh, when the knight comes back, you give a check, and either now or maybe after this pawn push, you could kind of lift the rook across and start going for the white king. But instead, we've seen a few moves. Let's jump back to the game. We did see um, just if we rewind. Uh, white offer a trade of rooks. One set of rooks are off the board, but it has come at the cost of this key pawn on the edge, and uh, Magnus gobbles that one up willingly with a check. The white king steps back, so he's only one pawn down now, Magnus, and as Ivanka mentioned, this pawn is still a bit of a, a nuisance to deal with later on, protected by the black bishop. Also, if the queens come off, we've seen this happen now three times to Prague, but uh, he might have rook and uh, knight and rook against <laughs> <laughs> Rook and Bishop. He's lost three in a row of those types of endgames. If the Queens come off, will he lose a fourth? David, do you know what he should do if he gets that ending? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, Simon. Resign. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Just resign. But, uh, I mean, White's position, though, is still so loose. I mean, is there a kind of a move that he can play just to kind of hold the fort? And I'm just kind of thinking building a foundation in order to make progress. So, I mean, you highlighted the move H5, H4. So maybe it's possible to step up with a G-pawn. Just, I know it's ugly. I know it's, and then step up with a king and then use that as a way to propel forward. Because you have to bear in mind, Pragnananda is in a must-win situation. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't look like the type of position where you can kind of guarantee that you're going to have a one-sided game. It's going to be uh, Black trying to create things for the near future. It's just Prague reacting, so it's about whether he can survive yeah. Uh, the, yeah, the onslaught, really. 
And uh, it's looking really good for Ali Reza Farusha in game four against Levon Aronia. And if he wins that game, he will win that match, take three points. And if uh, Farusha does that, that means Prague, he will have to take this to tie breaks and he will have to win the tie breaks against Magnus to take second place, to be the runner up in the tournament. And if... again, I, I, sorry, Kai, I was just going to say hands. It looks like he, he's, he needs to get drawn the last game, yeah. but I, I, he looks like he's struggling a bit, right, Kaya? I think they're just on the, on the, according to the computer. Yeah. So. He won a game today. They also won a game. They are tied before this game four. So close to taking it to tie breaks and get that point that I think everyone agrees he deserves because there's been some uh, good chess from Hans. Just no points yeah. so far. And he played really well in the first three games today. Maybe he should have already, already won this match, Hans, mm. but I just looked over there. Yeah, it's not looking good for the American player. And maybe that's something he needs to work on as well as the kind of uh, the mental side of things. Maybe also stamina. He's always starting well, ending poorly. Um, that's a big part of becoming a better chess player. Uh, he can work on that as he gets a bit older. Meanwhile, the position here has changed, Shivanka. Yeah, I was just going to say it's swung massively, I think, in Black's favour. I mean, because when you compare the Rook and, where, and now, look at what Black is doing. I mean, I think it's going to be all about this pawn on D3. Yeah, you think Black's past pawn is? It's a kid. I think it's such a good pawn. I, I just, uh, I mean, you can't ever get rid of it. But and again, it's White's knight is always a great defender. White's queen is holding things for now. Can Black up the pressure? There are weaknesses in Black camp uh, in the Black camp as well. It looks good, but maybe it's just visual right now. Yeah, but we always have to remind ourselves that one man, Pragnananda, is desperate. He needs yeah. to win. Yeah. So he will probably be taking a lot more risks. And uh, when I look at the clock situation, I see what a time difference. Pragnananda just over three and a half minutes. Miras, meanwhile, Magnus, well, he's cruising with 10 minutes. Yeah, it's been uh, lightning fast from the world number one. Uh, it looks like he just wanted to enjoy this game, choosing a bit of an unorthodox opening, taking big chances, throwing pawns forward, sacrificing. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> Are you okay, Simon? Oh, I'm okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just a uh, bit of coffee down the wrong way, <laughs> I'm afraid. So. We've all been there. Yeah. yeah. Uh. Uphill struggle for Prague on the board and the clock. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, okay. Uh. Well, Magnus Carlsen enjoying himself, obviously, in this game. He's already won the FDX Crypto Cup. Prague, he needs to come up with something clever to win this game and take it to tie breaks. And the Black Bishop dropping back, just opening up the, white, uh, the Black Queen slightly more. Magnus, it feels like he's just sitting there. He is still a pawn down, so I would be worried if Black went for something too quick and it could backfire. So he's just sitting on the position, asking Prague if he has any useful moves, and maybe the answer is no. Maybe White just has to sit and wait as well. Very hard for White to move the Queen, very hard for White's Knight to get back in the game, very hard for the White Rook, which is passively defending a pawn. What do you think here? Will we just see Magnus take the practical approach and uh, kind of bully Prague because a draw is... I think he's so. got draw odds. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, like you say, it's very hard to find a plan for White. I mean, if White tries to activate anything, okay, he, he's trying to, he weakens something. Now the back rank is a little bit weak because the Rook was uh, covering the back rank. Um, so it's a very good practical decision, isn't it? Just to, just to wait until mm. your opponent has to over overpress. And I'd probably just put the Rook down to the bottom rank now. It seems to improve the position somewhat. And, uh, then think about what to do, you know, what to yeah. do next, yeah. you know. So. That's my strategy as well. Just uh, play the move that uh, wasn't, that's now available to you that wasn't available before. Yeah, make the White King feel a bit uncomfortable if you come down, sneak in from behind with that Black Rook and suddenly the White King is maybe in a mating net, so tactics will work in your favour. But there we see Magnus from behind, his head just bobbing along. I think he's listening to music now, no more podcasts, yeah. no more smiling. He's just shaking, swaying, enjoying the position. Yeah. I'd also be tempted just to put the bishop back to the square it came from. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah, kind of yeah. go, yeah. yeah. What's next? What's next? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Prague's idea is to sacrifice the exchange. Uh, maybe White just wants to get rid of that very dangerous pawn that you were uh, talking about there. I'm not sure that's a winning attempt. Maybe it's just an, an attempt to bail out and get the danger off the position. But I wouldn't be surprised to see Magnus just kind of move his king up one square, just to a square it won't be checked. 
You'd love those moves oh, so much, I don't, don't know. you? I just, yeah, you <laughs> know me so much. I know you. The little Petrosian king moves. Uh, are, are, I'm not sure it's, it's yeah. a good strategy, but... No, I mean, it, it, again, just why, why not improve your king? Uh, and uh, see, see what White's trying to do here, because if White is trying to sacrifice the exchange, prepare for it. Mm -hmm. There's not really much of a point behind that last move that White's played, really. And this is something I think, again, lots of people may be watching the commentary, they, they, they probably failed to do a bit, looking at their opponent's last move and just working out what they're trying to do and just acting against their opponent's moves. I think most people are very tempted when they're playing chess, uh, just from my experience of coaching in the past, to look at their plans a lot more than their opponent's plans. And if you want to immediately try to improve your own chess, just try to get into your opponent's mind, work out what they're trying to play and try to stop their plans. That's a, you, you can win chess just by doing that. And uh, uh, I've noticed a, a lot of people jump up in strength by thinking thinking in that way as well. Yeah, and Magnus thinking now for two and a half uh, minutes. Let's go to uh, Miami where the chess fans are following the action in the tournament. Kaya Chess has brought the world together and has played such a big role in changing people's lives. Now, I've got somebody very special with us who's been doing a lot of work here in Florida. In uh, And Otis is here with us to tell us more about it. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so uh, we have 954 Chess and we do a lot of um, chess events uh, in Broward County, which is uh, right next door to Miami. We also do a lot of things in uh, North Miami as well. Um, we try to grow chess as much as possible, um, promote the game to as many people, and um, try to spread, you know, uh, not only the joy of chess, but also the benefits of it. Um, you know, it can really improve uh, a lot of areas um, in our society as far as um, with children, uh, especially, um, especially in uh, more, uh, let's say uh, impoverished uh, communities that um, chess has uh, brought a lot of um, good things to. Um, you know, uh, less fortunate children that um, get to learn how to play. Uh, it's very good for their critical thinking, improving um, just their social skills and everything else. Um, it's a very positive thing that uh, I think helps a lot of communities. And, uh, you know, we try to promote that and help to, uh, to grow the chess community at large and uh, bring exposure to chess in areas that otherwise uh, wouldn't uh, consider that as uh, something, you know, uh, an activity that uh, they enjoy. So, uh, you know, chess, I think, is rich in culture and uh, it's very diverse. And I think the more we try to promote it uh, in places where uh, it's not uh, currently covered, I think is a, a great thing. So I really enjoy what you guys are doing here. And uh, I think it's great for the chess community uh, as well as uh, South Florida. So. It's also great what you're doing here now. Tell me one thing that, you know, we've got all these players from across the world, the biggest names in chess, the strongest grandmasters, but also these young upcoming talents who are probably going to be future world champions. What is it? What does it mean to Miami and to your club and to the kids there to watch these guys in action? Uh, well, it's very inspiring, you know. Um, you got a lot of uh, young, talented uh, players from all over the world, and um, a lot of players, um, you know, a lot of fans of the game, not even just players, but fans of the game, really look up to these guys. And uh, to see them here in person, uh, it's an amazing thing. And I think that a lot of people uh, enjoy it. I think that the fans of chess, uh, the children, you know, that, uh, that play the game, uh, really respect these guys, really look up to them. And it's good to see them, uh, you know, in such a local venue um it's it's great and i hope that uh, they have more you know of these events thank you so much otis for the amazing work that you're doing for your community and using chess as a tool to make it a better place absolutely thank you back to you guys absolutely we are so much cheering for that and uh ali reza Ferusha, he has now won his match against levon aronian three points for him in that match means prague he has to take this to tie breaks and win the tie breaks to take second place in the tournament what is it looking like right now will he be able to uh win this game prague i mean first of all huge drama because magnus has sacrificed a whole rook Whoa. um at first i thought it was a mouse slip but no it looks like the world champion uh, he planned this all. He's a rook down in the current position, but look at that black pawn. It's one square away from promotion. The white queen has been forced back uh, to defend against it. And it's just about whether he can up the pressure now. The computer thinks it should be a draw, but for a human, this is hard to evaluate. There are ways maybe you can get at that white king. You can try to use the black queen to somehow force this, uh, this pawn through to promotion. 
What do you guys think? It's just pure calculation here, right? Yeah, I mean, I like the move one of you, one of you suggested. I can't remember who it was, but queen, queen e5 looks... Uh, maybe it's you, David, uh, this move... Because it also threatens bishop c2 in some positions, right? So uh, that, that looks like a very yeah. clever idea, actually. Um, yeah. Just to have a couple of multiple threats there, bishop c2 and just bringing the queen in yeah. um, are both threats that are very scary, at least. Um, How does white guard against this? You have to I drop the rook back, I guess? Uh -huh. okay. Maybe this is the only way. Otherwise, I mean, this is just a winning threat. So I guess the rook drops back. Right, and, and at least this way you can capture and play, a, open up the white king, yeah. maybe, uh, worst case scenario. But at least here white would be out of danger. Um, black would be playing for the draw. I just have a yeah. sneaky feeling that it might, uh, just because the evaluation bar says 0, 0.0, the uh, best play might end up something like this. The queen comes in, the rook moves somewhere across, and then black opens up the white king. And eventually we might just see the position repeat itself with some kind of draw. <coughs> Although here it's still a bit scary for white with the black's bishop lurking. Uh, yeah, it's still super complicated, but Magnus has this choice to make if we go back to the current position. Does he try this idea? Um, Yavanka, you were mentioning maybe you could... Queen, the Queen can also come to g3. Mm -hmm. You could sneak in from this angle, try yeah. to deliver a nasty check. If the white rook guards against that check uh, by bringing itself across, maybe now, now you could... <laughs> now yeah. you do the, ch now the, the h3 and... Uh, yeah, this is messy stuff. And I think here, white probably... Unless the king is running, which it may well be, but... Well, you've got it's bishop not... d3, haven't you, as well? Yeah. But that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> just, just thought it was a move, but... Maybe the king runs away. Maybe bishop c2, though. But yeah. maybe the queen can just know. carry on checking to oh, her so cards. Com so complicated. So complicated. Yeah. Let's just let... Like it should be a draw here. Let yeah. Magnus work it out. <laughs> no, that's his job, isn't it? There's no way, actually, for yeah. white's king to run away, so you just kind of force the draw, the position repeats itself, and... Magnus, he has this one in his pocket. It looks like he can force the draw imme immediately with this uh, idea from Yovanka, uh, bring the queen to this square, but maybe he's looking for more. It looks like black is so close to winning because this pawn is only one move away, but maybe the white queen just <laughs> guards it sufficiently. And, yeah, Magnus, he can't take too many risks. He is a rook down, after all. Uh, he does drop his queen back, and now we're expecting the white rook to come to the bottom of the board. There we go. Prag plays it instantly. He was calculating in Magnus's time, and at least this rook now, um, it did kind of cost the black pawn its life, and Magnus, he's fighting for a draw. White is a pawn up. Uh, still some life left in the game. And the evaluation bar reacts. Magnus didn't go for the white king when he could have done. He could have forced the draw immediately, and look at this. The computer finds a really sneaky move to press the advantage. White's queen can actually kick away this bishop from its great outpost now just by stepping forward, uh, queen d2 according to the stockfish, uh, and if the bishop moves, then happy times. It cannot take this pawn due to a nasty yeah. double attack, a check, and you pick up the bishop on the yeah. next move. And of course, Prague played it. And he played it. <laughs> wow. I mean, did <laughs> if you there's one doubt move, it? I mean, I... <laughs> doubt. There's no perpetual here by, oh, you got f4. I, I was thinking black can try checking multiple times, but mm -hmm. it doesn't work. Um, and this time you can block, yeah? Yeah. Magnus is in trouble. Yeah. Suddenly, we might see playoffs in this match. Yeah. Prague could still fight for second place. Wow, what a turnaround. Magnus had the draw in his pocket, but he played on and now fighting for his life. Oh. Yeah, and he's, he's missed a couple of moves, hasn't he? Yeah, I mean, he, this, this bishop in, he played very quickly, but it, it's just a, just a blunder because mm -hmm. uh, now he's going to have to move the bishop again uh, and he's lost some important tempo and he's pawn down. Um, I not, think in, yeah. yeah, I think in his mind he was just thinking... OK, just, it's going to be a draw no matter what I do. Yep. And he just took his eye off the ball for one second and suddenly Prague seized the opportunity. And uh, we just actually saw a slight tell from the world champion that he's frustrated. And now we can clearly <laughs> see it there. Because you just saw him say, what am I going to do now? I mean, how could this happen? And uh, goodness me, what a turnaround. I mean, it just looked like... Magnus was playing superb chess and now he's fighting for his life. And uh, there we can see that he's considering putting his bishop on the f1 square, but then he kind of took it back. He's not sure about that. I mean, is the bishop safe on that square? Looks like the bishop might get trapped there. Yeah. The white king could have just moved across and mm -hmm. dangerous times for this black bishop. Changing his mind, Magnus, he's down to under two minutes. No longer trusting his instincts after some, some kind of mistakes there. He's probably got to put it near, near his king just to keep it safe. Back where it came from. He's uh, lost two moves there. Yeah, two big moves as well. And 
He could have opened up the White King by pushing his H-pawn, for example, just, just try to open up some lines, but it, he, he didn't do that. And now uh, these two tempos should cost him the game. They're, they're both now, time-wise, a minute and a half left. So they're going to have to speed up and look at look at his body language. He's so frustrated, right? He nearly threw so, the mouse there. It looked like he wanted yeah. to kind of hit something or smash something. But, OK, he's refocused now, Magnus. He could still defend this if he's... Uh, Accurate and a bit lucky, yeah. but the white knight is going to finally get back in the game. The white knight's been so far detached from its own king, from any defense, from any real action for the whole game. But now, Prague, he's got queen and knight against queen and bishop, not rook and knight against rook and bishop. And uh, here it's kind of a different assortment. The queen and knight usually work better together in tandem than the queen and bishop. Having an extra pawn also helps. And uh, the world champion now under one minute. Oof. This is the last game now going on in the arena. It's a win for Lee Emle against Hans Niemann in that final rapid game. That means Lee Em wins to take all three points. It ends up with zero points in the tournament for Hans Niemann. But he has a lot of new fans, no doubt about it. And he's played some great chess as well. But zero points for the American. This one will be the final rapid game in the FDX Crypto Cup. Question is, will we see blitz tiebreaks or will it be over after this game? Yeah, that is a big question. I think we might be in for more chess today. All right. Uh, if Pragnananda can organize his pieces correctly, uh, one move that screams out to be played is just centralizing the white knight, bringing it back into the action. Uh, what else could you consider here? Maybe you could step a pawn forward to attack the black queen. Prag goes for a more aggressive approach. He brings his queen forward to attack. Harry the h-pawn over there. The black king not safe anymore. No, certainly not safe. And, uh, well, how is Black going to even defend that pawn? I mean, he has to step forward and give a check. Maybe but not. then he leaves his king all abandoned. Yeah, maybe you could push this pawn. And uh, just trying to open up the white king, even if it costs you a second pawn here. I mean, this is the move he, he should have played about moving the bishop, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, he had to open up the white king with this little lever. Uh, and he missed his opportunity now. The knight comes in. Prague, Prague is just like so, so good at not being scared of moose. And uh, the white king switches over. Is there any, any hope here? I mean, the white king's a little bit, little bit weak, isn't it? But is it weak enough? You need some kind of miraculous perpetual check where white's king can't escape, where you can repeat the position three times. But this last move, so clever from the white king. If the white king had taken this pawn, actually, we would have seen, seen a turnaround, and uh, Magnus would have won because there would have been a nasty bishop check. Look at the queens, the tension between them. Magnus under 20 seconds yeah. as well. If you take the white knight, the black bishop would have fallen. So now two pawns up for Prague. Where's the king running to? Can you just run up the board? Got to go yeah. forwards, otherwise go. it'll be a draw. So he must go up the board. Only choice now. Yeah, go on an odyssey. Start attacking some pieces. Let yeah. the king become the hunter. Yeah, he might as well step forward. You can always repeat the position afterwards. And uh, Magnus is ready for a pre-move there. He's ready to check that white king. OK, still some chance for black if Prague chooses the wrong square for yeah, this king. I mean, the white king is still exposed. Uh, obviously, if the queen's ever come off, it's completely game over. But, the, you know, that, that king is exposed. Yeah. Yeah. If so. the knight and bishop come off, that's also game over. Yeah. This check is very annoying for Prague. You can't step forward now towards the centre. You've got to watch out for some checks, some skewers. He's running away again. Maybe this is clever. He's done a little kind of triangle manoeuvre. And now the Black Queen is further away from the square she wanted to use earlier. And, uh, yeah, not easy. He's playing confidently, Prague, as well. I mean, he's playing his moves quickly now. And, uh, but he's got to get out of this little series of checks at the moment. Mm -hmm. He's doing very well at forcing uh, the Queen away from the King. But the Black Queen still has a lot of squares. He's using every square possible here, Prague. And at least now the checks will dry up. The White Queen is ready to come back to her king's defence and block any remaining checks. So Magnus gives up on that idea, just gets his bishop to safety. Can White's Queen start giving some checks now? Can the White Knight jump back uh, to a better square? Oof, Prague, he's... <laughs> ever since he was gifted this opportunity, again, perfect technique. Yep. Definitely. And, uh, but it's still a question of uh, getting that king to safety. And uh, he retreats his queen. Yeah, good choice of square. The, the white queen guards the dark squares, so the white king will have some safety, potentially. 
the black bishop just doesn't have a safe kind of outpost to sit on. Well, he's got a threat now, <laughs> you know. Uh, Does threaten checkmate with this bishop. The black queen wants to swing the whole way across to g2, the light square near the white king. Checkmate. Actually, yeah, not easy to defend. You have to wow. kind of contort look at, yourself. Look at that, it's great defence, because also now white is threatening to exchange off queens as well, so... Yeah. Uh, white's queen wants to firstly attack the black bishop, but also go to the h2 square in front of the white king. That's a check, and you hit the black queen. Yeah, as you mentioned, Simon, queen, a queenless endgame. It's an easy win for white. So Magnus has to stop that idea. OK. But, but now... Uh... The bishop and the queen are in a pickle. They're tied up together, and of course, you can't step back to give a check because the queen would block it. So, okay, now's the chance to have a. Fr you've got a free move. Mm -hmm. Now is the moment to move the knight. Friend check, mate. Why exactly. not? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, stop the queen go. checks, and we do have a result. Pragnananda has taken it to tiebreaks. Wow! Break, so. Impressive! Oh, imagine if uh, this would have meant he uh, still had a chance to win the FDX Crypto Cup. He still has a chance now to take second place, though. Pragnananda, a massive win against uh, the world number one. Pragnananda takes it to tiebreak. They will have either five or ten minutes. Uh, the arbiter will check with the players if they're comfortable to start in five minutes. Those blitz tie breaks. Prague there will be fighting to take uh, second place in the tournament. Magnus. L he's going to start preparing. I suspect. No, let's hear from Prague. Occasions, you take the win. You're still in this. No, I think Magnus just wanted to have more fun. That's it. Yeah, yeah I mean, okay, this B5 and all is unnecessary. I think he just wanted to have fun and try to beat me. Well, still. I mean, you are now still pushing to become number two in this tournament. That is important, isn't it? Yeah, it's important, sort of. But I, in the opening, I just kind of... Uh, um, I was still upset about the previous game, so I was just blitzing out the most, which was just bad. I just got a completely bad position out of the opening. And okay, it's just after that, he, he played this B5 and all. That means you already have practice. You can now go and blitz more moves. <laughs> but those are bad, so... <laughs> Good luck, Prague. Yeah, thanks. Big smile on Prague's face. He finishes the rapid portion of the FTX Crypto Cup with a brilliant win against uh, Magnus Carlsen. And that means we're going to see blitz tiebreak starting in four minutes. Magnus Carlsen has chosen to start with the white pieces. But first of all, let's take a look at the game where Prague got a win. Yeah, Prague got the win, and in the end, it was Magnus just being a bit too creative, taking too many risks, but fair play to Prague. He pounced on his opportunity, and we were following the game up to this point. White's Rook has just retreated in order to guard this really dangerous D-pawn, and uh, Magnus decided it was time to regain some material. He cashed in, he won the White Rook, and uh, here it's a position where White has an extra pawn, but as we saw in the game, Magnus just relaxed a bit too early. He brought his bishop forward, trying to threaten this pawn, but after this sneaky attack on his bishop, he realized he had to retreat. He had to go back, because if the bishop does capture the pawn, this is a double attack. Whoops, me and my arrows there. This is a check, and the bishop drops off the board. If instead, however, uh, Magnus hadn't touched his bishop, if he'd opened up the white king using the h-pawn as a battering ram, then he would have secured the draw. White could take this pawn, but the black queen can now jump in. White's king is just too open, and most likely this game would have ended in a perpetual check. Fair play to Prague, and let's look forward to those tie breaks. Definitely. It's going to be the only tie breaks uh, today. All matches uh, have finished uh, with a winner. Let's take a look at uh, the results. Final day of the FTX Crypto Cup. A match win for Ali Reza Fruja winning that fourth game against Levon Aronian. Duda winning in only three games against Anish Giri and Liam Le. He finished off with a win against Hans Niemann to take all three points and apparently it was a checkmate that won Liam that match. First of all, let's hear from Liam after that great win. Liam, you finished this tournament extremely strong. And uh, if you'd just gotten this momentum rolling from the beginning, you would have been all the way up there. Yeah, I wish I could, I could play like this from the beginning. But um, in reality, this today wasn't so smooth because the first game I should have lost. Um, also, this last game, at some point, it was worse, but it was um, a very interesting game. I suppose he should be able to make a draw in the end game, but okay, he was low on time and very difficult. 
Is this typical for a player that is low in confidence? Do you feel the same way the times when you feel things are going against? Yeah, it's very hard to play when you're low on time and um, especially um, he, he was probably feeling a little upset because before that he had a great position. You perform so well in this Champions Chess Tour format. Uh, you will, will you also try to qualify for the San Francisco tournament? Yeah, definitely. It's, it would be a dream to uh, qualify for that tournament and I look forward to it. How different does it feel to play here, live, with the lights, with the people, with the other players, than to sit at home? It's wonderful. And I, uh, I think this is really a great experience for, for chess players um, to be able to play esports like this with so many uh, audience and and fans. So, yeah, I think this is the way um, we should play chess in the future. And thank you for always contributing to the audience by giving your insight and always stopping by to make these interviews. Thank you. Great guy. 30 seconds to go until it's a uh, tie break start, but we want to see a checkmate on the board, David. Can you show us? Yes, we do. Uh, we always love those checkmates. And here it's a Rook and Bishop checkmate. And uh, poor Hans, he walked into a checkmating net. The White King here is actually caught by this nice move from Liam. He dropped his Rook down, aiming to slide behind. This would be checkmate. Hans Niemann tried to create some room for the White King, but after a couple more moves, we saw that there was no escape. The King is on a dart square, is vulnerable to a check, and uh, as we saw, one final checkmate. The check traps the King in the corner of the board. Well, it's always nice when we get to see those uh, checkmates on the board, especially for us beginners. Learning from seeing checkmates. And uh, in uh, a few seconds, Blitz tie breaks will start between Magnus Carlsen and Pragnananda. Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces. It's gonna be four o'clock <laughs> for the players when they start the Blitz tie breaks. Play chess now for a little over four hours inside the Eden Rock Hotel in Miami. A beautiful day and very soon they can go out and enjoy the sun, both Magnus and Prague, and especially Magnus who will be celebrating the winner of the FDX Crypto Cup. For Prague, it's now all about securing second place. He will have to win the Blitz tie breaks to take two points. If he doesn't, then Ali Reza Vruja will take second place in the tournament. And Magnus Carlsen, he loves playing chess. Now he's already won, he can relax a little bit. Simon, do you think he's looking forward a little bit to some Blitz tie breaks with Prague? He seems to enjoy the last game, apart from the end of it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he, he went for multiple sacrifices, he went for the attack, so uh, I, I, I reckon we're going to see a wacky opening now. <laughs> I reckon we could see like a, a 1A4, something like that. What do you guys reckon? Yeah. Something weird? Yeah, maybe some... 1c3, <laughs> reverse Karakhan, maybe, no, no, okay, the games are off and I don't think we're going to see that. No, Magnus wants to win, clearly he's using some of his best openings today against Prague, he's needed to because Prague's level has been high and a Sicilian defence, Magnus just maybe thinking how to surprise his young rival in the blitz, thinking for a long time here, Magnus on move two, he's seen this position before, don't worry, he brings his queenside knight out into the game. And, okay, this bishop move. Very trendy, topical stuff. Black's knight leaping into the center. And uh, this position has been debated a few times. I've seen Ferruja win some nice games on the white side here. Uh, Black just pushing a pawn. I'm expecting the white king to castle. There we go. It's all about quick development here for Magnus Carlsen. It's not an open Sicilian where we see big attacks, big tension in the center, but uh, some maneuvering instead. And Prag seems to know what he's doing as well with his, his quick, quick moves and... Uh... Oh, look at this, are they oh, going to have a draw? That'd be uh, quite funny. They've the position once. <laughs> <laughs> Magnus will not go for a draw with White, surely. It'd be quite funny if he did. Just get, get to the second game quickly and try to win with Black. And, uh, um, well, he's, I, he's thinking. He's thinking. Yeah, I don't. I mean, a normal move would be to move the Rook here, wouldn't it? So the Bishop's got another square uh, to retreat to. And, uh, OK, this is also quite sensible, developing the last piece. Yeah, is Magnus smiling? I don't know if we can get a close-up. He, he seemed to be kind of making some kind of expression there. Yeah. Uh, but instead, yeah, that white dark squared bishop is going to find a nice diagonal. The reason there was that repetition of moves is that white wanted to break open the center. Black said no. Uh, white wanted to kind of uh, swap off knights in a good way. Black retreated again and the position repeated, but now it's a more normal type of game. Black needs to catch up in development. Right now, black's only developed two knights. White's developed pretty much his whole army. Yeah. 
and uh, I was guessing that the rook would move to the center and uh, now Pragnanda is trying to get his dark square bishop onto the optimal diagonal. So the big question here for Magnus, is he just going to retreat the bishop so that he can strike open the center or is he actually going to initiate some uh, central movement right now? And he goes for the second option and I like this move. When I used to play something similar like this, I used to get such a thrill when this move appeared on the board. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, if Black's king is stuck in the center, if Black is lagging behind a development, if your pieces are all ready, then why not open things up in the middle of the board? But Prague is happy to give up a pawn. White's rook now can go and gobble up a pawn just two squares away. I'm not sure how much compensation Black's, uh, Black's gonna get back for that, but at least the Black king will castle. That's been Prague's big weakness today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't like castling, does he? It's clear. <laughs> <laughs> Will he do it now? No, yes. Of course Surely. he won't. No, he won't castle. He doesn't know how to. <laughs> He's still learning that rule. He's very good at every other area of the game, but this castling rule is... He doesn't, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't know how to castle, I tell you. Okay, well, he's just... Uh, he's well, only he, 17. Yeah, yeah he's, he's, got, he's still got, got time he, to learn. Yeah, he's just um, gotta... Meanwhile, this white rook is just going to get kicked around the board. So do you reckon he castle here? No. No, of course not. No, no, of course not. <laughs> I, I, I learned my lesson there. There, we go. Yeah. there you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some big threats on the board. Black's knight is attacking that white rook that you mentioned that's really clumsy there. Uh, but I was going to say, oh. maybe you don't have to move it. This is a really sneaky retreat. From Magnus, now the dark squared bishops are just staring at, off at each other. If the black knight goes and captures that white rook, white's dark squared bishop goes and takes its counterpart, and that looks very good for white. Computer hates, though. Maybe now you just castle and just say, OK, I'm going to be a pawn down, but I've got great pieces. He won't castle, David. I think there's something better. No, this he's check. not. No, he just won't he, castle. When in doubt, give a check. Yeah, yeah. this looks great. And uh, after the rook moves, the bishop is just going to head back and... I predict in the next move, we are going to see castling. <laughs> On move 20. <laughs> Magnus, meanwhile, shaking his head quite seriously there, frowning now. White is still a pawn up, we should mention, but look at those shattered F pawns. Look at the white king. The black king's going to be super safe. Black yeah. has the bishop pair. Beautiful compensation. Yay. And Yvanka, you, was, you were right. Yeah, he gets there. It finally does. And uh, now it's all about activating that light squared bishop. And I just have to say, White's uh, kingside pawns are just a complete wreck. Yeah, a real mess that Magnus has to deal with on that flank. Maybe he should have taken the draw earlier on. Yeah, he could have repeated the position. He's got two bishops as well, Prague, and, and, he's, and he's been moving very quickly. I mean, you look at the time, uh, he, he's up on time, and I, I'm sure he can combine those two bishops with his pawns slowly moving forwards on the king side would be a pretty standard way to apply the pressure here. But in these smaller time limits, these quicker time limits, it's always horrible to have the weaker king. White's got the weaker king, another problem. So, mm -hmm. uh, looking good for Prague here. Yeah, so many tempting moves though. Does the black queen jump out? Does black just improve? Maybe the rook in the corner, swing it across, try to swing it eventually towards that white king. Do you start advancing those black pawns in the center now? That white rook is still a bit clumsy. There we go, he does start advancing. Magnus smiling. He's not enjoying the position, that's for sure. So he must be smiling about something else. But this white bishop now is attacking a pawn. Mm -hmm. Maybe Black just defends that b7 pawn and continues uh, yeah. his plan. Definitely. Uh, this position is so nice for Prague and Nanda. And he's ahead, well, slightly behind on the clock. So he has to make some decisions fast. How is he going to defend the pawn? With a rook? With a queen? Well, you could make an argument for both. Mm. Um, you could just be a bit more direct. That's uh, typical Pragnananda. Just kind of give away a second pawn to just start playing for an attack against the White King. But no, he does defend uh, a pawn with his rook, taking a timeout. And Magnus, he's putting everything on light squares. He just doesn't care about the dark squares in this game. He's given away his dark square bishop. Uh, but he's just going to try and plant some white pieces in the center. And will we see Prag continue advancing pawns? You can kick away that white bishop from its square right now. You can bring the black queen out. Just so many tempting moves again. Maybe that's the one pitfall that Prague could fall into. He's already burnt a lot of time on the clock ever since he obtained this dominant position. I was wondering whether you could go and play for mate. And uh, Pragnander's done, done just that. He's put his queen on a very aggressive square. And, you know, if you could follow that up with uh, the f pawn moving forward, the light squared bishop also making an excursion. And uh, that's why... Prag just tucks his king into the corner and Magnus under a lot of pressure. 
Yeah, Magnus is trying to hustle on the clock. <laughs> He's just playing quick moves, not necessarily amazing moves, but um, just getting pieces on squares. He's saying to Prague, OK, you have to checkmate me. I'm a pawn up. I've got an extra minute and a half on the clock. Yeah. Oof. Predictions now, Ivanka. I need those percentages. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, on this one, I don't know. It's too wild. It's too crazy. Um, I mean, anything can happen. I can see that uh, Magnus is also putting some uh, ghosts into the position because, yes, that pawn is coming forward. But, you know, White might have the threat someday of playing rook takes pawn. And uh, Magnus, that's an odd move. It uh, just tucks the king into the corner. I don't like it. I don't feel that you, the position... I think he wants to get his knight back. I think yeah. he feels that his knight needs to go near his king to defend. So I expect his knight to come maybe back next to his king now because... OK, and of course he puts it the other <laughs> way. So, yeah, that's the only... And, and, and now the dark square bishop has some... Uh, yeah, it looks very scary for white at this position. Very scary. Black's pieces are playing a good role. Yeah. This, this was Magnus's plan. When he made that first queen move a few steps ago, it was clear he wanted to shuffle his king in the corner and then follow it up with the queen. Uh, he wants to bring the white queen up and challenge trade-off queens soon. But uh, maybe uh, that would just be rejected, I guess, that offer. If white offers a queen trade now, I don't think Magnus is even going to move his rook. That, no. that black dark square bishop is worth more than the white rook in the centre. But maybe you could offer the exchange of queens and take the pawn in the middle if it's refused, and, and depending where the black queen goes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you'd actually love black to take your rook here. And OK, he's continuing where he's got a majority, because if black gives up the bishop for that rook, you, you, you sort your pawns out and you take away some pressure from your king. I mean, is this so bad for Magnus? Yeah. I'm not sure it's so bad now, really. Yeah. I mean, uh... Ever since black started pushing those pawns in the centre, I don't know, it feels like it's getting better than it, uh, than it was, at least, for the, for the world number one. And, OK, the bishop did take the rook. Prague being a bit greedy there. Yep. He's sorted out the white pawn structure, as you mentioned, Simon. No more doubled yep. pawns. But he is up on material, at least. And uh, things up. what do you think about this capture? Because I've always kind of been taught when you have these peace imbalances, look at the rooks. If the rooks are good, if they've got open lines, then, uh, OK, the rooks are going to overwhelm that peace. He just wants to be greedy, Ivanka. Wow. He just wants oh. to open up and grab this pawn. Yeah, but really? this is playing with fire. I mean, Black can grab a pawn here as well, right? And, and Black he does. has grabbed the pawn. And... OK, the white knight is going to maybe at some point go into the centre of the board. Maybe now. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure you can get away with that, to be honest. Maybe the white queen at some point can start counter-attacking against Black's bishop. It does look very good for Black. Mm. Uh, you just need to survive. If Magnus can get the queens off, game on again but Prague is attacking right now. Yeah, I mean, he has to defend that knight. If he moves it, the queen can step one square back and start attacking some pieces. Oh, this is this is so on the edge for Magnus. Yeah, rubbing his eyes as well, gesturing there. He's got two and a half minutes, but two and a half minutes aren't useful if you're just losing on the board. Mm. Whatever happens, Magnus Carlsen will win the tournament and get this very cool NFT trophy that you see now on the bottom of the screen. And there is an exclusive fan edition available also of this nft trophy that will be up for grabs in an auction for the next 72 hours on chesschamps.io so make your bid to grab that uh, exclusive trophy with magnus carlson's face on it but he's struggling here magnus struggling big time another pawn has just dropped so now it is a black rook for the white knight but also the white king so open yeah it's going to be all sorts of checkmating ideas against it i don't see an immediate win but uh, it's on the brink now. The white queen is on the wrong side of the board to defend her king. White will block this check with a knight. OK, Magnus changes his mind, clicks off the knight there. He's going to hide his king in the corner. I don't know, I still think there might be some uh, twists and turns ahead in this game. Prague is under one minute. If the queens come off, white has this three versus one pawn majority on the left side. White would love to get the queens off. I mean, White would be absolutely fine, I think, if... Uh, Ultimate dream right now. Yeah, the yeah. queens are exchanged. And he, well, he's, he's brought the knight back to blockade here. And uh, what is the next step for Black? I mean, the bar thinks Prague is completely winning, but it's not clear what, what the next stage of this attack is. Does he use his pawn, his Harry pawn, his H pawn? No. He gets well, greedy. He grabs a pawn. <laughs> Greed is good. Why not, I suppose, yeah? So. And Prague... Just under 40 seconds on the clock. Um, I wasn't sure about white getting greedy because this does allow black to give a few checks. They're on the board. And uh, now it's just about relocating that bishop on the edge. 
And uh, Prague is really being materialistic here. He's putting as much pressure on those pawns as possible. Yeah, why not? Mm. Now the Black Queen is perfectly centralised. White's Queen offside. Yeah, and White's Queen is tied down defending her own pawns. Yeah, I, it's just so hard to imagine the White King surviving somehow. Mm -hmm. um, Agnes is about to lift his rook into the centre. There we go. And yeah, now another check. Checks. And this has got to be terminal. Surely you got the rook coming in at some point as well. I mean, luckily the White Knight just about covers enough squares the, for the, the time being. The bishop is coming. The bishop comes in. I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's and that bishop might wriggle its way all the way around. Uh, in some cases as well. And Percentage here, Ivanka. Yeah. Oh, come on, it's got to be big. Hmm? Got to be, it's got to be... Yeah, that. yeah, it's yeah. would be like... 100%. 100%. 100%. Oh. I know, I know, I know. I was there, uh, but it's pretty high. Yeah, it's looks very good. If the White King survives this, uh, then miracles do really exist. Yeah. Exactly. OK, Magnus, his rook is attacked. Is he just going to leave his rook on this square? He does love sacrificing material. He hasn't got much material left, though, has he? No. That's, that's the issue here. <laughs> I mean, he's literally running out of material. He's already the exchange down, and uh, if he leaves the rook there, it's, I mean, it's too much time situation. OK, they're both under a minute, so... Yeah. Well, the problem is, is that, you know, as you mentioned, that bishop will kind of work its way to the F1 square, and how do you fight that? Black bishop, yeah. Sorry, the black oh, bishop, well, yeah. You know what I do here, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Resign. Yes. <laughs> yeah, just get it. Time of the game. It is. And now the bishop can work its way around. If it just steps to attack the rook, there it goes. There we uh, go. And he, ha well, he has sacrificed it, but... Mm. He had to. It's Otherwise, more, checkmate was coming. More desperation, surely, than anything else here. I mean, he does have those two pawns, so it gives him a glimmer of hope with Prague being so short a time. And uh, Magnus said, Queen Exchange... Bragg says no, and uh, now he's uh, setting up. Rook takes bishop. Yeah, he would love to just give back one of the two black rooks in order to simplify the position. Yeah, two rooks against two minor pieces. Sometimes there's a chance if the pawns are really far up the board, but white's pawns are a bit stuck now. And also Magnus below on the clock. But yeah, mm. great game by Prague. Just so smooth. Very nice, yeah. Tactically sharp out of the opening and never really let the advantage slip. Yeah. Yeah, really energetic. I love how he's kept the queens on at every juncture. And Magnus, seven seconds, and his king goes for a walkabout. <laughs> and uh, well, Bragg is a man on a mission. Yeah, he gives back one of the exchanges, as we call it, a rook for minor piece, and now it's just a rook for knight. And Black has an extra pawn. The white king, devoid of any real defenders, as, as well. If that white pawn drops, it's just game over. The white b pawn. Would you guys put us percentages? Hundred and five percent. I feel here. Um, it's high. It's very high. I mean, uh, you know, you have to do a major blunder here to. to yeah. I mean, we know. I mean, can you thread and check mate in one go? Okay. Well, he's pushed his pawn forward. Yeah. I mean, Prague just doesn't blunder either. This no. is the other thing. I mean, you know, it doesn't happen with Prague. Yeah, um, he's just going to find a safe square for the Black King, and then it's yeah. all about attacking the White King. OK, at least the pawn is alive for Magnus, but that pawn is still not running. Prague playing it super safe. Oh, but now I think the... I thought the G pawn was going to move forward, but no, Prague is just keeping full control of the position. It would be completely impractical to push any pawns near the Black King. Prague is just doing a good job. He's just going to pick off White's pawn and play it safe. Yeah, there we go. It's going to be simple now. The Black Rook is going to come in and deliver the final blow soon. Yeah, just a great technique. In blitz, that's all you need to do. Mm -hmm. Just get rid of your opponent's final hopes. And, and Magnus is leaning back. He's ready to resign. Black's yeah. rook can give a check. Black's pawn can give a check. Or you can get the queens off the board. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's in the final throws this game. Another queen check is going to come. The black rook is going to join the action next move. Here it comes. And that must be it. Yeah. White can give one check. Oof. The black king hides. And... I think we're going to see Magnus resign. No, oh, he's got a little... Uh, <laughs> still still fighting. Still oh. fighting, but the <laughs> queen's come off. And, uh, oh, he's going to resign there, is he? OK. Prague takes another win. What yep. a game. 
It's over. Bragg takes the first blitz game. He takes the lead in the tie breaks uh, with a draw or a win in the second blitz game. Well, he will win the match and he will secure second place in the FDX Crypto Cup. Magnus, oh, this is not the way he, wa he wants to finish. Let's hear from him. It's been going slightly downhill. No, I mean, I've played pretty poorly the whole day. It's just that now I'm getting the, the results I, I deserve. But it's okay. I'll try to strike back in the last game. But, you know, it's never nice to uh, to lose. But uh, this is uh, as good a time, a, a time as any if I was going to do that. Do you, are you motivated to strike back now? Or are you starting to lose motivation a little bit after winning the tournament? No, I lost motivation long ago. But I'll still try. Good luck. Thank you. Maybe that one. <sighs> Motivation. Always a question with uh, Magnus Carlsen. Will he strike back with a win to take it to Armageddon in this final match in the FTX Crypto Cup? Or will we have a decisive game in the next one? Prague winning the match. This one, a great game by the 17-year-old. Yeah, what a game from Prague. He played the opening really aggressively as Black. He didn't castle too early. We've criticized that in the past, but Prague, he was true to himself and he sees the advantage early in the game. I just want to highlight one moment where uh, Magnus maybe just miscalculated. Maybe he missed uh, some ideas from his young Indian rival. Here, white has won a pawn, but his rook is misplaced. And instead of castling, instead of getting the black king to safety, Prague delayed this, he attacked the rook. And when the rook retreated, he attacked the rook again. And here, Magnus slipped, he blundered. Uh, this rook is attacked, and I think it's the right idea to give it up, but maybe he should have brought his knight to the edge of the board. This defends the black bish uh, the dark squared bishop, and we'll show why this is so important in a moment. Here, black doesn't have the time to capture this rook, because suddenly the dark squared bishop would fall off. This would favor white. Instead, in the game, he went back, he retreated, and it was a poor choice of square, because this knight could now deliver a check, throwing itself out the way. And after black won white start squared bishop, he had the advantage. The rook moved, the bishop retreated, and it was all about these weak pawns. It was all about the weakness of the white king. Prague from here, his technique was just perfect. Fantastic. He must be super motivated, Pragnananda. In uh, three and a half minutes, uh, he's going to play the second Blitz game uh, with the white pieces and uh, with a draw or a win. He will secure second place in the tournament. If not, Ali Reza Fruja will uh, take second place. Well, if Magnus wins, we will first have Armageddon. All right, it's uh, getting interesting, you guys. Do you think Prague will secure the win in the match now, Yavanka? You know what? I suspect he might. I suspect that Magnus maybe is riding high on winning the FTX Crypto Cup, that he perhaps just wants this out of the way and maybe he's a little bit too happy and too emotional. But uh, you know, Magnus is Magnus. And uh, if he does make a comeback, we are going to see our favorite thing. Yeah. And there, I don't know anything going to happen. <laughs> Have you ever seen Prague in Armageddon? Uh, not that I recall. No. We've seen Magnus a few times last season, but uh, Prague, maybe less experienced there. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. High stakes, yeah. high stakes stress. Yeah. But uh, first of all, blitz game number two, Prague with white pieces, and he only needs a draw in this one. And he has his coach in Miami. Is that a big advantage for Prague, Simon? With a little time in between games now, a lot of preparations for rapid games and then two blitz games. Is it a big advantage for him to have a coach to work on openings with him? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the coach can do kind of the work for him uh, there, so he can maybe tell him what he should be playing. But probably more the sort of psychological side of it. You know, if he has a bad game, it's just like, don't worry, chill out. You know, you'll come back in the next one. That's probably more important, yeah. uh, I think, uh, during these events, just to have a friendly face around. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, uh, it's getting close. In a few minutes, uh, it's going to start uh, the second uh, Blitz game. What do you expect Magnus doing now? Will he be working on openings or what will he usually do with only five minutes? <laughs> Definitely won't be openings, uh, yeah. especially after he's already won the tournament. Maybe he'll just be trying to kind of relax, calm himself down and uh, kind of choose a strategy. There are different ways you can do it in must-win situations. One, you can go all-out attack. But Magnus will have black, so I'm expecting him to just try and keep as many pieces on the board as possible, keep the tension, and hope that uh, Prague eventually cracks. Either way, I think Magnus, he wants to enjoy the moment, and he wants to kind of impress and entertain. Yeah. That's, uh, that's the Magnus we know of late. 
and there's going to be an awards ceremony right after the final game. Magnus will receive his NFT trophy. Remember, you can also get your hands on a unique NFT trophy. The auction will start uh, very soon and will last for 72 hours. The highest bidder on chesschamps.io will receive that unique NFT trophy with Magnus Carlsen's face on it. And in addition, we have the Bitcoin. It has been falling a lot. We started out with $100,000 worth of Bitcoins on uh, day one. Uh, today it's worth about $87,000 and the winner will take a big bunch of that uh, Bitcoin money. 18 seconds to go to Blitz game number two. This could be the very last game in the FTX Crypto Cup coming up. Prague is uh, about to arrive the arena I hear rumors of and uh, he is in the lead in uh, the Blitz tie breaks. With a draw he will take two points and he will win the match against uh, world champion Magnus Carlsen. Let's hear from Prague before this uh, final Blitz game. That's a good starting game Prague. How are you going to follow up? Um, play chess. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> Hands we have a new Hans Niemann. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's learning from the master yeah. himself. So, like, you know, controlling on the board and off the board. Yeah. So I like that. Getting very used to doing interviews now, Pragnanada. Here we go. Second blitz game. Second blitz game, and it's a modern defense from Magnus Carlsen. He just lets White occupy the center of the board with his pawns. Usually, uh, we don't see this at top level unless one player, especially with Black, is in a must-win situation. And uh, Prague brings his pieces out very quickly. This is one of the critical lines, one of the most topical lines um, in this uh, opening. If white wants to, often we'll see white step forward even further in the center, kick away black's knight, and uh, Magnus will continue developing. Yeah, this will come maybe slightly as a surprise to Prague Nananda, but Magnus has done this before on plenty of occasions. It's very provocative stuff, and he likes to provoke his opponents when he needs to win. He wants white to kind of overextend push his pawns too far forward and then he'll try and pick them off one by one later. What do you guys think of this opening choice from Black? Yeah, so it's, it's the go-to opening choice, I guess, the, the sort of uh, modern, the perk, this kind of way. If you need to win with Black, Fianchetto, your kingside bishop, uh, and that often leads to a bit of an unbalanced structure. But now Prag clearly doesn't want any of that and he's just keeping it kind of symmetrical by capturing in the middle there. And uh, that has obviously more drawing tendencies. I expect the knights to be exchanged here. White just to castle and just to play sensible moves. And I think the slight problem that black has is that Fianchetto bishop because it's looking at the black pawn. So you could argue it's a bad bishop and that white is slightly better because his bishop is much better than that one. Yeah, uh, I have to say that I, I agree. I think white has a slight advantage here. Uh, it's not much, but it's probably going to be involving some action happening on the left side of the board. So I'm maybe expecting the A pawn to move two squares forward and uh, then let the dark squared bishop develop on the A3 square. Yeah, White is very flexible. He goes for your idea immediately, Ivanka. Uh, White's dark squared bishop is ready to move. But uh, Pragnananda, he's being cynical here, but also very practical. He's just trading off the pieces. One set of rooks have left the board now. Magnus controlling some squares. I'm expecting to see Prague. Okay, first take a step up with his pawn. The black, uh, the white dark square bishop's going to come out. The white rook's going to centralize. And how is black ever going to get any winning chances? How is black going to get active? Just yeah, very difficult. You can often try moving your knight uh, on the right hand side. The black knight trying to move that near in towards the white king. You know, maybe back it up with the queen. This is kind of a desperate desperate-ish attack because uh, it, it shouldn't work. Um, but with, again, symmetrical position means it's much more likely to have a draw. And that's all that Prague needs. What's the time situation like? Well, Prague's only spent, you know, no, he spent no time at all. Uh, and like 20 seconds. 20 seconds. 15 moves. Uh, How quick is that? And it looks like with this move, he's actually, you know, going for an exchange of bishops. Um, more exchanges, more likely a draw. And here he goes, exchanging off more pieces. Yeah. Um... Yeah, it's very difficult for Magnus to generate any play. I mean, and there uh, Prague says, no, you're going to swap off bishops on my terms. And I think that this move by Magnus is very crafty. You know, the bishop was really bad piece on g7, so why not move it maybe to the b4 square just to ask White some questions? Yeah, 
Magnus is playing this game as if he wants a draw, not a win. Uh, but that's because of Prague's kind of really calm, really controlled play. And it's so difficult. I mean, White here just can sit on the position. If White wants to force things a bit, maybe you trade off the light squared bishops. At some point in the next few moves, you start relocating White's knight. White's knight is not well placed. I would say that's the only problem piece for Prague right now. But once you solve that issue, no weaknesses in the white camp. You might end up with the better minor pieces, the better bishop. I love white's bishop, uh, the dark squared bishop in front of the white queen. Yeah, Prague's slowing down though. So finally, Magnus has forced his opponent to think for the first time in the game. And uh, yeah, solid for both sides. It feels like there should be some fireworks, just judging by the games we've seen between these two in the past. That all, something always seems to happen. But uh, it's up to Magnus to create that. And OK, a trade of these bishops. And I'm probably expecting the queen to step forward. OK, the rook steps forward. And uh, now maybe black can just start putting some pressure on the e4 pawn by developing the dark squared bishop. But still, this white has such a solid position. Yeah. So difficult to break it down. And pawn structure is so symmetrical, it's hard to even dream of creating a passed pawn anytime soon. <sighs> What do you guys predict? Percentages? Um, what would you do, Simon? <laughs> what would I do? Uh, in this position, I mean, it looks very symmetrical. I mean, if there wasn't anything on the match, I would offer a draw. And if my opponent didn't take it, I would resign. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it, it, it's this move kind of surprised me because it gives away a square next to the pawn. But it's just very equal, isn't it? I mean, there's not much to say, except for at the moment, uh, Prague's done a great job of just uh, nullifying anything that Magnus tries to do. Um, and, I mean, what would you do here? I mean, you might, I don't know, I mean, booster the pawn in the middle, move the bishop somewhere. I mean, mm -hmm. there's not much going on at the moment, to yeah. be honest. But Magnus maybe has some sneaky ideas with that little pawn move. You know, I'm thinking the only reason he wants that, he played that move, is because he wants to play um, the B pawn, move it two squares forward and imbalance the position a tiny, teeny tiny <laughs> bit. Yeah, I, I mean, maybe you can move the pawn in front of that one up one square. Um, I suppose it becomes a little bit weak then. I mean, it's still... I can see Magnus winning this position, There's actually. enough pieces left on the board to create something later. Definitely. Yeah. And his position has improved, I think, quite drastically, um, you know, over the last 10 moves, because I think White was slightly better, but Magnus, he's not scared to exchange pieces even when he needs to win. And I think he's got rid of his bad pieces now. And uh, I think uh, things are, you know, things are improving for Magnus in this situation. White with his last move takes more control of the open file. But now maybe that pawn can advance, like you said, Jovanka, is one, one idea at least. Yeah. Do you know what I suspect Prague is going to do? I think he's going to put his bishop on g5 and uh, try and trade, trade it for the knight. Yeah, maybe he could have done that last move because if the knight retreats, you've always got queen coming out to try to, tr you know, swap the queens off. But uh, this seems very sensible, doesn't it? Just take control of the open file, swap everything off when you get a chance and, and try to draw. We see Magnus still laughing, isn't he? That's a very long po podcast he's listening to. He's going on for <laughs> days, that podcast. Point. Maybe it's the same one and he's just like <laughs> going around and around in his head and it's like, yeah. Um, that is a very good point. It is, really. Yeah, <laughs> surprising. Spending a lot of time on the clock now, uh, now though, Carlson. Uh, so the clocks have pretty much balanced up. Uh, yeah, I, the one thing that I would be afraid of, and if I were Prague's coach, maybe I'd, ha I'd be kind of discussing this with him afterwards, the mindset of just trying to play for a draw, which it does feel like he's adopting right now, is dangerous, especially against Magnus. Playing for a draw against him never seems to work somehow. The only way to beat Magnus or the way to draw against him is to attack him, and uh, yeah. at some point there might be a way to bail out, but... Yeah, especially with this opening. I mean, yeah. you know, Prague had great chances to to attack in this opening rather than swap things off, but he's gone for the swap method instead. Oh. And uh, this all seems, again, very normal, just boostering the pawn. The white knight would probably love to move at some point and try to swap the rooks off, you know. Um, and Black's offering maybe an exchange of bishops on the next move as well. Yeah. Still nothing here for Magnus at the moment. Not yet, but there are some holes at least long term around the White King on the dark squares. Something to probe at later maybe. Uh, Magnus just needs to keep the pieces on. 
It's not necessarily easy. I love this move from Pragnananda, just tucking <laughs> the White King away. There's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In the corner. That's a how special that one. And, the old King probe. And uh, yeah. the B pawn has moved forward. So the question is, do you take it? Do you not take it? I would not be tempted to take it, actually. Yeah, it's yeah. so surprising that the bar is up in White's favour because it looks like Black is playing really logical, smooth chess. It's consistent. He's just fighting for squares. Seems like he's making progress, if anyone. I mean, White hasn't really done much, and Black's moving forwards. Uh, Black's created some some of those holes on the king's side. So it is surprising that the bar the bar thinks White is 1.4 pawns better. The bar's, the bar's had a long day today. <laughs> you know, time to go to the bar, bar. <laughs> <laughs> bar, 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 bar. <laughs> I wonder what's on my mind. <laughs> is, there, is there anything we're missing here tactically? Because I don't see it. Uh, I mean, it just looks so nice. Well, not nice necessarily, but it just looks fine for black. It looks very healthy. Maybe this is the idea. Black's dark square bishop doesn't have too many safe squares to run to. Prague wants to eliminate that piece, force off an exchange. Uh, the bishops could potentially leave the board now. Oh, maybe you can trade off the bishops and then slide the white rook across one square to the left. Some tactics. This is sharpening up, becoming a bit more concrete. And there we go. The bishop trade has happened. Prague under the one minute mark. Maybe you attack this black queen. If you don't attack her, okay, trading off a set of pawns first. But that uh, releases the rook. I mean, yeah. black would just jump down that pawn trade and capture with the A pawn. I think Prague just really wants the draw. He's not even trying to look for anything uh -huh. ambitious. He wants to trade off the rook. So White's rook is going to go to the top of the board next move. Those rooks are going to disappear, and he's just going to come back and try to lock things down and defend. I think Magnus is like about 90% 90, 90 to win this game. <laughs> I've seen it so many times before. It's probably dead equal now, but Magnus will just keep probing, probing, probing. His opponent tries to draw, like you said, and he'll end up winning. Um, and swapping the rooks kind of makes some sense, but the white king is much weaker than the black king because of those dark squares. So I don't... I, I think now white must be worse now, even even though the bar doesn't agree. <laughs> <laughs> Why is the bar not agreeing yeah. with anything? It just seems like no, it's going a little bit more that way now. Yeah. Uh, but still, still OK. Um, with I mean, play, this should be a draw. We yeah. should mention it's level pawns, level pieces, um, relatively symmetrical, but yeah, it's just about who can manoeuvre better. It's about whose knight can get active quickest. Ooh. Prague, I mean, in defense of Prague, you know, he does need a draw and he, and the knight will relocate itself maybe via the c1 square to d3, attack some pawns, and, okay, black's uh, knight gets active. It's going to plant itself on the wonderful f4 square. That's yeah. a good, good strategy. But uh, if I were Prague, I probably would put my knight on c1. Yeah, just bring the knight back towards the centre. Either yeah. that way or move it forwards and back back around. I think makes a lot of sense, right? If you can, uh, if you can get the knights off the board, then yeah, please, they can shake hands. Then there's really can't be much more in the in the position. So, can he do that now? Okay, first of all, he's just shoring up his structure. Um, if the black queen ever gets in, then black is probably going to be winning, right? But at the moment, it has no way in. Um, and but I don't know what White's next move is. Uh, maybe in he position. can kick away the knight. I know it's kind of really loose, but yep. maybe he can just kick that knight away and then tuck the king to the g2 square and just say, okay, I'm solid as a rock. Yeah. We'll mostly, uh, most likely see this side of the board blocked up as well. Both sides will be blocked. The black queen would love to get active, but uh, as you guys mentioned, but white's knight is doing a good job of just eyeing up the pawn behind the black queen, keeping that black queen fixed on its square. Maybe now is the time to just try and secure the white king even further. Still some weak squares around it. Yeah, still, still equal, isn't it? Still yeah. equal. I mean, the Very time, true. they're both now getting much shorter, so it's, it's got to kick into gear soon. Um, How are your nerves, Pragnananda? They're normally pretty good, aren't yeah. they? <laughs> They're normally pretty good, but yeah. it's not every day that you beat the world champion in a match. No. Yeah. He's on the brink now. He just needs to improve the white queen, get out of this pin. Yeah, the pile. and he has done. Square. And, you know, Magnus trying to make some uh, advancing on the queen side there, gaining a little bit of space. Um, but so far, so good. It's just the clock. Pregnananda went down to around five seconds there. Wow. Moving his knight back. Still enough material left, and there but we can't, go. Can't you move the B pawn now, Barry? Because then you get a square. No, he's moved his knight in instead. A bit yeah. surprising there. And of, I mean, why? If the queen's come off, then it's back to being 
dead equal again. Feels but, like Magnus just trying to provoke weaknesses around the White King, but losing too much time in the process. I think he could have made a square in the middle of the board, couldn't he, by moving his B-pawn well, and now... Big threat on the board, and uh, that's why White slides the King. Yeah. yeah again, moving this B-pawn seems so natural to me. Have just to do to, it now. Just to try and get a square for the knight. Uh, He'll go for it. He has to. No, no he's uh, going for improving the queen. Maybe this is a good strategy, you know, maximise the position of the queen and then do the pawn break. And look what Prague has wow. done. He's voluntarily given black that square. OK, that seems like a horrible positional move, but, you know, look at the look at the black knight coming into the middle at some point, but he's, mm. he's trying to use tactics to get out of this. Um, it just feels like this is going wrong. And mm -hmm. as, uh -oh. Well, he was 95% to win this one, as we, <laughs> as we guessed, all, all the way for it. You did say 10 moves ago when it was equal, and it's all because Black's position is just... I don't know, it's just more harmonious. Black's queen is going to start taking some pawns. Yeah. That Black B pawn is about to start pushing and promote. The Black king is much safer than the White king. And uh, all Magnus needs to do... He's actually threatening checkmate if the Black queen has swung across all the way into the corner. White prevents that. Maybe even trading off the queens now would be winning, but Magnus first starts pushing. Looks like we're going to get Armageddon. I think so. It looks like Round it. Round this one out, out of nothing. It was dead drawn. Yep. It's all about that grinding like a grandmaster. Just I'm so proud. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, I mean, it's for Prague though, it's that negativity, it's that wrong mindset of playing for a draw. Yep. Mm. Even if he played great moves, even if it was a draw, yeah. Eventually, you will make one small mistake, and Magnus loves that type of thing. Yeah. White's knight now has given itself up. Uh, it cost that knight to get rid of Black's dangerous pawn, and Magnus threatening checkmate again in the corner. Yeah. Black knight just needs to find a safe square, and this one will be game over. OK, a few more checks from Magnus. He's, he just he just blundered his knight. Oh, no wow. way! Uh, he just oh, thought wow. he was threatening checkmate in the corner of the board, but the Dear. White Queen now defends against any checks. And look at his face. He's still laughing there. He's had enough now. Has he had enough? Is he yeah. resigning? He's resigned. Oh, OK. There yeah. comes a handshake. Oh, yeah. a polite handshake. <laughs> Pragnananda wins the match against <laughs> world champion Magnus Carlsen, but it is Magnus who takes the win in the FDX Crypto Cup. But a great finish to a great tournament for the young Pragnananda. Oh... He deserves that, right, you guys? Yeah. Yeah. He deserves it. Prague had a great day. It's odd to see the world champion blunder like that, but uh, it's been a long, exciting, dramatic tournament. Oh, Prague must be uh, so happy right now. And uh, you can see the two players still inside the arena in a few minutes. An award ceremony will start. Uh, Pragnananda, he secures second place in the tournament. Magnus will receive his NFT trophy. He is the winner of uh, the tournament. Uh, while we wait for that, a great game. Swinging back and forth, uh, let's finally do an analysis of a game in the FTX Crypto Cup. Yeah, what a game, what a dramatic game. I was speechless at the end there, I must admit. And uh, let's just show what happened. It was. Uh, kind of lightning fast at the end there, that turnaround. Black was winning. We mentioned Magnus had outplayed Prague. Uh, he'd ground out this advantage. He actually has an extra knight in this position. And here was the first trick. He threatened checkmate in the corner of the board. Uh, for example, if the knight is captured, the white king is now trapped. There's no way out, no escape squares, and Magnus would have won the game. So this threat was answered by the white king stepping back. Magnus repeated the position uh, once before trading a set of pawns here. And after a check, he thought he could try the same trick. He thought he could bring his queen into the corner of the board. But there's a key difference. Due to a set of trades, a set of pawn trades, this square is actually covered by the white queen in the center. It wasn't previously, but now the white queen controls that square. So white was able to just gobble up the black knight. And here, a couple of moves later, Magnus did just resign just disgusted with his <laughs> blunder. Instead, if he had, for example, just moved his knight to a safe square, he would have won the game. Yeah. Wow. What a finish for Pragnananda, taking two points, winning the match against the world number one here in the FTX Crypto Cup. Let's finally take a look at the, the results from their match. All the other matches were finished in the rapid portion. Two wins in uh, the Blitz for Pragnananda. They won one game each in the rapid portion today. But Prag, the 17-year-old, winning when uh, clocks tick down. Five minutes on the clock in the Blitz. So the final standings, the result in the FTX uh, Crypto Cup. Here it is, Magnus Carlsen winning with 16 points. That is one point ahead of Pragnananda and Alireza Ferrucha. 
three giants. What a tournament it has been, and it's finally time to uh, award the players on top of the table. And I'm standing here together with these two players. First of all, Fragnolanda, you managed to save it in spectacular fashion. Ah, I'm not sure if it's a spectacular fashion. Really I think I was just yes, lucky we'll today. Do that after um, this. Okay. Because, um, yeah, Magnus just tried to play with B5. If if we didn't go for that, I, I don't think I would have won the fourth game. Still, you're back in second place, and Magnus, you win the tournament. You finish, at least you finish the tournament in style. Maybe not with a positive note, though. No, no, I mean, uh, I was feeling terrible today. I mean, I was just, uh, didn't really, um, didn't get enough sleep. I was just not in not in good shape. So I'm, you know, I'm very happy to, I'm relieved to have won the tournament. And, um, you know, obviously I would have, Wish to uh, have done better today. It's really uh, kind of embarrassing to uh, to lose the last three games, but uh, overall the emotions are obviously positive. Yeah, because how much does it mean to come back and now after missing out after a bad ending to the first major, you come back and you win the second one? Yeah, it feels uh, feels good. So I wish uh, that I could have like kept my level going. Uh, right till the very end. I, I didn't, but nevertheless, you know, it's it's a great result. So a two-way battle for the first one in Oslo. It was Magnus Carlsen, Pragnolanda battling. Then Duda came and won it. Now it's Magnus Carlsen ahead of Pragnolanda. I'd like to hand this microphone over to the one and only, the tour director, Arna Horvay. Thank you, Svadia. Uh, Closing off this event, I just uh, really want to say a few words. Uh, the Meltwater Champions Chess Tour is all about bringing chess to a wider global audience. And there's a few people, a lot of people has to be thanks in that regard. First of all, the viewers uh, around the world follow this on our global broadcast. The spectators here today, actually on site on the venue, we have our amazing team who uh, plans and executes these uh, amazing events. We have our partners, and first and foremost, we also have our players who really makes this journey on innovating chess an amazing journey for all of us. And I want to thank you guys in particular for giving us seven days of amazing entertainment, both on the board and off the board. And uh, keep in mind that all these lights, these cameras, these LED screens, whatever, they're all kind of dressing to make you guys look better. So we can showcase to a wider audience the amazing performances you guys are really accomplishing. And we want to thank you very much for doing this, the young upcoming talent and still world number one, still world champion for a while, but still world number one. And world number one and world champion, but now also the winner of the FTX Crypto Cup and another win under the belt in the tour. Uh, we want to give you some a token of uh, something here. You're going to get some flowers from Sade. You're going to get some cash, 40,000 about. You're going to get uh, your piece of the uh, additional Bitcoin price from the FTX uh, Bitcoin prize fund. And you're also going to get another digital NFT trophy. Take a look at the screen. And that means that we are ready to conclude here from Miami. It is the winner, Magnus Carlsen, ahead of Pragnolanda, Ramos Babu, back to the studio in Norway. Thank you, Svada. Thank you, Magnus Carlsen. Thank you, Pragnolanda. Thank you to all the players uh, who have given us so much entertaining uh, entertainment over the past seven days. And thank you also to the viewers who has given us in the studio a lot of entertainment with uh, their participation in uh, our tweet competitions. Final award ceremony going on in uh, Miami. Magnus Carlsen has received his prize and we're not now gonna give out the, the one year subscription to Chess24 Premium to the winner of our caption competition. Yeah, we asked and you guys delivered. I mean, you kept us entertained. You made us chuckle, you made us laugh. And the winner of our competition today goes to Don Broker, who said, when you realize room service wasn't included in the contract. <laughs> 
<laughs> nice one, dog. <laughs> Oops, a daisy. Yeah. <laughs> you guys have been so funny today. I have laughed the whole day. Great job and congratulations to uh, Don. What a great caption you have right there. Finally, this was the final day in the tournament, but we still have three tournaments to go in uh, the Meltwater Champions Chess Tour 2022. The standings on the tour right now, you guys. Magnus Carlsen, he is in a very clear lead, earned over $140,000 so far this season. Duda, still second place, a little over $100,000. We now have Prague in third place. Liam Le is up there, Anish Giri, Levon Ding, still inside top eight, Mamadiarov. But two tournaments now to qualify for the third and final major this uh, season. We're looking forward to have uh, all of you join us also for the next tournament on the Meltwater Champions Chess Tour. David Simon Imanka, thank you so much for your excellent commentary, as always. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Kaya. Yeah. It's been a pleasure, as always, you guys. We really enjoyed the entertaining chess and we really enjoy having you guys joining us. So we'll see you in the next tournament. For now, have a good one. <laughs>